poetic dedication of jeremy and hamlet a chronicle of certain incidents in the lives of a boy a dog and a country town this is a librivox recording all librivox recording are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by david wales jeremy and hamlet a chronicle of certain incidents in the lives of a boy a dog and a country town by hugh walpole poetic dedication to my father and mother from their devoted friend their son it is not growing like a tree in bulk doth make man better be or standing long an oak three hundred year to fall a log at last dry bald and sere a lily of a day is fairer far in may although it fall and die that night it was the plant and flower of light in small proportions we just beauties see and in short measures life may perfect be ben jonson end of poetic dedication Chapter One of Jeremy and Hamlet by Hugh Walpole. This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter One Come Out of the Kitchen. One. There was a certain window between the kitchen and the pantry that was Hamlet's favorite. Thirty years ago, these chronicles are of the year 1894, the basements of houses in provincial English towns, even of large houses owned by rich people, were dark, chill, odorful caverns hissing with ill-burning gas and smelling of ill-cooked cabbage the basement of the coles house in polchester was as bad as any other but this little window between the kitchen and the pantry was higher in the wall than the other basement windows almost on a level with the iron railings beyond it and offering a view down over orange street and obliquely sharp to the right and past the polchester high school a glimpse of the cathedral towers themselves inside the window was a shelf and on this shelf hamlet would sit for hours his peaked beard interrogatively a tilt his leg sticking out from his square body as though it were a joint leg and worked like the limb of a wooden toy his eyes sad and mysterious staring into life it was not of course of life that he was thinking only very high-bred and inbred dogs are conscious philosophers his ears were stretched for a sound of the movements of mrs hunslow the cook his nostrils distended for a whiff of the food that she was manipulating but his eyes were fixed upon the passing show the pageantry the rough and tumble of the world and every once and again the twitch of his christmas tree tail would show that something was occurring in this life beyond the window that could supervene for a moment at any rate over the lust of the stomach and the lure of the clattering pan he was an older dog than he had been on that snowy occasion of his first meeting with the cole family two years older in fact older and fatter he had now a round belly his hair hung as wildly as ever it had done around his eyes but beneath the peaked and aristocratic beard there was a sad suspicion of a double chin he had sold his soul to the cook when we sell our souls we are ourselves of course in the main responsible but others have often had more to do with our catastrophe than the world in general can know had jeremy his master not gone to school hamlet's soul would yet have been his own jeremy gone hamlet's spiritual life was nobody's concern he fell down deep down into the very heart of the basement and nobody minded he himself did not mind he was very glad he loved the basement it had happened that during the last holidays jeremy had gone into the country to stay with the parents of a school friend hamlet had had therefore nearly nine months freedom from his master's influence mr and mrs cole did not care for him very deeply helen hated him mary loved him but was so jealous of jeremy's affection for him that she was not sorry to see him banished and barbara only two and a half 
had as yet very tenuous ideas on this subject mrs hounslow a very fat sentimental woman liked to have something or some one at her side to give her rich but transient emotions emotions evoked by a passing band the reading of an accident in the newspaper or some account of an event in the royal family the kitchen maid a girl of no home and very tender years longed for affection from somebody but mrs hounslow disliked all kitchen maids on principle therefore hamlet received what the kitchen maid needed and that is the way of the world did there run through hamlet's brain earlier stories of an emotion purer than the lust for bones of a devotion higher and more ardent than the attachment to a dripping saucepan did he sometimes as he sat reflectively beside the kitchen fire see pictures of his master's small nose of woods when at his master's side he sniffed for rabbits of days when he raced along shining sands after a stone that he had no real intention of finding did he still feel his master's hand upon his head and that sudden twitch as that hand caught a tuft of hair and twisted it no one can tell of what he was thinking as he sat on the shelf staring out of his window at old miss mulready burdened with parcels climbing orange street at the lamplighter hurrying with his flame from post to post of old grinder's war-worn cab stumbling across the cobbles past the high school the old horse faltering at every step at the green evening sky slipping into dusk the silver-pointed stars the crooked roofs blackening into shadow the lights of the town below the hill jumping like gold jack-in-the-boxes into the shadowy air no one could tell of what he was thinking two he was aware that in the upper regions something was preparing he was aware of this in general by a certain stir that there was of agitated voices and hurrying steps and urgent cries but he was aware more immediately because of the attentions of mary jeremy's younger sister he had always hated mary our dogs in their preferences and avoidances guided at all by physical beauty or ugliness was helen of troy adored by the dogs of that town and did sappho command the worship of the hounds of greece we're told nothing of it and on the other hand we know that lancelot gobbo had a devoted dog and that sharon who cannot have been a handsome fellow was most faithfully dog attended i do not think that hamlet minded poor mary's plainness her large spectacles her sallow complexion colourless hair and bony body his dislike arose more probably from the certainty that she would always stroke him the wrong way would poke her fingers into his defenceless eyes would try to drag him on to her sharp razor-edged knees and would talk to him in that meaningless sing-song especially invented by the sentimental of heart and slow of brain for the enchantment of babies and animals she was talking to him in just that fashion now he had slipped upstairs attracted by a smell in the dining-room watching for the moment when he would be undetected he had crept round the dining-room door and had stood his nose in air surrounded by a sea of worn green carpet sniffing suddenly he felt a hand on his collar and there followed that voice that of all others he most detested why here's hamlet ellen here hamlet we can get him ready now helen there's only two hours left anyway and jeremy will care much more about that than anything else i'd like to leave him downstairs but jeremy will be sure to ask where he is which color shall i use for the ribbon helen i've got blue and red and orange a pause then again which shall i use do you say then from a great distance oh don't bother mary can't you see i'm busy a heavy sigh oh well you might never mind i think the blue's best all this time hamlet was desperately wriggling but the hand with knuckles that pressed into the flesh and hurt had firm hold oh do keep still hamlet can't you see that your master's coming home and you've got to be made nice oh bother i've gone and cut the piece too short helen have you got another piece of blue 
a pause then again oh helen you might say i've cut the piece too short haven't you got another bit of blue then again from a long distance don't bother mary can't you see that i'm busy oh very well then a terribly deep sigh that made hamlet shiver with discomfort come here hamlet on to my lap where i can tie it better there that's right oh do keep your head still and how fat you are now insult upon insult heaped he raised his eyes to heaven partly in indignation partly because the entrancing smell could be caught more securely now from the elevation of mary's lap but the discomfort of that lap the hard boniness the sudden precipitate valley the shortness of its surface so that one was forever slipping two legs over the moist warmth of the surrounding hand the iron hardness of the fingers at the neck he played his best game of wriggle slipping sliding lying suddenly inert jerking first with his paws then with his hind legs digging his head beneath his captor's arm as the flamingo did in alice mary as so often occurred lost her patience oh do keep still hamlet how tiresome you are when i've got such a little time too don't you like to have a ribbon and you'll have to be brushed too helen where's the brush that we used to have for hamlet no answer oh do keep still you naughty dog she dug her knuckles into his eyes oh helen do say don't you know where it is then from a great distance oh don't bother mary no i don't know where it is how stupid you are can't you see i'm busy he wriggled mary slapped him he turned and bit her she dropped him oh helen he's bit me it's bitten not bit no it isn't it's bit perhaps he's mad or something and i'll suddenly bark like a dog i know they do i read about it in hopes and fears you're a horrid dog and i don't care whether jeremy sees you or not oh helen you might help it's four o'clock and jeremy will be nearly here hamlet was free free of mary but not of the room the door behind him was closed he sat there thinking the piece of blue ribbon hanging loosely around his neck something was stirring within him something that was not an appetite nor a desire nor a rebellion a memory he shook his head to escape from his ribbon the memory came closer from that too he would like to escape he gazed at the door had he never smelt that alluring smell he slipped beneath the dining-room table and lying flat resting his head on his paws stared resentfully in front of him the memory came closer three two hours later he was sitting in a ridiculous position two steps from the bottom of the hall stairs ridiculous because the stair was not broad enough for his figure because the blue ribbon was now firmly tied and ended in a large blue bow because mary's hand was upon him restraining him from his quite natural intention of disappearing they were grouped about the stair helen and mary barbara and the nurse mr and mrs cole and aunt amy in the hall below helen mary and barbara were wearing cocked hats made of colored paper and carried silver tissue wands in their hands barbara was eating her tissue paper with great eagerness and a vivid absorbed attention helen looked pretty and bored mary was in a state of the utmost nervousness clutching hamlet with one hand while in the other she held a toy trumpet and a crumpled piece of paper every one waited staring at the door mr cole said five minutes late i must go back to my sermon in a moment aunt amy said i hope nothing can have happened mrs cole said tranquilly we should have heard if it had the front door bell rang a maid appeared from nowhere and opened the door from the dusk there emerged a small heavily coated figure mr and mrs cole moved forward there were embraces mr cole said well my boy a husky voice was heard oh i say mother that old squeak of a cabman the short thick-set figure turned toward the staircase instantly mary blew on her trumpet barbara suddenly disliking the tissue paper began to cry 
hamlet barked through the den the quavering voice of mary could be heard reading the poem of welcome the returning to your home back from school and football too coming to us all alone mary helen and barbara welcome you hail to thee then jeremy dear over you we shed a tear just because you are so dear welcome to your home there should then have followed a blast on the trumpet and three rousing cheers alas the welcome was a complete and devastating failure jeremy could be heard to say oh thanks awfully by jove i am hungry how soon's tea mother barbara's howls were now so terrible as to demand immediate attention from everyone hamlet had slipped from control and was barking at aunt amy whom he delighted to annoy mrs cole said now that's enough children dear i'm sure jeremy tired now no one had heard mary's verses no one noticed the cocked hats no one applauded the silver wands the work of weeks was disregarded no one thought of mary at all she crept away to her room at the top of the house flung herself upon her bed and howled biting the counterpane between her teeth but are not these homecomings always most disappointing affairs for weeks jeremy had been looking to this moment on the frayed wallpaper just above his bed in the school dormitory he had made thick black marks with a pencil every mark standing for a day hard and cynical during his school day a barbarian at war with barbarians at night when the lights were out when the dormitory story-tellers unhappy phipps minor voice had died off into slumber in those last few minutes before he too slept he was sentimental full of homesick longings painting to himself that very springing from the cab his mother's kiss hamlet's bark yes and even the embraces of his sisters on the morning of departure after the excitement of farewells the strange almost romantic thrill of the empty schoolrooms the race in the wagonette his wagonette against the one with cox major and bates and simpson to the station the cheeking of the station master the crowding into the railway carriage and leaning five on top of you out of the carriage window the screams of bags won the corner the ensuing fights with cox major after all this gradual approach to known country the gathering in as though with an eager hand of remembered places and stations and roads the half-hour stop at drymouth leaving now almost all your companions behind you only young marlowe and sniff's major remaining the crossing over into glebeshire then the heat of the heart the tightening of the throat as polchester gradually approached all this yes and more much more than this to end in that disappointment everyone looked the same as before the hall the same the pictures the same father and mother and aunt amy the same mary and helen the same only stupider what did they dress up and make fools of themselves like that for mary always did the wrong thing and now most certainly she would be crying in her bedroom because he had not said enough to her in one way there had been too much of a reception in another not enough it was silly of them to make that noise but on the other hand there should have been more questions how had he done in football he had played half-back twice for the school he had told them that in three different letters and yet they had asked no questions and there was bates who had stolen jam out of a fellow's tuck-box one of his letters had been full of that exciting incident and yet they had asked no questions it was true that they had had but little time for questions nevertheless his father at once after kissing him had murmured something about his sermon as though an old sermon mattered of course he did not think all this out he only sat on his bed kicking his legs looking at the well-remembered furniture of his room vaguely discontented and unhappy what fun it had been that morning ragging miss taylor laughing at the guard of the train saying good-bye to old mumpsy thompson who recently spoke to him as though he were a man 
asking him whether his parents had decided upon the public school to which in two years time he would be going eton harrow winchester craxton rugby crail and so on time to decide time to decide one's public the world widening and widening growing ever more terribly exciting and here mary sobbing in her room and father with his sermons and the long evenings at least no work only a silly holiday task a book called the talisman or some rot no work his spirits revived a little no work and lots of food and hamlet hamlet he jumped off his bed why had he never noticed the dog he had forgotten he rushed from the room when he was halfway down the stairs he caught the echo of a voice tea jeremy already in the schoolroom but he did not pause in the hall he saw the housemaid i say where's hamlet he cried in the kitchen i expect master jeremy she answered in the kitchen she expected why should she expect it hamlet never used to be in the kitchen his heart began to beat angrily the kitchen that was not the place for a dog like hamlet he stumbled down the dark stairs into the basement mrs hunslow was standing beside the kitchen table her sleeves rolled up above her elbows she was pounding and pounding jeremy cried at once challenging i say where's my dog his dog mrs hounslow already too scarlet for further colour nevertheless crimsoned internally his dog she hated little boys her sister the one that married the postman had had one two indeed she loved hamlet who had become now by the rights both of psychology and environment hers he is lying there right in front of the fire master jeremy the poor little worm she added the poor little worm was indeed stretched out gnawing at a bone he oughtn't to be in front of the fire said jeremy it's bad for dogs it gives em rheumatism she stopped her pounding they had not met before but it was one of those old hostilities born in the air fostered by the crystal moon roughened by the golden sun jeremy stood his legs apart looking down upon his dog he saw how fat he was how deeply engrossed in his bone how dribbling at the jaws hamlet he said he repeated the name three times at the third call the dog looked up then went back to his bone mrs hounslow sniffed meanwhile in hamlet's soul something was stirring memories affections sentiments he licked the bone again it no longer tasted so sweet as before he looked up at mrs hounslow imploringly she declared herself it do love the kitchen if there's one place where he loves to be it's the kitchen only last night i was saying to my sister anne i said it's a most curious thing how that dog do love the kitchen a little kindness goes a long way with animals poor things as i said to my sister but he oughtn't to love the kitchen jeremy burst out indignantly he isn't a kitchen dog mrs hounslow had received the last insult her face darkened a sub rosa she to be reproached she who had been the only one to show affection to the poor deserted lamb she who had protected him and fed him and given him warm places in which to sleep a kitchen dog and her kitchen the cleanest shiniest most bescoured kitchen in polchester she had however her dignity that's as may be master jeremy she said but it's natural both in dogs and humans that they should go to them as cares for em best and takes trouble over them she went on with her pounding breathing deeply jeremy looked at her he had hurt her feelings he was sorry for that after all she had been kind to the dog in her own way she naturally could not understand the point of view that he must take thank you very much he said huskily for having been so kind to hamlet all this time he's going to live upstairs now but it was very good of you to take so much trouble hamlet was deep in his bone once more when jeremy put his hand on his collar he growled that roused jeremy's temper he dragged the dog across the floor hamlet pushed out his legs and behind his hair his eyes glared the door closed on them both 4. 
Upstairs in his own room he squatted on the floor and drew Hamlet in between his legs. Hamlet would not look at his master. He sulked, as only dogs and beautiful women can. Hamlet, you must remember. You can't have forgotten everything so quickly. You can't have forgotten the fun we had last year out at the farm, and when I rescued you after Mary shut you up, and biting Aunt Amy and everything. I know I've been away, and you must have thought I was never coming back, but I couldn't help that. I had to go to school, and I couldn't take you with me. And now I'm going to be home for weeks and weeks, and it will be awfully slow if you aren't with me. Nobody seems really excited about my coming back, and Uncle Samuel's away, and everything's rotten. So you must stay with me and go out with me for walks and everything. Hamlet was staring down at the floor through his hair. His master was scratching his head in exactly the way that he used to do, in the way that no one else had ever done. Three, four, five scratches in the middle, then slowly towards the right ear, then slowly towards the left, then both ears pulled up close together, then a piece of hair twisted into a peak, then all smoothed down again and softly stroked into tranquility. Delicious! His soul quivered with sensuous ecstasy. Then his master's hands smelt as they had always done, hard and rough, with the skin suddenly soft between the fingers. Very good to lick. His tongue was half out. In another moment he would have rolled over onto his back, his legs stuck stiffly out, his eyes closed, waiting for his belly to be tickled. In another moment. But there was a knock on the door, and Mary entered. Mary's eyes were red behind her spectacles. She had the sad, resigned indignation of a Cassandra misunderstood. "'Jeremy, aren't you coming down to tea? We're half finished.' He rose to his feet. He knew that he must say something. "'I say, Mary,' he stammered, "'it was most awfully decent of you to make that poetry up. I did like it.' "'Did you really?' she asked, gulping. "'Yes, I did.' "'Would you like a copy of it?' "'Most awfully.' "'I did make a copy of it, but I thought nobody cared or wanted to hear.' Fearful, lest she should begin to cry again, he said hurriedly, "'Here's Hamlet. He's always been in the kitchen. He's not going to be any longer.' Hamlet followed him downstairs, but still with reluctant dignity. The moment of his surrender had been covered, and he did not know that he would now surrender after all. He would see— Meanwhile, he smelt food, and where food was, he must be. Tea was in the schoolroom, Miss Jones, the governess, was away on her holiday, and Jeremy saw at once that the worst thing possible had occurred. His Aunt Amy, whom he did not love, was in charge of the tea-table. He had fantastic thoughts when he saw his aunt, thinking of her never as a human being, but as an animal, a bird, perhaps a crow a vulture, something hooked and clawed, but today she was determined that she would be friendly. Sit down, Jeremy, dear, you're very late, but on the first day we'll say nothing about it. His mother should have been here. Where was his mother? Have you washed your hands? Mother has collars. There is blackberry jam, and also strawberry. You're welcome home, Jeremy. He would have neither. He loved blackberry. Still more, he loved strawberry but he would have neither, because Aunt Amy had asked him. His eye was on Hamlet, who was sulking by the door. "'I do hope, dear, that you're not going to have that dog with you everywhere again. All the time you were away was in the kitchen. Very happy there, I believe.' Jeremy said nothing. Aunt Amy, who was, I think, to be applauded for her efforts with a sulky boy, bravely persevered. "'Do tell us, dear, about this last time at school. "'We are all so eager to know. "'Was it cricket or football, dear, and, and how did your work go?' "'He mumbled something, blushing to the eyes "'as he caught his sister Helen's ironical, supercilious glance. "'I hope your master was pleased with you, dear.' "'He burst out. "'I was whacked twice.' "'Aunt Amy sighed. "'The less about that, dear, the better. "'We want to know what you did well.' How strange that in the train he had eagerly desired this moment, and now he had nothing to say. "'I don't know,' he murmured. "'There was a chap called Bass got bumped for stealing.' Aunt Amy sighed again. 
yes helen dear you can go if you've really finished wipe your mouth mary hamlet was watching his master more than ever now were recollections stealing upon him his master was unhappy just as he used to be unhappy he was hating that dark strange smelling animal smelling of soap the smell that hamlet most avoided whom hamlet also hated yes everything was returning five later on they were down in the drawing-room mrs cole was reading the dove in the eagle's nest the children grouped about her feet jeremy his rough bullet head against his mother's dress was almost asleep he had had a long exhausting day he was happy at last seeing the colours fold and unfold before his eyes that other world that was sometimes so strangely close to him mingled with the world of facts now he was racing in the wagonette leaning over and shouting triumphantly against those left behind now the path changed to a pool of gold and out of it a bronze tower rose solemn to heaven straight and tall against the blue sky and the windows of the tower opened and music sounded and his mother's voice came back to him like the sudden rushing of the train and he saw merry spectacles and the flickering fire and helen's gleaming shoes for the moment he had forgotten hamlet the dog lay near the door it opened and aunt amy came in at once the dog was through the door down the stairs and into the kitchen this was habit something had acted in him before he could stop to think it was natural for him to be in the kitchen at this hour when it was brilliantly lit and the cook and the housemaid and the kitchen maid were having their last drop of tea always things for him at this moment sweet things fat things meaty things he sat there and they dropped bits into his mouth murmuring poor worm little lamb sweet pet mrs hunslow was to-night quite especially affectionate delighted with his return to her she patted him pulled him into her ample lap folded his head against her yet ampler bosom confided to the maids what that limb of a boy had dared to say to her kitchen dog indeed as though it weren't the finest kitchen in glebeshire and who'd looked after the poor animal if she hadn't and then and why but of course the maids agreed sipping the tea from their saucers but hamlet was not happy he did not care to-night for mrs hunslow's embraces he was not happy he struggled from her lap on through the floor and sat there scratching himself when ten struck he was taken to his warm corner near the oven she curled him up she bent down and kissed him the lights were turned out and he was alone he could not sleep the loud ticking of the kitchen clock for so many months a pleasant sleepy sound to-night disturbed him he was not happy he got up and wandered about the kitchen sniffing he went to the door it was ajar he pushed it with his nose something was leading him he remembered now how well he remembered up these dark stairs under that hissing clock up these stairs again along that passage the moon grinning at him through the window but of course he did not know that it was the moon up more stairs along this wall then this door he pushed with his nose it moved he squeezed himself through he hesitated sniffing then how familiar this was a spring and he was on the bed a step or two and he was licking his master's cheek a cry hamlet oh hamlet he struggled under his master's arm licking the cheek furiously planting his paw but with the nails carefully drawn in on his master's neck once more that hand about his head the scratch first to the left then the right then the pulling of the ears with a sigh of satisfaction he sank into the hollow of his master's body and in another second was asleep end of chapter one Chapter Two of Jeremy and Hamlet by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: Conscience Money. One. These Christmas holidays had begun badly. Jeremy's mood was wrong from the very start. 
he had not wished it to be wrong he had come determined to find everything right and beautiful now nothing was right and nothing was beautiful for one thing there was nothing to do it was not the custom nearly thirty years ago to invent games occupations and employments for your young as it is today mrs cole loving her children had nevertheless enough to do to make the house go round and mr cole was busy in his study the children would amuse themselves who could doubt it but at the same time there were so many things that they must not do that as the days passed they were more and more restricted and confined mary what are you reading oh i wouldn't read that quite yet dear a little later perhaps or helen you are sitting in the sun go and get your hat or not on the carpet dear it will make your clothes so dusty why don't you sit down and read a little before his departure schoolwards jeremy had been accustomed to those inhibitions and had taken them for granted as inevitable then in that other world he had discovered a new row of inhibitions as numerous and devastating as the first series but quite different covering in no kind of way the same ground these new inhibitions were absolute and the danger of disobeying them was far graver than in the earlier case he fitted then his life into those and grew like a little plant upwards and outwards as that sinister gardener school tradition demanded then came the return to home and behold those old early childish inhibitions were still in force it was still don't jeremy you'll tear your trousers or no not now dear mother's busy or no you can't go into the tower now perhaps tomorrow or once is enough jeremy don't be greedy and on the other side there was nothing to do nothing to do he could no longer play with mary or helen mary was too emotional and helen too conceited and who wanted to play with girls anyway barbara was rather fascinating but was surrounded by defences of nurses mothers and mysterious decrees hamlet was his only resource without him he would surely have fallen sick and died but a dog is limited within doors for hamlet's own sake jeremy longed that they should be forever in the open oh why did they not live in the country why in this stupid and stuffy town but then again was it stupid and stuffy jeremy longed to investigate it more intimately but was prevented at every turn it might be an enchanting town certainly there were sounds and lights and colours that now that he was older and knew what life was suggested themselves as entrancing he simply was not allowed to discover for himself hindered inhibited everywhere had only uncle samuel been here things would have been better uncle samuel was queer and strange and said most disconcerting things but he did understand jeremy as it was, no one understood him. Today, had anyone seen a small, thick-set boy with a stocky figure and a snub nose standing halfway down the stairs, lost and desolate, there would be a thousand things to suggest. Then it was not the hour for the afternoon walk, or the hour was past. Children must not be in the way. Matters were not improved by a little conversation that he had with Aunt Amy she found him one morning standing before the dining-room window staring into orange street well jeremy she paused in the quick rattle rattle walk that she always had in the morning when she was helping her sister over household duties nothing to do he neither answered nor turned around you should reply when spoken to then more softly because there was something desolate in his attitude that she could not but feel well dear tell me he turned round and as he looked at her she was conscious as she had often been before almost with terror of the strange creatures that little boys were and how far from her understanding i want to go out and buy a football he said a football she repeated as though he had said a gorilla 
yes he said impatiently the little ones are only ten and sixpence and i've got that over from the pound uncle samuel gave me on my birthday and father says i mustn't go out well that settles it then said aunt amy cheerfully i don't see why said jeremy slowly he's let me go out alone when i was ever so small before i went to school you can be sure he has his reasons said aunt amy she suddenly sat down on one of the dining-room chairs and said come here jeremy he came to her reluctantly she put him in front of her and laid her hands on his shoulders and stared at him he wriggled uncomfortably wishing to escape from her projecting tooth and her eyes that were here grey and there green herself meanwhile felt a sudden warmth of sentiment she wanted to be kind to him why she knew not you're getting a big boy now jeremy she paused yes said jeremy and you don't want to be a sulky big boy do you i'm not sulky said jeremy no dear i'm sure you're not but you're not being quite the bright willing boy we'd like to see you you know that we all love you don't you yes said jeremy well then you must repay our love and show us that you are happy and willing to do what your father and mother wish jeremy said nothing you do love your father and mother don't you yes said jeremy well then said aunt amy triumphantly as though she had been working out a problem in euclid you must show it no more sulking dear but be the bright little boy we all know you can be she left jeremy puzzled and confused was it true that he was sulky he did love his father and mother but deeply distrusted scenes of sentiment nevertheless christmas was approaching and he felt warm towards all the world even aunt amy often and often he went up to his bedroom closed the door behind him looked under his bed to make sure that no one was in the room then very cautiously opened the lid of his play box and peered inside at the bottom of the box were a number of odd shaped parcels he picked them up one after another and stroked their paper then laid them carefully in their places he sighed as of a man who has accomplished a great and serious task many times a day he did this he had himself unpacked his play box on his return from school no one in the house save only he had beheld those strange parcels two christmas approached nearer and nearer now it was only four days before christmas eve there was no snow but frost and a cold pale blue sky the town was like a crystallized fruit hard and glittering and sharply colored the market was open during the whole of christmas week and there was the old woman under her umbrella and the fur-coated man with the wooden toys and the fruit stalls with the holly and mistletoe and the punch and judy under the town clock where it had been for ever so many years and the man with the colored balloons and the little dogs on wheels that you wound up in the back with a key and they jumped along the cobbles as natural as life the children were deeply absorbed over their presence mary looked at jeremy so often from behind her spectacles in a mysterious and ominous way that at last he said all right mary you'll know me next time i was wondering she said with a convulsive choke in her throat whether you'd like my present i expect i will he said busy at the moment with the brushing of hamlet because she went on there were two things and i couldn't make up my mind which and i asked helen and she said the first one because you might have a cold any time and it would be good in the snow but we don't have snow here much so i thought the other would be better because you do like pictures don't you jeremy and sometimes the pictures are lovely so i got that and now i don't know whether you'll like it jeremy had no reply to make to this oh now you've guessed what it is no i haven't said jeremy quite truthfully oh i'm so glad mary sighed with relief have you got all your presents yes all of them said jeremy drawing himself up and gazing with dreamy pride over hamlet's head shall i like mine asked mary her eyes glistening 
awfully said jeremy you'll like it he said slowly better than anything you've ever been given better than the writing case uncle samuel gave me much better oh jeremy she suddenly flung her arms around his neck and kissed him hamlet barked and escaped the brush and comb then seized mary's hair ribbon that had as usual fallen to the floor and ran with it to a distant corner incidents followed that had nothing to do with presents then when christmas day grew very near indeed those parcels at the bottom of his play-box became an obsession he went up a hundred times a day to look at them to take them out and stroke them to feel their knobs and protruding angles to replace them first in this way and then in that sometimes he laid them all out upon the bed sometimes he spread them in a long line across the carpet he brought up hamlet and made him look at them hamlet sniffed each parcel then wanted to tear the paper wrappings finally he lay on the carpet and rattled in his throat wagging his tail and baring his teeth christmas eve arrived a beautiful clear frosty day three jeremy came in from his morning walk his cheeks crimson looking very nautical in his blue reefer coat he went straight up to his room locked the door and opened the play-box the parcels were all there he counted them felt them sighed a sigh of satisfaction and pride then closed the play-box again he took off his coat and went downstairs helen meeting him in the hall cried oh jeremy father wants to see you where in the study jeremy paused the word study had always a strangely disagreeable sound their father never wished to see any of them there unless for some very unpleasant purpose he threw his mind back what had he been doing what sin had he within the last day or two committed he could think of nothing his parcels had kept him quiet both he and hamlet had been very good only aunt amy had spoken to him about sulking but that had been over a week ago no he had been very good there could be nothing nevertheless he walked down the hall with slow and hesitating step hamlet wanted to come with him he had to stop him hamlet sat down near the door and watched him enter with anxious eyes he did not like mr cole the study was a close dark room lined with bookshelves rows and rows of theological works all dusty and forlorn in the middle of the left wall between the bookshelves hung a large photograph of the forum rome and on the similar space on the other wall a photograph of the parthenon behind a large desk sat mr cole very thin very black very white his small son stood on the other side of the desk and looked at him. "'Well, my boy, what is it?' "'Helen said you wanted me.' He shifted from one foot to the other and looked anxiously at the forum. "'Did I? Ah, uh, let me see. What was it? Hmm, ah. Uh, ah, uh, yes, of course. It's your journey money. I should have asked you many days ago. I thought your mother had taken it. She had apparently forgotten.' journey money of what was he talking journey money what journey money father even as he spoke his voice faltered because although he still did not know in the least of what his father was speaking danger hovered suddenly near him like a large black bird the wings obliterating the dusty light mr cole who had much to do grew a little impatient yes yes the money that we sent to your master for your journey home your mother fancied from what mr thompson wrote to her that she had not sent quite enough on earlier occasions that the former sum had not been quite sufficient this time we sent at least a pound more than the fare demanded the bird came closer even now he did not understand but his throat was dry and his heart was beating violently uh, the money that mr thompson gave me the day before the end of term yes yes my boy he gave me fifteen shillings and the ticket well let me have it i spent it there was a pause mr cole stared at his son what do you say i spent it father what 
I spent it. Fright now was upon him. Terror, panic. But behind the panic, like the resolution under torture not to betray one's friend, was the resolve never, never to say upon what the money had been spent. What? I haven't got it, father. I thought it was for me. You thought it was for you? Yes. Mr. Thompson didn't say anything about it, only that it was for the journey. And did you spend it on the journey? There was no answer. Will you kindly tell me how, having already your ticket, you managed to spend one pound between your school and your home? He felt the tears rising and desperately beat them back. How he hated those tears that came always, it seemed, when one least wished to cry. It wasn't a pound. One tear came, hesitated, and fell. It was fifteen shillings. Very well, then. Will you kindly explain to me how you spent fifteen shillings? No answer. Jeremy, how old are you? Ten and a half. Ten and a half. Very well. You have been a year and a half at school. You are quite old enough to understand. Do you know what you have done? Tears now were falling fast. You have stolen this money. No word. Do you know what they call someone who steals money? No answer. They call him a thief. Through convulsive sobs there came, I didn't steal it. Do not add lying to the rest. Mr. Cole got up. Come with me to your room. They walked into the hall. Hamlet was waiting and sprang forward. At once he saw in the sobbing figure of his master trouble and disaster. His head fell, his tail crept between his legs. He slowly followed the procession, only looking at Mr. Cole's black legs with longing. Upstairs they went, up through the tranquil and happy house. Barbara was being bathed, gurgling and applause, and the splash of water came from the bathroom. They were in Jeremy's room. The door closed. Hamlet on the other side. Jeremy stood, the tears drying on his face, his sobs coming in convulsive spasms. I am determined to know what you have done with this money, on what you have spent it. There was no answer. It is of no use to be obstinate, Jeremy. Tell me, on what have you spent this money? He looked about him. There must be something in the room that would show him. Not many things here. The little case with some books, the pictures of Napoleon on the Bellerophon, and the charge of the light brigade, the white bed and wash-hand stand, the chest of drawers. Then his eye fell on the play-box. He went to it and opened it. Jeremy gave a long, convulsive sigh. Then, between his sobs, Father, please, I'll get the money. I, I will, really. I, I didn't know it was wrong. Though Those are mine. They, they break, two of them. I'll get the money. I will, really. Please, Father. A word here is needed in defense of Mr. Cole. A word is not, in truth, necessary. His action was inevitable. He truly loved his son and because of that very love he was now shocked to the depth of his soul. His son was a thief. His son had lied and stolen. He was old enough to know what he was about. To himself, who had been brought up in a poverty that was martyrdom and an honesty that was fanatical, no sin could be worse than this, save only the sins of the flesh." For more than two years now he had been troubled by Jeremy, seeing many signs in him of a nature very different from his own, signs of independence, rebellion, and, as it seemed to him, hardness of heart and selfishness. Now the boy was a thief, deliberately spending money that did not belong to him, in the hopes that his parents would forget. He bent over his play-box, saw the parcel so neatly laid out there, took one up in his hand. He looked back at his son. What is this, Jeremy? There was no answer. Did you get these things with the money? Yes, father. Then he said, they're presents for Christmas. Presents? Mr. Cole took up first one parcel, then another, holding them up to the light. 
then very slowly with that deliberation with which he did everything he undid the parcels jeremy said nothing only stood there his face white and dirty where the tears had left marks his legs apart his fists clenched one after another they were laid bare and placed upon the bed rather pitiful they looked a white-backed hairbrush a coral necklace a little brooch of silver gilt a pair of woolen gloves a baby's coral a story-book a dog collar two handkerchiefs a work-box a cheap copy in a cheap frame of dignity and impudence a tea caddy obviously all the servants had been included in this no one had been forgotten had not mr cole been so wholly and so truly shocked by his son's wickedness he must have been touched by the thought that had plainly gone to the buying of each gift but imagination was not mr cole's strongest part jeremy watched him and suddenly he broke out father don't take them away let me give them to-morrow you can punish me any way you like you can beat me or take away my pocket money forever or, or anything you like but let me give them to-morrow please father please father that must be part of your punishment my son mr cole said very sorrowfully and finding it difficult to balance the things one upon another in his arms in another second of time jeremy was upon him screaming beating with his fists scratching with his hands crying you shan't take them you shan't take them they're mine you're wicked you're wicked they're my things you shan't take them he was mad wild frantic his hands were round his father's thigh his head beating against his father's chest his legs kicking against his father's calves he screamed like something not human for a moment mr cole was almost carried off his balance the things that he was carrying the hairbrush the necklace the picture went tumbling on the floor then jeremy was picked up and still kicking and breathless flung on to the bed then the door closed and the boy was alone four the first real agony of jeremy's young life followed two years before just at this time he had been in disgrace for telling a lie his misery had been acute for an hour or two and then with the swift memory of eight years old it had been forgotten and covered up this was another business when after lying stunned for a long time thoughts came to him his first emotion was one of blind mad rage an emotion quite new to him never felt before injustice injustice that was a new word written on the page of his life's book never again to be eradicated there came before him at once as though it were being presented to him by some new friend who was with him in the room for the first time the picture of the afternoon when he had bought the presents the group of boys who had gone into the little neighboring town to buy things that they were taking home his consciousness of the fifteen shillings as absolutely his own his first thought that he would buy sweets with some of it and keep the rest for the holidays then the sudden flash of inspiration presents for everybody christmas presents for everybody and with that the sudden flooding of his heart with love for home for polchester for everyone even aunt amy and the kitchen-maid and then his delighted discovery in the general shop where they were that there were so many different things to buy and so many so cheap the half hour that he had and the wonderful excitement of taking back his parcels himself packing them in his play box and it ends in this he hadn't known that the money was not for him he hadn't thought for a moment that it was not he sat up on the bed and looked about the room and saw the things scattered about the floor the brush the necklace the glass of the picture was broken at the sight of that he suddenly began to cry again kneeling on the bed rubbing his knuckles into his eyes he felt sick his head was aching his eyes were red-hot and he felt anger furious rebellious anger he hated his father hated him so that it made him sick to think of him what would his father do to him he didn't care 
he would like to be terribly punished beaten to within an inch of his life because then he could with more justice than ever devote his life to hating his father he would hate him forever forever and ever and all this time he was crying in a snivelling sort of way like a little animal whose limb is broken the house was utterly silent about him no sound at all then he caught a thin feeble scratching at the door he climbed off the bed and went to it opening it cautiously he peered out hamlet was there wagging his tail he pulled him into the room shut the door dragging him on to the bed folded him into himself suffering himself to be licked from one ear to the other five how terrible the time that followed none of the cold children could remember anything at all like it even helen who was nearly grown up now because she was at the polchester high school and had won last term a prize for calisthenics was impressed with the tragedy of it all how awful that christmas day never by any of them to be forgotten for the rest of their lives jeremy came downstairs and there was a pretense of gaiety presents were distributed on christmas evening turkey and plum pudding were eaten a heavy cloud enveloped every one the fanatic that then was in mr cole began now to flower for the first time his son appeared to him as a conscience developing individual for the first time he really loved him and for the first time he felt that there was a soul to be saved and that he must save it for the first time also in their married lives a serious difference of opinion divided the father and mother mrs cole yearned over her son who was now in some strange way escaping her she was no psychologist and indeed thirty years ago parents never conceived of analyzing their children she was only discovering what every mother discovers that a year's absence had taken her boy away from her had given him interest that she could not share taught him ambitions confided to him secrets delivered him over to hero worshippings that would never be hers not for ten years would he return to her to be a mother you must have infinite patience secretly she rebelled against her husband's policy outwardly she submitted to it during all the week following christmas the coles were a miserable family and in the middle of them jeremy moved a figure of stone they wished him to be an outcast very well then he would be an outcast they thought him a criminal and not fit for their society very well then he would be a part and of himself the presents were there at the bottom of his play-box his only definite punishment was that he should receive no pocket money throughout the holidays but he was a pariah and a pariah he would be once his mother talked to him drawing him to her putting her arms around him jeremy dear just go to your father and say you're sorry and then it will all be over i'm not sorry well if you're not sorry about spending the money because you didn't know that you oughtn't to say you're sorry because you kicked father i'm not sorry i kicked father but father loves you he was only doing what he thought was right father doesn't love me or he would have known i didn't steal the money but jeremy dear father wants you to realize that you mustn't spend other people's money as though it were your own you're too young to understand now i'm not too young to understand mrs cole sighed this jeremy was utterly strange to her so old so oddly different from the boy of a year ago so hard and so hostile she was very unhappy and jeremy too was unhappy desperately unhappy it was no fun being a rebel sometimes he was on the very edge of surrender longing to go and submit to his father fling his arms around his mother listen to mary's silly stories play and shout and sing and laugh as he used to do something kept him back it was as though he were in a nightmare one of those nightmares when you can't speak a weight is on your chest you move against your will he was so unhappy that he told hamlet that he was going to run away to sea he had serious thoughts of this 
then suddenly uncle samuel returned from paris six it was a wet windy evening the rain was blowing in streaky gusts up orange street sending the lamps inebriated and whipping at windows as though it would never find outlet sufficient for its ill temper out of the storm came uncle samuel in a black cape and a floppy black hat straight from that mysterious unseen unfathomed country paris as usual he was casual and careless enough in his greetings kissed his sister quickly nodded to his brother-in-law grinned at the children and was in a moment transported to that strange region at the back of the house where was his studio that magical place into which none of the children had even entered he did not that evening apparently notice jeremy's desolate figure on the following afternoon jeremy hamlet at his heels was hanging disconsolately about the passage when his uncle suddenly appeared hello he said hello said jeremy uncle samuel was in his blue painting smock whereas the other members of the family were so well known to jeremy that they were almost like the wallpaper or the piano uncle samuel's appearance was always new and exciting with his chubby face the gray hair that stood up rather thinly about his crimson pate his fat stumpy body ironical blue eyes and little rather childish mouth he always seemed nearer to jeremy than the others younger more excitable more easily surprised he had the look of an old baby jeremy sometimes thought he looked at jeremy consideringly got anything to do no come on into the studio <gasps> oh may i well i wouldn't ask you if i didn't want you yes you may bring the dog jeremy's excitement was intense once long ago his uncle had said that he might go into the studio but he had never dared to venture he walked carefully like agog the door was opened a curtain pulled aside a long empty room with wide high windows overlooking meadow and hill a low bookcase running the length of the room a large sofa with cushions two rugs some pictures with their faces to the wall some other pictures hanging funny ones a girl with a green face a house all crooked a cow or was it a horse uncle samuel went to the sofa and sat down he called jeremy over to him and pulled him in between his knees been having a row he said yes said jeremy kicked your father yes what was it all about jeremy told him uncle samuel listened attentively his eyes no longer ironical he put his hand on jeremy's shoulder and the boy feeling the unexpected kindness burst into tears the misery of the last week overflowed from his heart i didn't know i didn't really i wanted to give them the things i, I wasn't wicked the man bent down and picked the boy up and held him tight and then he talked to him look here you've not got to mind this you were wrong too you know your father was right from his way of seeing things his way isn't yours that's all when you get older you'll find people often don't see things the way you do won't like the work you're proudest of simply won't understand it there are as many different opinions as can be in this old world and you've simply got to face it you've just got to be ready for anything not to get angry and kick don't let yourself be too sensitive you'll go up and you'll go down and when you're up people will say you ought to be down and when you're down there'll be a few kind souls will help you up again misunderstood why bless my soul you'll be misunderstood a million times before you're done if you've got work you like a friend you can trust and a strong stomach you'll have enough to be thankful for you won't understand all that i'm saying yet but you soon will you come along in here and be kind to your old uncle who's never had anything right all his life largely through his own fault mind you there there bless me you're as soppy as a shower of rain fond of your uncle jeremy hugged him that's right well mind you keep it up i can do with some will you say you're sorry to your father jeremy nodded his head that's right 
now listen this studio is for you to be in when you like not your beastly sisters mind you but you and your dog if he'll behave himself hamlet promised jeremy ceased to cry he looked about him when they had come in the room had been in dusk now it was too dark to see he felt for his uncle's hand and held it nothing so wonderful as this had yet happened in his life he did not know however how wonderful in reality that evening would afterwards seem to him all his after life he would look back to it the dark room the dog quiet at their feet the cool strength of his uncle's hand the strange heating excitement the happiness and security after the week of wild loneliness and dismay it was in that half hour that his real life began it was then that like alice in her looking-glass he stepped over the brook and entered into his inheritance End of chapter 2chapter three of jeremy and hamlet by hugh walpole this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the dance one a fortnight after christmas a bomb partly of apprehension partly of delight fell upon the cole family an invitation to a dance in the house of mrs mulholland of cleek the invitation arrived at breakfast and the children would in all probability have known nothing at all about it had it not been in an envelope addressed to miss cole helen therefore opened it and never having received anything like it before thought at first that it was a grown-up invitation to a grown-up tea-party miss cole miss mary cole master jeremy cole mrs james mulholland at home january tenth eighteen ninety five the manor house cleek dancing six thirty to ten she was flattered by this of course but it was not until the word dancing caught her eye that she realized the true significance of the invitation dancing she adored it at the high school she was recognized as the best dancer of all the younger girls she was she knew she was she was adorable fascinating wonderful when she danced she was she knew she was she gave her mother the invitation and in a voice trembling with emotion said oh mother may we go may we mary and jeremy who saw that they also were concerned in this mysterious affair stopped eating mrs cole looked at the card mrs mulholland how good of her and she really hardly knows us we've only exchanged calls mrs mulholland that's the woman out at cleek said aunt amy who always liked to feel that she was the real directress of the cole family affairs has she asked the children to a party yes to a dance on the tenth well of course they cannot go said aunt amy decisively cleek's much too far now it happened that on that particular morning mr cole was feeling considerably irritated by his sister-in-law he often felt like this and spent many half-hours in wondering why his sister-in-law and his brother-in-law neither of them at all sympathetic to him occupied his house and then he remembered that his sister-in-law at least shared in the expenses of the family and that without that share finances would be difficult but this morning even this thought did not overcome his dislike of his sister-in-law he was ready to contradict anything that she said he looked over the top of his egg at his wife i don't see why they shouldn't go we can have a cab from pools aunt amy who like mrs norris was very careful with other people's money burst out but think herbert all the expense of a cab and it will have to wait to take them back again and pools charges go up and up i'm sure the children will do very nicely at home how gladly at that moment would helen mary and jeremy put poison in aunt amy's tea or stabbed her in the back with a bread knife however little as they realized it she was doing everything to help their cause mr cole looking at aunt amy very severely said thank you amy but that's my affair poor as we are we can still afford a cab i think it will be good for the children to go mrs mulholland's kindness must not be rejected 
at that moment in came uncle samuel late and unshaven as usual and the conversation was not continued the affair was settled by the kindness of a neighbor mrs carstairs who having been also invited to take her small boy offered to share a cab and chaperone the cold children no child of today can possibly conceive what it was like to us children in the old days in polchester to be invited to a dance for the grown-ups in polchester there were a great many balls more perhaps than there are today but for the children there was very little some afternoon parties perhaps one pantomime little more to the cold children an evening dance a dance out of polchester with a drive at both ends of it was wonder beyond wonder life was instantly at the merest murmur of its name transformed into something exquisite rainbow-coloured fantastical helen's transports were all selfish she was not a bad girl did you grant her her devastating egotism she cared for her family she was neither vindictive nor mean not too greedy and not too vain but she drove towards her purpose with the cold clean-cut assurance of a steel knife cutting paper and that purpose was the aggrandizement and public splendor of helen cole mary was the romantic one of the family and this ball was as marvellous to her as were ever the coach and wand to cinderella full of tremors she nevertheless allowed her imagination full play soon mrs mulholland her house her grounds her family her servants were scattered with stardust ablaze with diamonds glittering with pearls and rubies she sat for hours motionless picturing it jeremy's attitude was mixed he was deeply excited but hid his emotion from every one save uncle samuel of whom in the strictest privacy he asked many searching questions he had a habit just at this time which was found irritating by his elders of asking questions and himself answering them as for instance will it be the same cab both ways uh, yes will it be mostly girls that will be there no if you know the answers to the questions what do you ask them for said uncle samuel but he didn't know the answers to his questions it was a habit into which he had fallen he would try and stop it uncle samuel gave him his view of dances in general it was a poor one jeremy who was adoring his uncle just now tried to feel superior uncle samuel says dances are rotten he announced to helen mother says you're not to use that word said helen nevertheless in his heart he was excited desperately two the day arrived which for a whole week it had seemed that it would never have strength sufficient to do all the afternoon they were being dressed the young assistant of mr consett the hairdresser came up to attend to helen and mary this had never happened before the dresses of helen and mary were alike white silk with pink ribbons helen looked lovely with her black hair big black eyes and thick eyelashes her slender white neck tall slim body and lovely ankles she was one upon whom fine clothes settled with a sigh of satisfaction as though they knew that they were in luck with mary it was precisely the opposite the plainer you dressed her the better fine clothes only accentuated her poor complexion dusty hair and ill-shaped body yes helen looked lovely even jeremy would have noticed it had he not been absorbed by his own clothing for the first time in his life he was wearing a white waistcoat he was of course uncomfortably clean he hated the sticky feeling in his hair the tightness of his black shoes the creaking of his stiff white shirt but these things must be had he only known it his snub nose his square pugnacious face and a certain sturdy soundness of his limbs gave him exactly the appearance of a psyllium puppy but psylliums were not popular thirty years ago hamlet smelt the unusual cleanliness of his master and was excited by it he stuck closely to his heels determining that if his master were going away again this time he would not be left behind but would go too when however poole's cab really arrived he was given no chance 
being held to his infinite disgust in the bony arms of aunt amy all the grown-ups were there to watch them go and mrs hounslow and minnie the parlour-maid in the background mr cole was smiling and looking quite cheerful he felt that this was all his doing now children cried aunt amy as though it were her family her cab and her party mind you enjoy yourselves and tell mrs carstairs that mother doesn't want you to stay too late they were to pick up mrs carstairs who lived higher up the terrace who was a nice rosy-faced woman a widow with a small boy called herbert because herbert was their father's name it had a solemn grown-up air to the children and they felt the contrast to be very funny indeed when a small pale-faced mouse of a boy was piloted into the cab he was so deeply smothered in shawls and comforters that there was little to be seen but a sharply peaked nose he was it seemed a serious-minded child soon after getting into the cab he remarked i do hope that we all enjoy ourselves this evening i'm sure mrs carstairs although she was stout and jolly was so nervous about the health of her only child that she made all the children nervous too you aren't feeling cold bertie darling are you uh, you haven't got a headache have you oh lean against mother darling if you're tired are you tired to all of which herbert answered very solemnly i am not mother he was however it seemed a child with a considerable sense of humour because he suddenly pinched jeremy in the fatty part of his thigh and then looked at him very severely as though challenging him to say anything about it and it suddenly occurred to jeremy that you had a great advantage if you looked old and solemn because no one would ever believe anything wicked of you his thoughts however of young herbert were soon lost in the excitement of the adventure of the cab nothing that he had ever known was more wonderful than this the rolling through the lighted town the background so dark like the inside of a box the tearing through the market-place now so silent and mysterious down through north street over the paul bridge and so out into the country the silence of the high road rhythmed by the clamp clamp of the horse's hoofs the mysterious gleam of white patches as the road was illumined by the light from the carriage lamps the heavy thick-set hedges watching as though they were an army of soldiers drawn up in solemn order to let the carriage pass through the smell of the night mingled with the smell of the cab the rattle of the ill-fitting windows the excited half-strangled breathing of mary all these together produced in jeremy's breast a feeling of exultation pride and adventure that was never to be forgotten they were all packed very closely together and bounced about like marionettes without self-control jeremy said in a voice hoarse with bumping and excitement shall i put my gloves on yet he had never had white gloves before mrs carstairs said you might try them on dear and see uh, be careful not to split them which of course he immediately did not a very bad split and between the thumb and finger of the left hand so that perhaps it would not be seen while with some concern he was considering this they drove through park gates and along a wide drive to jeremy's excited fancy silver birds seemed to fly past the windows and sheets of stars bend down and flash to the ground and rise swinging up to heaven again they passed a stretch of water on their right dark like a blind mirror but with a crack of light that crossed it and then faded into splashing gold where the lamps and shining windows of the house reflected in it they were there other carriages also children like ghosts passing up the stone steps the great house so strangely indifferent he saw as he got out of the carriage dark spaces beyond the splash of light where the garden was hidden cold and reserved and apart it was like him to notice that the only child that evening who saw inside the house there was a sudden noise of laughter and voices and people moving and two large footmen with white powdered hair waiting to take your coats without his coat waiting for a moment alone he felt shivery and shy and very conscious of his white waistcoat then he saw young ernest son of the dean of polchester and bill bartlett and the misses bartlett children of one of the canons and tommy winchester son of the precentor he winked 
at tommy who was a fat round boy with a face like an apple but pretended not to see when ernest caught his eye because he hated ernest and having fought him once nearly two years ago hoped very much to have the pleasure of fighting him again soon and licking him he advanced into the big shining dazzling room behind his two sisters as onto a field of battle the Mrs. Cole and Master Cole, shouted a large stout man with a face like an oyster, and then Jeremy found himself shaking hands with a beautiful lady, all white hair, black silk and diamonds, and an old gentleman with an eyeglass, and then, before he knew it, he was standing against the wall with Mary and Helen surveying the scene. As he watched, a sudden desperate depression fell upon him, it was all like a painted picture that he was outside. He was an outcast, and Mary was an outcast, and Helen. They had arrived at an interval between the dances, and the gleaming floor was like a great lake stretching from golden shore to golden shore. From the ceiling hung great clusters of light, throwing down splashes like dim islands, and every once and again someone would cross the floor very carefully, seeming to struggle to reach the islands, to pause there for a moment as though for safety. Against the wall, right around the ballroom, figures were ranged, some like Chinese idols, silent and motionless, others animated and excited. Voices rose like the noise of wind or rain. Everyone, even the Chinese idols, seemed to be at home and at their ease. Only Jeremy and his sisters were cared for by no one. Then suddenly a stout, smiling woman appeared, as though out of the floor, and behind her a very frightened boy. She spoke to Helen. "'You're Helen Cole, are you not? Well, dear, here's Harry Preston and wants you to have a dance with him.' Then, turning to Mary, "'Are you dancing the next, dear?' no well we must alter that here's willie richmond willie catching hold of a long and gawky boy you're not dancing the next are you i'm sure miss cole will be delighted then departed like a train that has picked up its passengers and is hurrying on to the next station the small boy gazed distressfully at helen but she was quite equal to him smiling with that sweet smile that was kept entirely for strangers or important visitors and saying what is it oh a polka that will be lovely i do like polkas don't you at that moment the band struck up and in another instant the floor was covered with figures the tall gawky boy dragged off mary who had said not a word but stared at him with distressed eyes through her spectacles Helen took absolute charge of her partner, moving away with such grace and elegance that Jeremy was suddenly proud of her, and seemed to see her as she really was, for the first time in his life. Then he realized that he was alone, absolutely alone, stuck against the wall, a silly gawk for all the world to look at and despise. 3. He set his chin, squared his shoulders, and tried to look as though he were there by preference. No one now paid any attention to him. The music swung on, and although he had never danced in his life, his toes kept time inside his shoes. He gazed haughtily around him, stared at the dancers as they passed him, and was miserable. Then the stout lady who had carried off Mary and Helen suddenly appeared again and said, what not dancing you're jeremy cole aren't you come along i'll find you a partner he was led away and precipitated at the feet of a very stout lady who stared at him in a frozen way and a frightened little girl he had a program in his hands and was going to ask her for some future polka when the mountainous lady said in a deep bass voice you better take her now she's been waiting long enough staring at the genial introducer as she spoke Jeremy led away his victim. He was acutely miserable, but the agony of stumbling, bumping, and incoherent whirling did not last long because the band suddenly stopped, and before he knew it he was sitting on the steps of a staircase with his partner and staring at her. She said not a word, then he saw that she was terrified, and pity held him. "'Do you like dances?' he asked hoarsely. "'I've never been to one before,' she answered in a convulsive whisper, looking as though she were about to cry. "'Where do you live?' 
he asked five pemberton terrace polchester she answered breathlessly was that your mother no auntie how many aunts have you five what a lot i've only one and it's quite enough how many uncles have you i haven't got an uncle i have a splendid one do any of your aunts paint auntie maud does what does she paint i don't know he felt this conversation so stupid that he looked at her in disgust what was it about girls why was there something the matter with all of them if this was what dances were he didn't want any more of them and it was just then at that most distressing moment that the wonderful the never to be forgotten event occurred someone was coming down from the stairs above them and wanted to pass them a voice said softly do you mind thank you so much jeremy rose and then looked up he was staring at the most beautiful lady he had ever conceived of indeed far more than he had ever conceived of because his dreams had not hitherto been of beautiful ladies he had never thought of them at all she was very tall and slender dressed in white she had black hair and a jewel blazing in the front of it but more than everything was her smile the jolliest merriest twinkliest smile he had ever seen he could only smile too standing against the banisters to let her pass perhaps there was something in his snub nose and the way his mouth curled at the corners that struck her she stopped enjoying yourself she asked yes he answered staring at her with all his soul well come on she said there's the music beginning again that appeal may have been made to the general stair-covered company but he felt that it was to him come on he said to his partner at the door of the ballroom he found to his relief the massive aunt thank you so much for the delightful dance he said bowing as he had seen others do and then he bolted heaven was on his side because just inside the room and standing for a moment alone gazing happily about her was the lovely lady could he did he dare his heart was beating in his breast his knees trembled he felt as he did when he was summoned to old thompson's study but the fear lest she should move away or someone should come and speak to her drove him forward he was at her side i say he muttered huskily is anybody dancing with you just now she swung round and looked down at him hello she said it's you yes he answered still choking i would like to dance with you well you shall she said and suddenly picked him up and whisked him round what happened after that he never knew once years before he had escaped from home gone to the polchester fair and ridden on the merry-go-round ridden on a wonderful coal black horse all alone under the stars something like that earlier experience was this exquisite happiness delicious movement in which the golden walls the blazing lights the glittering shining floor had their parts his feet kept no time they seemed scarcely to touch the floor but as the music dipped and swung so he also floating like a bird falling like the dying strain of a song rising like the flight of a star suddenly it ceased he came to earth breathless hot and most wonderfully happy she led him away holding his hand to a corner where there was a palm and a little tinkling fountain they seemed to be quite by themselves was that all right she asked laughing and fanning herself with a great fan of white feathers he could not speak he gulped and nodded what's your name she asked he told her she smiled jeremy that's a pretty name he blushed with pleasure do you go to school yet i expect you're good at football how wonderful of her to know that to ask about the one game that was near his heart he told her eagerly about it how he had played half-back twice for the school and had been kicked in the eye and hadn't cared and how next year he hoped to be the regular half-back because trefusis who had been half for three years was going to eton and he was very young to be half he'd only be eleven then and if he stayed on until he was thirteen i'm afraid that he boasted a little have you got any brothers and sisters she asked him 
he told her all about mary and helen and his mother and father and aunt amy and uncle samuel especially about uncle samuel and while he talked he stared and stared and stared never taking his eyes from her face for a single moment she was laughing all the time and suddenly she said shall i tell you something jeremy he nodded his head this is the very happiest day of my life i'm so happy that it's all i can do not to sing i'm very happy too he said i didn't think i'd like dances till you came but now they're splendid the cruel music suddenly began and there standing in front of them was a tall dark man very fine and straight the lady rose this is jeremy she said and this is major jeremy didn't catch the name he would wish to hate him for taking her away had he not looked so fine just in short what jeremy would like to look when he grew up i tell you what the lady said turning around jeremy you shall take me down to supper yes he shall michael after all it's their evening not ours four dances from this that's right number eleven got it good-bye she was gone and jeremy was staring around him as though in a dream four four dances from now what should he do meanwhile to dance with anyone else would be desecration suddenly tommy winchester appeared i say he wheezed in his funny voice like miniature organ blowers have you been down to supper yet i've been down four times you should see the ices they've got ices after the experience he'd been having nevertheless he was interested where are they he asked down there said tommy pointing to some stairs that's the back stairs and you can go down as often as you please and nobody sees at that moment there came around the corner the supercilious figure of the dean's earnest he was very elegant more elegant as jeremy was forced to confess than himself would ever be hello you fellows said ernest he was twelve and was going next year to rugby it was irritating the way that he was always a year ahead of jeremy and everything i call it pretty rotten he said smoothing his gloves the band's not first class and the floor's awful well i think it's splendid said jeremy oh do you said ernest scornfully you would ever been to a dance before yes lots said jeremy and it was to be hoped that heaven will forgive him that lie well it's my belief that it's his first said ernest confidentially to tommy what a kid like that's doing away from his nurse i can't think nevertheless he moved away because jeremy had grown remarkably thick and sturdy during the last year and had already in polchester a pugnacious reputation i say said tommy who seemed to have been long ago forced by his appearance of good-natured chubbiness into the role of perpetual peacemaker you can get to the supper down there pointing to the stairs you should see the ices they've got i've been four times have they said the dean's earnest his sallow countenance freshening can you get down that way you bet said tommy come on then and they disappeared jeremy was rather distressed by this encounter ernest had had the last word he wished that he had been able to say sucks to you which in addition to being the cry of the moment was applicable to almost every occasion never mind the opportunity would undoubtedly return such an episode should not cloud his happiness he seemed to be moving clouded by the great white fan that she had used that hid him from the rest of the world he did indeed dance with helen and would have danced with mary could he have found her he danced also with the little girl with spots but in these dances he was blinded and stunned with the light from juno's eyes it was an utterly new experience to him he could compare it with nothing at all save the day when stevens the football captain had said he had stood it well over his eye and once when he had gone to have a tooth out and the dentist hadn't taken it after all and this again was different from those it was like hot coffee and summer lightning and chestnuts bursting as they fell from the autumn trees not that he made these comparisons consciously of course most of all it was like a dream the most wonderful of all his nights the third dance was over he must go and find her five 
he stepped along the floor looking about him from side to side he thought he saw her started forward and felt someone touch him on the arm he turned round mary was at his shoulder hello he said i'm in a hurry oh jeremy do wait a minute she looked at him piteously well what is it come out here for a moment please do he did not want to hurt her but this pause was an agony to him what is it he asked crossly when they were in the hall outside the ballroom oh jeremy it's all so horrid do dance with me one little boy danced with me and then his mother tried to make him dance again and he wouldn't and i'm sure it wasn't my fault because i danced much better than he did and then herbert said he could dance and he couldn't and we fell down and he didn't seem to mind at all but i minded because everybody laughed and i tore my dress and there hasn't been anybody to dance with for ever so long and helen's been dancing all the time oh jeremy do dance with me i do love dancing so and you haven't danced with me all the evening it was true that he had not but oh how he wished her at the other end of england at that moment she looked so foolish with her hair all over the place and her dress untidy her sash pulled down the wrong way and her stockings wrinkled and every moment was precious she would be looking for him wondering where he was thinking him mean thus to break his promise when she had given him so special a favour at that thought he started away no no mary later on we'll have a dance do if you like but not now i can't really but mary was desperate oh jeremy you must i can't sit here any more and be looked at by everyone oh please jeremy i'll give you my mother-of-pearl box if you will i don't want your old box he said gruffly he looked at her looked away looked back at her said all right then come on his heart was like lead the evening was ruined for him and not only the evening but perhaps his whole life and yet what was he to do mary would cry if he left her she had had a miserable evening something in him was touched as it always was by her confident belief that he and he alone in all the world could always put things right it was just his cursed luck his evening was ruined he hoped that after this they would go home they had what seemed to him the most miserable of dances but he could see that mary was what uncle samuel called seventh heaven she bounced about stamping her heels on jeremy's toes bumping into him suddenly pushing back her wild hair from her frenzied face giving little snorts of pleasure humping her shoulders tossing her head round and round they went dancing what they imagined to be a polka jeremy with his face grimly set agonized disappointment in his heart when it was over they sat out on the stairs and mary panted her thanks ah oh, that was lovely jeremy we, we do dance well together don't we that was the nicest i've ever had i do hope we'll have another i expect it's awfully late said jeremy gloomily we'll be going home soon soon the music began again and at the bottom of the stairs to jeremy's immense relief they met mrs carstairs with the serious-faced herbert that's right mary dear mrs carstairs said i've been looking for you it's time we went down to supper herbert will take us down have you had supper jeremy he muttered some excuse and was off with beating heart he searched the crowds nowhere nowhere he searched the fast emptying ballroom then the hall then with tears in his eyes and a choked strangling in his throat was turning back when he caught sight of the diamond star high above the other heads and the lovely soft black hair and the jolly smile traitor she said you forgot after all no i didn't forget it was my sister but there was no time for explanation did you go with someone else to supper yes i've had supper oh he half turned away a tear was near its fall i suppose you couldn't uh, oh yes i could she twirled him around i can have any number of suppers i can have supper all day and supper all night come along you shall take me down in style i put my arm through yours like that see no the right now we lead the way who's coming down to supper his pride and his happiness 
who shall describe them his back was so straight as they walked down the stairs that he almost fell backwards the supper-room was a clatter of noise but he was not so proud but that he was suddenly hungry wildly savagely hungry she piled his plate with things watching him laughing at him nobody's cut the cake yet she cried you shall cut it jeremy an old stout servant with white hair who had been watching her with smiling eyes brought a huge castle with towers and battlements and flags and placed it in front of her she made jeremy stand on his chair she gave him a great knife and showed him where to cut everyone at the other tables stopped eating and turned around to see and then they shouted and clapped one two three he cried and cut into the cake then they all cheered bravo she said you did that very well now janet will cut the rest you must have a piece and i must have a piece perhaps one of us will get the ring or the thimble and miracle of miracles he got the ring the silver ring she put it on his finger herself he flushed his lip trembled he felt that he wanted everything to end just then at that moment for nothing more ever to happen again when he had had three ices one after the other she decided that supper was over they walked out of the room as they had walked into it in stately fashion her arm through his then at the top of the stairs there was mrs carstairs come jeremy dear she said it's time to go home the carriage is there he saw that the tall major was there also hello young un he said had a good supper he nodded his head but he had eyes only for her i'm glad i got that ring he whispered because you put it on my finger and i'll never take it off till i die not even when you wash she asked laughing i won't wash that finger he said the major put his hand on his shoulder here i've got a secret for you shut your eyes jeremy shut them the major's hands were at his white waistcoat pocket now don't you look till you're on your way home then i'll tell you something you've shown excellent taste tonight you couldn't have shown better if you were a hundred she bent down and kissed him good night she said will you write and tell me about the football you bet your life he answered staring at her that was the favorite oath just then at thompson's she laughed again then bending down whispered in his ear dramatically if i'm ever in trouble and need you will you come wherever you are whatever you're doing oh yes he said his eyes never leaving her face she kissed him again six they were all in the cab rolling homewards he felt in his pocket something there in paper he could tell by the feel of it that it was a sovereign or a shilling cautiously he lifted it to the light of the lodge lights it was gold he sighed with satisfaction but the real thing was the silver ring he sat there making calculations mrs carstairs he said suddenly if i have three pence a week for eight years and save it all could i have enough to be married there was no answer she was apparently sleeping so he added sotto voce and perhaps father will give me sixpence a week after i'm fifteen End of chapter three Chapter Four of Jeremy and Hamlet by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four: Saladin and the Black Bishop. One. The old town, like human beings, had its moods of excited reminiscence. Why should it not? Now brooding, now suddenly waking into lightning flashes of dramatic history, so that every one in the place, scarcely knowing why, began to dream of the old days when armored men fought all the way down the high street and up again, and the black bishop rode on his great horse to the edge of the rock where the cloisters now are, and saw the beggarly heretics flung over far down into the waters below and the peasants had their fare up on the hill above the pole and were all so bedrunken that they set the town on fire so that three-quarters of it was burnt to the ground in fourteen fifty seven as every one knows and the cathedral itself only saved by a miracle 
and the meeting of the maidens in the market-place who brought a flag which they had worked to send to monmouth and bridgewater and the last drowning of a witch old mother huckampinch in the pall in seventeen twenty three and so farther and farther and farther history 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 it lay thick as dust upon the town and only needed a little stirring of the town soil to send the dust up into people's eyes making them think of times dead and gone and ghosts closer still about them perhaps than they had cared to think it must have been during one of these moods of the town that jeremy was caught he was as all readers of these reminiscences of his early days will have discovered a two-sided boy and he had already a strange secret interior life within his very healthy and normal exterior one there is nothing harder perhaps in our own experience than to look back and discover when it was that that secret life was as it were first confirmed and strengthened by something in the real world that corresponded to it for some of us that actual moment was so dramatic so strangely concrete and definite so friendly as though it were someone suddenly appearing out of the dark and speaking to us and showing us that we were not alone either in experience or desire as we had supposed that we cannot possibly forget its precise time and colour with others two or three occasions can claim to have worked the miracle with others again that confirmation was gradual arising out of no definite incident but rather creeping forward like a finger of the rising sun slowly lighting one's path and showing one where to go with jeremy there had been already definite signs his adventure years ago with the sea captain his days on the beach at raphael his friendship with uncle samuel but his actual realization of something strange and mysterious ancient and yet present friendly and yet hostile reassuring and yet terrifying active and yet quiescent his recognition of that life beyond the wall dated quite definitely from his discovery of saladin and his strange adventure in the cathedral as i have already said on that particular week the last week of his christmas holidays the town was up to its tricks had it not been jeremy would surely never have felt the spirit of adventure so strongly never gone into the old bookshop never ah, but you will hear he was very quiet and behaving beautifully during that last week yes beautifully until the last three days when the devil who is always on the wait for young gentlemen when they are about to return to school or the town or uncle samuel or something or somebody suddenly got hold of him and led him the strangest dance it must have been the devil that led to the adventure of the night raiders and that is quite another story but again it might have been the old town nobody knows how can anybody know thirty years after it was all over and done with until those last three days jeremy behaved like an angel that is he listened to aunt amy and washed his hands when she told him to he did not tease his little sister barbara nor hide helen's hair ribbons he allowed mary to go walking with him and gave miss jones a present when she returned from her holiday he felt perhaps that as the holidays had begun so awfully with that terrible disaster of the christmas presents it was up to him to see that they ended properly and then he was truly a good little boy who wanted things to go well and every one to be comfortable and happy only so strangely moods would creep in and desires and ambitions and grown-up people would have such an amazing point of view about boys and misunderstand their natural impulses so dreadfully what he meant was that if he were grown up and had a boy he wouldn't be such an ass the trouble of these last days all began by his suddenly remembering that he had never read his holiday task he did not remember of himself but was reminded by bill bartlett whom he met in the high street who said that the last two days had been miserable for him by having to swat at his rotten holiday task and that he didn't know anything about it now 
jeremy had completely forgotten his he hurried home and dragged it forth from its deserted corner the talisman a tale of the crusades by sir walter scott baronet it was a horrible-looking book with a dark green cover no pictures and rows of notes at the end jeremy was not as yet a very great reader of anything being slow and lazy about it and very eager to skip the difficult words his favourite two books were robinson crusoe and the swiss family robinson simply because in those books people invented things in a jolly way and after all any day one might be on a desert island and it was useful to know what to do of sir walter scott baronet he had never in his life heard nor did he wish to hear of him nevertheless something must be done old thompson took holiday tasks very seriously indeed jeremy's report last term had not been a very good one and father's eye was upon him his first idea was that he would get uncle samuel to tell him the story but when he showed his uncle the book that gentleman waved his paintbrush in the air and said that walter was a fine old gentleman who died game but a rotten writer and it was a shame to make kids wade through his abominable prose there was then no hope here jeremy looked at the book read half a page and then threw it at hamlet but the stern truth of the matter was that in such a matter as this and indeed in most of the concerns of his daily life he resembled a spy working his way through the enemy's camp surrounded on every side by foes compelled to consider every movement doomed to death and dishonour if he were caught it had come to it now that there was in practical fact nothing that he desired to do that he was not forbidden to do and because his school life had given him rules and standards that did not belong to his home life he criticized at every turn there was for instance this affair of walking in the town by himself he could understand that helen and mary should not go by themselves because there was apparently something mysterious and precious in girls that was destroyed were they left alone for a single moment but a boy a boy who had travelled by himself all those miles to a distant county a boy who in all probability would be the half-back for the school next term a boy who in another two years would be at a public school what it came to of course was that he was continually giving his elders the slip was indeed like the spy in the enemy's country because every move had to be considered and at the end all the excuses ranged in a long row and the most serviceable carefully chosen and threadbare by now they were becoming on this particular afternoon the first of the last three days of the holidays he gave miss jones and helen the slip in the market-place this was to-day easy to do because it was market-day he knew that helen was too deeply concerned with herself and her appearance to care whether he were there or no and that miss jones delighted as she always was with the shops knowing them by heart and yet never tired of them would optimistically trust that he would very soon reappear and at any rate he knew his way home he was always delighted with the market on market days never although so constantly repeated did it lose its savour for him he adored everything the cattle and the sheep in their pens the farmers with their thick broad backs and thick broad sticks talking in such solemn and serious clusters the avenue down the middle of the market-place where you walked past stall after stall stalls of vegetables stalls of meat stalls of cups and saucers stalls of china ornaments stalls of pots and pans and best far best of all the flower stalls with their pots of beautiful flowers their seeds and their tiny plants growing in rows in wooden boxes but it was not the outside market that was the most truly entrancing on the right of the market-place there were strange mysterious passages known to the irreverent as the catacombs and here in a dusk that would you would have supposed have precluded any real buying or selling altogether the true business of the market went on 
it was here under these dark ages that in his younger days the toy shop had enchanted him and even now although he would own it to no one alive the trains and the air guns seemed to him vastly alluring there was also a football too small for him not at all the football that he wanted to buy but nevertheless better than nothing at all he looked at it the price was eight and sixpence and he had in his pocket precisely five pence halfpenny he sighed fingered the ball that was hanging in mid-air and it revolved round and round in the most entrancing manner the old woman with a moustache who had it was reputed ever since the days of genesis managed the toy shop besought him in wheedling tones to purchase it he could only sigh again look at it lovingly twirl it around once more and pass on he was in that mood when he must buy something an entrancing delicious and intoxicating mood a mood that helen and mary were in all the time and would continue to remain in it like the rest of their sex until the end for them of purses money and all earthly hopes and ambitions next to the toy stall was a funny old book stall always hitherto he had passed this not that it was uninteresting because the old man who kept the place had colored prints that he stuck with pens into the wooden sides of his booth and these prints were delightful funny people in old costumes coaches stuck in the snow or a number of stout men tumbling about the floor after drinking too much but the trouble with mr samuel porter was that he did not change his prints often enough being as any one could see a man of lazy and indifferent habits and when jeremy had seen the same prints for over a year he naturally knew them by heart on this particular day however old mr samuel had changed his prints and there were some splendid new ones in purples and reds and greens representing skating on the ice going up in a balloon an evening in vauxhall and the fun of the fair jeremy stared at these with open mouth especially at the fun of the fair which was most amusing because in it a pig was running away and upsetting everybody just as it might quite easily do here in the market-place he stood looking and mr porter who wore a faded green hat and large spectacles and hated little boys because they never bought anything but only teased him and ran away looked at him out of the corner of his eye and dared him to be cheeky he had no intention whatever of being cheeky he stared at the books all so broken and old and melancholy and thought what a dreary thing having to read was and how unfortunate about his holiday task and how silly of him to have thought of it just at that moment and so spoiled his afternoon he would then have passed on had it not been by the strangest coincidence that at that very instant his eye fell on a little pile of books at the front of the stall and the book on the top of the pile had the very name of his holiday task the talisman by sir walter scott baronet it was the strangest looking book very different indeed from the book at home he stared at it as though it was a lucky charm how strange that it should be there and appearing so oddly different from the book at home it was dressed in shabby and faded yellow covers he picked it up on the outside he read in large letters stead's penny classics penny could it be that this book was only a penny why if so he could buy it and four others like it this sudden knowledge gave him a new proprietary interest in the book as when you discover that a stranger at an hotel lives when at home in your own street opening the little book he saw that the print was very small indeed that the lines were crooked and irregular here very black and there only dim gray but in the very fact of this faint print there was something mysterious and appealing no notes here of course and no undue emphasis on this scott baronet man simply the talisman short and sweet old mr porter observing the unusual sight of a small boy actually taking a book in his hands and reading it was interested he had seen the small boy often enough 
and although he would never admit it to himself had liked his look of sturdy independence and healthy self-assurance he had not thought that the boy was a reader he leaned forward only a penny he wheezed he suffered terribly from asthma and the boys of the town used to call after him old barrel organ and just the story for a boy like you i'll have it said jeremy with sudden pride he was of half a mind to buy some of the others he saw that one more was by scott baronet but no he would see now this one before he ventured any farther he walked off with his prize two that night he did what he had never done before he read in bed he was doing as he well knew what was absolutely forbidden and the novelty of the event the excitement of his disobedience the strange wobbly light that the candle flung as it shifted when his movements were very impetuous in its insecure china saucer the way the lines of the printed page ran tumultuously together all these things helped his sense of the romantic he had found every line a difficulty in the other edition now the sense of indulging the forbidden carried him across the first page or two and then he was fairly inside it the little book was very difficult to read not only was it vilely printed but also the words ran in a kind of cascade down into the very binding of the book and you had to pull the thing apart as wide as it would go and then peer into the very depths of darkness and obscurity nevertheless it was his book bought with his own money and he read and read on and on and in the morning he read again and in the evening and on the fourth day late in the night the candle very low in its china socket the room lit with sudden flashes of bizarre brilliance the book was finished three he was dazzled bewildered he could think of nothing else at all the very first meeting of the nights in the desert had marvelously caught his fancy he had never imagined anything like that so courteous so amiable and so fierce just so would he entertain the dean's earnest did he meet him in the desert sharing his food and drink with him complimenting him on his armor and his horse he would be very showy would the dean's earnest and the next day sticking his spear through his vitals yes that would be intensely pleasing but the trouble would be that the dean's earnest would most certainly not play fair but would seize some mean advantage steal all jeremy's dates when he wasn't looking or give him one in the back then the visit to the hermit's cave and the silence of the chapel and the procession of the wonderful ladies and the dropping of the rose at sir kenneth's feet from that point forward jeremy dwelt under enchantment nothing could take him from it and he believed every word of it just as true to him these men and deeds of the eastern desert as were the men and deeds of orange street Polchester. truer indeed he never quite believed in uncle samuel and aunt amy and barbara but in sir kenneth and king richard and edith and saladin how could he not utterly believe saladin his was the figure that ultimately emerged from the gilded background of the picture saladin he became at once jeremy's ideal of everything that was beautiful and like a man and brave he haunted jeremy's dreams he followed him in his walks came before him as he ate and drank he must know more about him than scott baronet told you and once again uncle samuel was sought jeremy had formed a habit now of dropping into uncle samuel's studio whenever it pleased him the other children watched him with eyes of wonder and desire even aunt amy was surprised she said a little but sniffed a lot and told her brother that he would regret the day he laughed and told her that jeremy was the only artist among the lot of them at which aunt amy went to jeremy's father and told him to be careful because her brother was filling the child's head with all sorts of notions that could do him no possible good jeremy behaved like a saint in his uncle's studio he had his own corner of the shabby sofa where he would sit curled up like a dog 
he chattered on and on pouring out the whole of his mind heart and soul keeping nothing back because his uncle seemed to understand everything and never made you feel a fool he attacked him at once about saladin and would not let him alone in vain uncle samuel protested that he knew no history and that saladin was a colored devil as wicked as sin and jeremy stuck fast to his ideal so that at length uncle samuel in sheer self-defense was compelled to turn to a subject about which he did know something namely the history of the town polchester in which they were living never to any living soul had uncle samuel confided that he cared in the least about the old town in his heart nevertheless he adored it and for years had he been studying its life and manners to his grave his knowledge would have gone with him had not jeremy in the secrecy of the studio lured him on then as though they were dram drinking together did the two sit close and talk about the town and under the boy's eyes the streets blossomed like the rose the fountains played the walls echoed to the cries and shouts of armored men and the cathedral towers rose ever higher and higher gigantic majestic wonderful piercing the eternal sky best of all he liked to hear about the black bishop that proud priest who had believed himself greater than the high god had defeated all his enemies lived in the castle on the hill above the town like a king and was at last encircled by a ring of foes caught in the cathedral square and died there fighting to the end jeremy would never forget one afternoon when he sat on the floor his head against the shabby sofa and uncle samuel who was doing something to his paint box became carried away with the picture of his story he drew for jeremy the old town with the gabled roofs and the balconies and the cobbled roads and the cathedral so marvelously alive above it all as he talked the winter sun poured into the room in a golden stream making the whitewashed walls swan color turning some old stuffs that he had hanging over the door and near the window into wine-red shadow and purple light and the trees beyond the high windows were stained copper against the dusky sky uncle samuel's voice stopped and the room slided into gray jeremy stared after him and saw saladin and the black bishop gigantic figures hovering over the town that was small and colored like a musical box the cathedral was a new place to him no longer somewhere that was tiresome and dreary on sunday and dead all the rest of the week he longed to go there by himself alone nobody to see what he would do and hear what he would say he would go he would go he nodded to himself in the dark four all very well but he must be quick about it if these holidays were to see him bring it off only three days then aunt amy announced that she intended on this fine afternoon to pay a call on miss nightingale who lived in the precincts and to her great surprise jeremy suggested that he should accompany her she was rather flattered and when it was discovered that miss jones and helen were also going that way and would pick jeremy up and bring him home she agreed to the plan jeremy and she were old old enemies he had insulted her again and again played jokes upon her had terrible storms of temper with her but once when a wretched little boy had laughed at her he had fought the little boy and she had never forgotten that as he grew older something unregenerate in her insisted on admiring him he was such a thorough boy so sturdy and manly she adored the way that his mouth went up at the corners when he laughed she liked his voice when it was hoarse with a serious effort to persuade somebody of something then although he had so often been rude to her she could not deny that he was a thorough little gentleman in all that she meant by that term his manners when he liked could be beautiful quite as good as helen's and much less artificial if you cared for boys at all which aunt amy must confess that she did not then jeremy was the sort of boy to care for 
she had in fact both a family and an individual pride in him he was very funny to-day walking up the high street she could not understand him at all would you jump aunt amy if you suddenly saw the black bishop on his coal-black horse with his helmet and suit of mail riding along down the high street the black bishop what black bishop was the boy being impertinent to dear bishop crozier whose hair was in any case white who had certainly never ridden a coal-black horse jeremy carefully explained oh the one in the cathedral oh but he was dead and buried long ago yes but if he should come to life he was strong enough for anything what an idea she couldn't think where the boy got those strange irreligious ideas from from her brother samuel she supposed the dead don't come back like that jeremy dear she explained gently how do you do miss mackenzie oh much better thank you it was only a little foolish toothache it isn't right of us to suppose they do god doesn't mean us to i don't believe god could stop the black bishop coming back if he wanted to said jeremy aunt amy would have been terribly shocked had she not seen a most remarkable hat in forrest's window that was only thirteen and eleven what did you say dear with a little bit of blue at the side oh but you mustn't say that dear that's very wicked god can do everything saladin didn't believe in god said jeremy winking at tommy winchester who was in charge of his mother on the other side of the street at least not in your god or father's his god oh there's mrs winchester take off your hat jeremy i'm sure it's going to snow before i get back perhaps miss nightingale will be out and i'm sure i shan't be sorry you mustn't say that jeremy there's only one god but if there's only one god he began then broke off at the sight of a dog strangely like hamlet not so nice though not nearly so nice he was returning to his consideration of the deity the black bishop and saladin when behold they were already in the precincts now you'll be all right jeremy dear won't you just for a minute or two miss jones can't be long all right of course he would be all right if you like to wait here and just see perhaps miss nightingale won't be in and then we could go back together no he thought he wouldn't wait because he had promised miss jones who would be on the other side of the cathedral very well then he watched his aunt ring miss nightingale's very neat little doorbell and saw her then admitted into miss nightingale's very neat little house at that moment the cathedral chimes struck a quarter past four he stepped across the path pushed up the heavy leather flap of the great door and entered afternoon service which began at half-past three was just ending some special saint's day far far away in the distance the canon's voice beautifully echoed the choir responded the peace of god that passes all understanding passeth all understanding passeth all understanding repeated the thick pillars and the high arched roof dove-coloured now in the dusk and the deep black stained seats passeth all understanding all understanding the flagstones echoed deep deep into the ground the organ rolled into a voluntary white flecks of colour splashed for a moment against the screen and were gone two or three people tourists probably came slowly down the nave paused for a moment to look at the garrison window with the christ and the little children and went out through the west end door the organ rolled on the only sound now in the building jeremy was suddenly frightened strange that a place which had always seemed to him the last word and commonplace should now terrify him it was different alive moving in the heart of its shadows whispering he walked down the side aisle looking at every tablet every monument every window with a new interest the aliveness of the church walked with him it was as though as he passed them they gathered themselves and followed in a long grey silent procession after him he reached the side chapel where was the tomb of the black bishop there he lay safely enclosed behind the golden grill his gauntleted hands folded on his chest his spurs on his heels 
angels supporting his head and grim defiance in his face jeremy stared and stared and stared again about him and around him and above him the cathedral seemed to grow vaster and vaster clouds of dusk filled it the color from the windows and the tombs and the great gold trumpeting angels stained the shadows with patches of light jeremy was cold and shivered he looked up and there opposite him standing on the raised steps leading to the choir was the black bishop he was there just as jeremy had fancied him standing his legs a little apart one mailed fist resting on his sword his thick black beard sweeping his breastplate he was staring at jeremy and seemed to be challenging him to move the boy could only stare back some spirit in him seemed to bid him remember that this was true whatever soon might disprove it that the past was the present and the present the past that nothing ever died that nothing must frighten him because it survived and that he must take his share in his inheritance all that he really thought was i wonder if he'll come nearer but he did not jeremy himself moved and suddenly the whole cathedral stirred the mist breaking steps sounding on the flags voices echoing no figure was there only shadow but here was that horrid fat man the precentor who sometimes came to their house to tea why my boy what are you doing here he asked in his big superior voice i came in said jeremy still staring at the steps of the choir just for a moment the precentor put his hand on jeremy's shoulder that's right my lad he said study our great church and all its history you cannot begin too young father well and mother well yes said jeremy looking back behind him as he turned away oh but his face had been fine so strong like a rock his sword had shone and his gauntlets how tall he had been and how mighty his chest that's right that's right remember me to them when you get home you must come up and play with my little girls one of these afternoons i'm going back to school jeremy said day after tomorrow well well that's a pity that's a pity another day perhaps good day to you good day chanting he went along and jeremy stood outside the cathedral staring about him lights were blowing in the wind the dusk was blue and gray the air was thick with armored men marching in a vast procession across the sky the wind blew they flashed downwards in a cloud wheeling up into the sky again as though under command the air cleared the huge front of the cathedral was behind him and before him under the precinct's lamp was miss jones and helen why jeremy where have you been we've been looking for you everywhere we're just going home come on jeremy growled it's late end of chapter four chapter five of jeremy and hamlet by hugh walpole this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five poodle one i hate to confess it but truth forces me hamlet was a snob with other dogs not with humans with humans you never could tell he would cling to the one and cleave from the other without any apparent just reason he loved the lamplighter of orange street although he was a dirty disheveled rabbit of a man he hated aunt amy who was as decent and cleanly a spinster as england could provide but with dogs he was a terrible snob this of course he had no possible right to be himself an absolute mongrel with at least five different breeds peeping now here now there out of his peculiar body nevertheless he did like a dog to be a gentleman and openly said so it may have been that there was in it more of the snobbery of the artist than of the social striver what he wanted was to spend his time with dogs of intelligence dogs with savoir faire dogs of enterprise and ambition what he could not abide was your mealy-mouthed lickspittle creeping and crawling kind of a dog and he made his opinion very clear indeed 
since his master's return for the holidays and his own subsequent restoration to the upper part of the house i am sorry to say that his conceit already sufficiently large was considerably swollen his master was the most magnificent stupendous successful all-knowing human to be found anywhere and he was the favourite best loved most warmly cherished object of that master's affections it followed then that he was a dog beyond all other dogs when he had been a kitchen dog he had affected a superiority that the other kitchen dogs of the neighbourhood had found quite intolerable he would talk to none of them but would strut up and down inside the garden railings looking with his melancholy contemptuous eyes at those who invited him without suffering himself to be lured neither by lust of food nor invitation to battle nor tender suggestions of love when he became an upstairs dog again the other upstairs dogs did not of course allow him to forget his recent status but hamlet was not like other dogs he had a humour and sarcasm a gift of phrase an enchanting cynicism which very few dogs were able to resist he was out of doors now so frequently with jeremy that he met dogs from quite distant parts of the town and a little while before christmas made friends with a fine aristocratic fox terrier who lived in one of the villas beyond the high school this fox terrier found hamlet exactly the companion he desired having himself a very pretty wit but being lazy withal and liking others to make his jokes for him his name was pompey which as he confided to hamlet was a silly name but then his mistress was a silly woman her only merit being that she adored him to madness he had as fine a contempt for most of the other dogs of the world as hamlet himself it passed his comprehension that humans should wish to feed and pet such animals as he found on every side of him he saw of course at once that hamlet was a mongrel but he had i fancy an idea that he should play sancho panza to his own quixote he often told himself that it was absurdly beneath his dignity to go about with such a fellow but for pretty play of wit agility in snatching another dog's bone and remaining dignified as he did so for a handsome melancholy and gentle contempt he had never known hamlet's equal hamlet counted it as one of his most successful days when he brought pompey into the orange street circle there was not a dog there but recognized that pompey was a cut above them all a dog who had won prizes and might win prizes yet again although between you and me self-indulgence was already thickening him all the sycophants in orange street and there as elsewhere there were plenty of these creatures made up at once to pompey and approached hamlet with disgusting flatteries a pug known as flossie slobbered at hamlet's feet telling him that she had long been intending to call on him but that her mistress was so exacting that it was very difficult to find time for all what social duties hamlet regarded the revolting object glistening with grease and fat with high contempt his beard assuming its most ironical point i had a very nice bone waiting for you in the kitchen he said flossie shivered i'm alone with you anyhow would be a delight she wheezed hamlet was of course in no way deceived by these flatteries he knew his world he watched even his friend pompey with a good deal of irony he would have supposed that his friend was too well bred to care what these poor creatures should say to him nevertheless pompey was more pleased than he should have been he sat there round the corner just by the monument and received the homage with a pleasure that was most certainly not forced he was himself a little conscious of this awful bore he explained afterwards to hamlet having to listen to all they had to say but what's one to do one can't be rude you know one doesn't want to be impolite and i must say they were very kind hamlet was now restored into the best orange street society all received him back all with one very important exception 
this was a white poodle the pride and joy of a retired military colonel who lived at forty one orange street and his name was mephistopheles mephisto for short ever since hamlet's first introduction to the cole family he and this dog had been at war mephisto was not a dog of the very highest breed but his family was quite good enough and then being french he could say a good deal about his origins and nobody could contradict him he did not as a fact say very much he was too haughty to be talkative too superior to be familiar he had no friends there was a miserable dox fritz by name who claimed to be a friend but every one knew how mephisto laughed at fritz when he was not there calling him opprobrious names and commenting on his german love of food from the very first mephisto had seemed to hamlet an indecent dog the way that he was here naked and there over hairy had nothing to be said for it his naked part was quite pink then mephisto had the french weakness of parsimony never was there a meaner dog he stored bones as no dog had a right to do and had never been known to give anything to anybody then he had the other french weakness of an incapacity for friendship the domestic life might perhaps appeal to him strongly no one knew whether he were married or not but friendship meant nothing to him he was as are all the french practical unsentimental seeing life as it really is and allowing no nonsense if he had those french defects he had also the great french virtue of courage he was afraid of nothing and of no one no dog was too big for him and he once had a fight with a saint bernard who happened to stroll down his way that was historic he was no coward as hamlet very well knew but how hamlet hated him all his fur bristled if mephisto was within half a mile mephisto's superior smile his contempt at the rather sentimental enthusiasms to which hamlet occasionally gave vent that went as they often do with his cynicism these made a conflict inevitable two the actual cause of the conflict was pompey we all know how very trying it is to make a fine friend to introduce him into our own circle and then to discover him when he is nicely settled making more of others than of ourselves neglecting us in fact this was exactly what pompey did he grew a little weary of hamlet's humour he became very quickly tired of experiences and he was not at all sure that hamlet was not laughing at himself he was flattered by mephisto's attitude that at last he had found a dog in the town worthy to be his companion he did not care very much for mephisto he found his french conceit very trying but it was true that hamlet was a mongrel of the mongrels and that it was absurd that he a dog who had taken prizes should be with him so continually in public obviously it was impossible that he should be friends both with mephisto and hamlet so quite simply he chose mephisto hamlet was most deeply hurt he was hurt not only for himself he had a sensitive and affectionate nature but also that so well-bred a dog as pompey should take up with a french animal who had all the faults of his race and very little of its intelligence he had one short sharp altercation with pompey told him one or two home truths and left him for a week or two he avoided the company of his kind and devoted himself to his master all this occurred at christmas time when jeremy was in disgrace for the buying of christmas presents with money not really his own jeremy thought of course that hamlet had noticed his misfortunes and was trying in his own way to express his sympathy for them master and dog were very close together during those weeks when hamlet sat at his master's feet pressing his thick body close up against his master's leg staring in front of him half asleep half awake seeing bones and cats and rabbits and near these mephisto with his naked patches and the treacherous pompey jeremy thought that he was considering only his master's unhappiness 
he was thinking little of that but for the most part he was meditating revenge he must fight mephisto for a long time now it had been coming to that he was compelled to confess that at the first positive thought of the definite fact he shivered with apprehension after all no one is truly brave who has not known fear and hamlet sitting staring into the schoolroom fire knew fear in no half measure then the thoughts of the insults he had received stirred him let him only be angry enough and he would forget his fear and the very thought of mephisto made him angry he had one staunch unfaltering little friend among the dogs of the neighbourhood this was an unimportant nondescript little fox terrier the property of the hairdresser at the bottom of orange street his name was bobby there was nothing at all to distinguish bobby from all the dogs in the world he was one of those ill-bred colourless fox terriers who were known to their masters only by sterling character he had suffered every sort of indignity in his time stones had been thrown at him kettles had been tied to his tail cats had scratched his eyes his master who often drank too much kicked and abused him but he had an indomitable spirit an essential gaiety of heart that no troubles could quench he was not admitted into the hierarchy of orange street dogs even flossie did not permit herself to be aware of his existence but he hung about always in a good humour always ready to do any one a good turn and often just rolling over and over in the road at the sheer joy of life at the first glimpse of hamlet he had lost his heart to him hamlet had not been so kind to him as he should have been but he had not rebuffed him as the other dogs had done and had gone with him once all the way down to the hairdresser's to see the hairdresser's baby of whose strength and appearance bobby was inordinately proud now in these days of hamlet's trouble bobby showed the true mettle of his pasture he longed that pompey might speak to him so that he might show him what he thought of him you mustn't let this worry you too much he said to hamlet i've been through far worse things than this it simply shows that pompey in spite of his high breeding is worth nothing at all i'm going to fight mephisto said hamlet bobby's eyes opened wide at that and he looked up from the old and very dirty bone that he was investigating fight mephisto he repeated that's a tall order never mind said hamlet firmly it's got to be done and you've got to help me three when fate intends something to occur she very quickly provides the opportunity the opportunity in this instance was bobby his was a most sociable soul we all know dogs whose whole interest in life is social they are not as a rule very popular with their masters it being said of them that they care for one as much as another and will leap with friendly gestures upon the hostile burglar as eagerly as they will upon the most important person in the household bobby was not that kind of dog he really did care for his hairdresser and his hairdresser's wife and baby and for hamlet more than any other humans or any other dog in the world but he was miserable when he was alone he must have company his only family was a very busy and preoccupied one and he did not wish to bore hamlet with too much of his own society the orange street dogs had their most accustomed meeting place at a piece of deserted garden just behind the monument at the top of the hill here it was shady in hot weather and comfortable and cosy in chill they were secure from rude boys and tiresome officials and there was no large house near enough to them for servants to come out and chase them away it was it was true on the whole the second-class dogs who gathered there mephisto but seldom put in an appearance and therefore those sycophants flossie and fritz hinted that it was a commonplace crowd and beneath them moreover it was never very easy for mephisto to escape far from his own home as his master the colonel was so proud of him and so nervous of losing him that he could not bear to let him out of his sight 
it happened however one fine morning a few days after christmas that the colonel was in bed with a catar he was a very hypochondriacal gentleman and mephisto meeting pompey in the street they wandered amicably together in the direction of the monument mephisto was very ready to show himself in public having been to the barber's only the day before he was inordinately proud of the second tuft at the end of his tail at the gleaming white circle of hair round his neck and the more the pink skin showed through in his naked parts the happier he was he really thought there was not such another dog in the world as himself this fine morning being a provincial and narrow-minded dog in spite of his french origin mephisto and pompey trotted up orange street together and flossie who was always on the lookout from behind her garden railing for the passing of mephisto was graciously allowed to join them she wheezed along with them puffing herself up and swelling with self-importance the conversation chanced to turn upon hamlet mephisto said that now that he and pompey were friends he would really like to ask him a question that had been often in his mind and that was how it came about that pompey could ever have allowed himself such a common vulgar friend as hamlet pompey replied that he felt that that was a just and fair question for his friend to ask him and he would only reply that the fellow had seemed at first to have a coarse sort of humour that was diverting for the moment one tired naturally of the thing very quickly and the trouble was that these coarse-grained creatures that when you tired of them having given them a little encouragement at first out of sheer kindness it was exceedingly difficult to shake them off again the fellow had seemed lonely and pompey had taken pity upon him he would see to it that it should be a long time before he did such a thing again mephisto said that he was glad to hear this for himself he had never been able to abide the creature and he could only trust that he would soon be ridden over by a cart or poisoned by a burglar or thrown into the river by a couple of boys when they arrived at the monument they found several dogs among the trees flattering and amusing an elegant creature called trixy who was young and handsome and liked flirtations bobby also was there rolling about on the grass performing some of his simple tricks like snapping at three imaginary flies at once tossing into the air a phantom bone and lying stiff on his back with his four legs stiffly in the air he had been happy until the two aristocrats arrived now he knew that his good time was over he should have gone away but something kept him he did so hate to be alone and so he sat on a silly grin on his rather foolish face listening to the conversation while several of the dogs continued to wander about after the idiotic trixy who was as arch and self-conscious as a dog could very well be the conversation of the rest belaboured poor hamlet it is well for us that we do not hear the criticism that goes on behind our backs one and all of us we are in the same box did we hear we should watch the gradual creation of so strange and unruly a figure that we should rub our eyes in amazement crying surely surely this cannot be us not the tiniest shred of character was soon left to hamlet he was a thief a drunkard a wanton an upstart a coward and a mongrel bobby listened to all this growing with every word of it more uncomfortable he hated them all but it would need immense pluck to speak up for his friend and he did not know whether by so venturing he might not effect more harm than good the sight however of mephisto's contemptuous supercilious face his tufted tail his shining patches drove him on he burst out barking that hamlet was the bravest the finest of all the dogs in the town that he was honourable to a fault loyal and true that he was worth all the dogs there together when he had finished there was an explosion of derisive barks as he heard them internally he trembled for a large fortune of bones he would have wished to sink his pride and run he stood his ground however with one directing bark from mephisto they set upon him 
they rolled him over their teeth were in his ears his eyes his belly he gave himself up for lost at that very instant hamlet appeared upon the scene four he had not intended to go that way but finding that his master was occupied with those two supremely unattractive and uninteresting humans his sisters he thought that he would pursue an interesting smell that he had noticed in the direction of the high school during the last two days far behind him were his childish times when he had supposed that rabbit lurked around every corner and he had succeeded now in analyzing almost every smell in his consciousness as we are raised to the heights of our poor imagination by great poetry great music and great pictures so is the dog aroused to his divine ecstasy by smell with him a dead mouse behind the wainscot may take the place that shelley's skylark assumes with us and box fugues are to us what grilled haddock was to hamlet tot omenes tot he had not however gone far towards the high school when he recognized bobby's bark and bobby's bark appealing for help when he turned the corner he saw that his fate was upon him mephisto was a little apart watching the barking and struggling heap of dogs himself uttering no sound but every once and again pretending to search for a fly in the tuft of his tail that he might show to all the world that he was above and beyond vulgar street rows and at sight of him hamlet knew that what he had hoped would be was the sight of mephisto's contempt combined with the urgency of poor bobby's appeals roused all the latent devil in him twitching his beard feeling no fear showing nothing but a hatred and loathing for his enemy he walked across the grass and approached mephisto the poodle paused for a moment from his search for the fly looked around saw whom it was he had of course known from the first and resumed his search hamlet went up to him sniffed him deliberately and with scorn then bit his tail in its tenderest and most naked part the other dogs even in the most dramatic moment of their own scuffle were at once aware that something terrible had occurred they allowed bobby to rise and turned towards the new scene mephisto was indeed a fearful sight every hair on his head seemed to be erect the naked patches burned with a curious light his legs were stiff as though made of iron and from his throat proceeded the strangest most threatening growl ever uttered by dog and now hamlet pray to the gods of your forefathers if indeed you know who any of them were gather to your aid every principle of courage and fortitude you have ever collected and better than they summon to yourself all the tricks and delicacies of warfare that during your short life you have gained by your experience for indeed to-day you will need them all think not of the meal that only an hour ago you have in the event most unwisely eaten pray that your enemy also may have been consuming food remember that you are fighting for the weak and the undertrodden for the defenceless and humble-hearted and better still than that you are fighting for yourself because you have been insulted and the honour of your very nondescript family called in question the other dogs recognised at once that this was no ordinary contest and it was difficult for them to control their excitement this they showed with little snappy barks and quiverings of the body but they realized that too much noise would summon humans on to the scene and stop the fight of them all bobby was the most deeply concerned bleeding though he was in one ear he jumped from foot to foot snivelling with terror and desire yapping hysterically to encourage his friend and hero watching every movement with an interest so active that he almost died of unnatural repression to hamlet after the first moment of contact impressions were confused it was unfortunately the most important fight of his life and he had not alas very much experience to guide him 
but somewhere in his mixed and misty past there had been a bulldog ancestor and his main feeling from the beginning to the end was that he must catch on with his teeth somewhere and then hold and never let go again this principle at first he found difficult to follow tufts of white hair disgustingly choked him his teeth slipped on the bare places and it seemed strangely difficult to stand on his own feet the poodle pursued a policy of snap retreat and come again he was always on the stir catching hamlet's ear wrenching it then slipping away and suddenly seizing a hind leg he was a master of this art and it seemed to him that his victory was going to be very easy first he had one of his enemy's ears then the other now a foot now the hair of his head now one of his eyes his danger was as he knew that he was not in good condition being overfed by his master the colonel and loving a soft and lazy life he recognized that he had been in a far better state two years before when he had fought the saint bernard but poor hamlet's case was soon very bad indeed he was out of breath and panting the world was swinging around him the grass seemed to meet the sky and the audience of dogs to float in mid-air all his attacks missed he could no longer see blood was flowing from one eye and one ear he suddenly realized that the poodle meant to kill and it did not seem at all impossible but that he should achieve that the love of life was strong upon him. Behind his fighting there was his dear master and his love for him, the world with its hunts and smells and soft slumbers and delicious food, the place where he slept, the rooms of the house where he lived, the lights and the darks, the mists and the flashing stars. All these things ranged through his subconscious mind, only consciously forming behind his determination not to die, and in any case to hold on to the last if only yes if only he could find something on which he might hold the poodle's teeth were terribly sharp and hamlet seemed to be bitten in a thousand places worst of all something had happened to one of his hind legs so that it trembled under him and he was afraid lest soon he should not be able to stand once down he knew that it would be all over with him his throat was dry his head a burning fire his heart a recording hammer and the world was now in very truth reeling round and round like a flying star he knew that mephisto was now certain of victory he could feel the hot breath of that hated triumph upon his face worst of all there was creeping upon him a terrible lassitude so that he felt as though nothing mattered if only he might lay him down and sleep 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 his teeth snapped feebly his body was one vast pain now he was falling his legs were trembling he was done finished beaten at that last moment he heard as though from an infinite distance bobby's encouraging bark go on go on the bark cried you're not finished yet he's done too one more effort and you'll bring it off he made one more effort something colossal worthy of all the heroes bracing the whole of his body together beating down his weakness urging all the flame and fire of his spirit he launched out with his body snapped with his teeth and at last at last they fastened upon something upon something wiry and skinny but also soft and yielding if this time his teeth had slipped it would indeed have been the end but they held they held they held they held and it was the poodle's tail that they were holding he felt mephisto's body swing around so weak was he that he swung around with it his teeth clenched clenched and clenched mephisto screamed a curious undoglike almost human scream hamlet's teeth clenched and clenched and clenched tighter and tighter they held they met something was bitten through mephisto's whole body seemed to collapse his fund of resistance was gone something white was on the ground 
the end of the tail with its famous magnificent glorious superb white tuft was no longer attached to mephisto's body the poodle gave one cry a dreadful unearthly ghostly cry of terror shame and abandonment then his tail between his legs ran for his very life five ten minutes later jeremy looking out of the schoolroom window beheld tottering up the garden a battered dishevelled dog a little trail of blood followed his wavering course hamlet looked up at the window saw his master feebly wagged his tail and collapsed but as he collapsed he grinned End of chapter 5chapter six of jeremy and hamlet by hugh walpole this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the night raiders one it will be always difficult to understand what drove jeremy into this adventure that on the very last night but one of his christmas holidays when he had every good reason for placating the powers and when he did of his own nature desire that he should leave everything behind him in the odour of sanctity that at such a time he should take so wild and unnecessary a risk will always and for ever be a deep mystery the end of these holidays he especially desired to clothe in tranquillity because of the painful manner in which they had begun he really did wish to live at peace with his fellow-men and especially with his mother and father his mother was easy but his father how were they ever to see the same way about anything and yet he detected in himself a strange pathetic desire to be liked by his father and himself to like in return had he only known it his father felt precisely the same towards himself but the gulf of two generations was between them indeed on that very morning mr cole had had a conversation with his brother-in-law samuel about his son jeremy mr cole was never at ease with his brother-in-law he distrusted artists in general his idea was that they were wasting the time that god had given them and he distrusted his brother-in-law in particular because he thought that he often laughed at him which indeed he often did i'm unhappy about jeremy he said looking at samuel's blue smock with dissatisfaction he did wish that samuel wouldn't wear his painting clothes at breakfast time why asked samuel i don't think the boy's improving school seems to be doing him no good take him away then said samuel really said mr cole i wish you wouldn't joke about these things he must go to school send him to another school if this one isn't satisfactory no thompson's is a good school i'm afraid it's in the boy not the school that the fault lies samuel trefusis said nothing well don't you see what i mean about the boy mr cole asked irritably no i don't i think the boy perfectly delightful i don't as a rule like boys in fact i detest them i've come slowly to jeremy but now i'm quite conquered by him he's a baby in many ways still of course but he has extraordinary perceptions is brave honest amusing and delightful to look at honest said mr cole gloomily that's just what i'm not sure about that affair of the money at the beginning of the holidays really herbert samuel broke in indignantly if you'll allow me to say so and even if you won't you were wrong in that affair from first to last you never gave the boy a chance you concluded he was guilty from the first moment the boy thought he had a right to the money you bullied and scolded him until he was terrified and then wanted him to apologize twenty years from now parents will have learnt something about their children the children are going to teach them your one idea of bringing up jeremy is to forbid him to do everything that his natural instincts urge him to do he is a perfectly healthy affectionate decent boy he'll do you credit but it won't be your merit if he does it will be in spite of what you've done not because of it mr cole was deeply shocked really samuel this is going too far 
as you've challenged me i may say that i've noticed and amy also has noticed that you're doing the boy no good by petting him as you are it's largely because you are always inviting the boy into that studio of yours and encouraging him in the strangest ideas that he has grown as independent as he has i don't think you're a wholesome influence for the boy i don't indeed samuel's face closed like a box he was very angry he would have liked as he would have liked on many other occasions to say very well then i leave your house in the next five minutes but he was lazy had very little money and adored the town so he simply shrugged his shoulders you can forbid him to speak to me if you like he said mr cole was afraid of his brother-in-law so all he said was i shall write to thompson about him Two. meanwhile this awful adventure had suddenly leaped up in front of jeremy like a jack-in-the-box like many of the most daring adventures its origin was simple four days earlier there had been a children's afternoon party at the dean's the dean's children's parties were always dreary affairs because of mrs dean's neuralgia and because the dean thought that his share of the affair was over when he had poked his head into the room where they were having tea patted one or two innocents on the head they became instantly white with self-consciousness and then said in a loud generous voice well my friends enjoying yourselves that's right after which he returned to his study the result of this was that his guests were as sheep without a shepherd the dean's children were too young to do much and the girl's governess too deeply agitated by her fancy that children's parents were staring at her arrogantly to pull herself together and be amiable it was during one of those catch-as-catch-can intervals when children were desultorily wandering boys sticking pins into stout feminine calves girls sniggering in secret conclave together infants howling to be taken home that jeremy overheard bill bartlett say to the dean's earnest i dare you jeremy pricked up his ears at once anything in which the dean's earnest his foe of foes was concerned incited him to rivalry he was terribly bored by the party not only was it a bad dull party but ever since his first real evening ball children's afternoon parties had seemed to him stupid and without reason i don't care said the dean's earnest i dare you repeated bill bartlett i'm not frightened said ernest then do it said bill you've got to come too pooh said bill that's nothing i've done lots more than that ernest quite plainly disliked the prospect of his daring and catching sight of jeremy he shifted his ground young cole wouldn't dare he said yes he would said bartlett he dares more than you dare no he doesn't said the dean's ernest indignantly yes he does you dare more than samson dares don't you cole said bill of course i do said jeremy without a moment's hesitation well do it then said the dean's earnest swiftly it appeared on further examination that bartlett had dared young sampson to walk round the cathedral twice just as the clocks were striking midnight it was obvious at once that this involved quite terrifying dangers apart altogether from the ghostly prospect of walking round the cathedral at midnight there was the escape from the house the danger of the police and the return to the house jeremy saw at once all that was involved but because the dean's earnest was there and staring at him from under his pale eyebrows with arrogant contempt he said at once i dare tommy winchester who was complaining bitterly about the food provided was soon drawn into the challenge and although his stout cheeks quivered at the prospect major winchester his father was the sternest of disciplinarians he had to say i dare details were then settled it was to be three nights from that day they were to meet just outside the west door as the clock struck twelve to walk or run twice around the cathedral and then find their way home again i bet young cole doesn't come jeremy heard ernest say loudly to bill as they parted 
of course after that he would go but when he reached home and considered it he was miserable to end the holidays with such a risk truly appalled him from every point of view it was madness even though he escaped through the pantry window he knew that he could push up the catch and then drop into the garden without difficulty there was all the danger of his absence being discovered while he was away then there was the peril of a policeman finding them and reporting them then there was the return with the climb back into the pantry and the noisy crawl you never knew when a board was going to creak back into his room again he had no illusion at all as to what would happen if his father caught him that would simply sign and seal his disgrace once and forever but worse far worse to him was what uncle samuel would feel uncle samuel had simply been wonderful to him during these holidays he adored uncle samuel uncle samuel had as it were banked on his honour and integrity when all the rest of the world doubted it uncle samuel loved him and believed in him he had a momentary passionate impulse to go to uncle samuel and tell him everything but he knew what the consequence of that must be uncle samuel would persuade him not to go would indeed make him give his word that he would not go then forever would he be disgraced in the eyes of bill bartlett tommy winchester and the others and the dean's earnest would certainly never allow him to hear the last of it it was possible that the others would fail at the final moment and would not be there but he must be there yes he must he must even though death and torture awaited him as the consequence of his going had he not trusted bartlett he might have thought the whole thing a plot on the part of the dean's earnest to put him into a dangerous position but bartlett was a friend of his and the challenge was genuine as the dreadful hour approached he became more and more miserable every one noticed his depression and thought it was because he was going back to school aunt amy was quite touched never mind jeremy dear she said it will soon be over the weeks will pass and then you will be home with us again it won't seem so bad when you're there he said no aunt amy quite mildly one of the worst things was deceiving his mother she had not played so great a part in his life since his going to school but she was always there quiet and sensible and kind helping him about his clothes soothing him when he was angry understanding him when he was sad laughing with him when he was happy comfortable and consoling always like uncle samuel believing in him he remembered still with the utmost vividness the terror that he had been in two years ago when she had nearly died just after barbara's arrival because she was so safely there he did not think much about her but when a crisis came when things were difficult at school she was always the first person who came to his mind the evening arrived and as he went up to bed his teeth positively chattered it seemed a fine night but very dark he thought as he looked out through the landing window hamlet gaily followed him upstairs he was only now recovering from the terrific fight that he had had a week or so ago with the poodle and one of his ears was still badly torn and he limped a little on one foot nevertheless he was in high spirits and gambled all the way up the stairs suddenly stopping to bark under the landing window as he always did when he was in high spirits chasing an imaginary piece of paper all the way up the last flight of stairs and pausing outside jeremy's bedroom door panting and heaving his tongue hanging out and a wicked look of pleasure in his sparkling eyes here indeed was a new problem hamlet what would happen if he suddenly awoke discovered his master's absence and began to bark or suppose that he awoke when jeremy was leaving his room and determined to follow him jeremy at these thoughts felt his spirits sink even lower than they had been before how could he in this thing escape disaster he was like a man doomed he hated the dean's earnest at that moment with a passion that had very little of the child in it he took off his coat and trousers and climbed into bed 
hamlet jumped up moved round and round for some moments scratching and sniffing as he always did until he found a place to his mind then with a little contented sigh curled up and went to sleep jeremy lay there with beating heart he heard half past nine strike from st john's then ten then half past for a little while he slept then awoke with a start to hear it strike eleven no sound in the house save hamlet's regular snores a new figure leapt in front of him the policeman a terrible giant of a man with a great stick and a huge lantern what are you doing here little boy he cried to come with me to the police station jeremy shivered beneath the bedclothes perspiration beaded his forehead and his legs gave curious little jerks from the knees downwards as though they had a life of their own with which he had nothing to do half past eleven struck very carefully he got out of bed watching hamlet out of the corner of his eye put on his coat his trousers and his boots stole to the door and paused hamlet was still snoring peacefully he crept out then remembered that to do this properly one must take off one's boots and carry them in one's hand too late now for that downstairs he went at every creak he paused the house was like a closed box around him from some room far away came loud impatient snores once he stumbled and nearly fell he stayed there his hands on the banisters a dead man save for the beating of his heart his hand was on the pantry window he had pushed back the catch climbed through and in another moment was in the garden three it was a very dark night the garden gate creaked behind him as though accusing him of his wicked act the darkness was so thick that you had to push against it as though it were a wall at first he ran then the whole world seemed to run after him trees houses and all so he stopped and walked slowly the world seemed gigantic he was not as yet conscious of fear but only suspicious of the presence of that gigantic policeman taking step with him inch by inch flicking his dark lantern now here now there rising like a jack-in-the-box suddenly above the trees and peering down upon him then when for the moment he left the houses behind him and began to walk up green lane towards the cathedral his heart failed him how horrible the trees were all shapes and sizes towers of castles masts of ships animals pigs and hens and lions blowing a little in the night breezes becking and bowing above him holding out horrible long skinny fingers towards him sometimes closing in upon him then moving fan-wise out again in fact he was now completely miserable with the dreadful finality of childhood he saw himself as condemned for life by this time hamlet having discovered his absence had barked the house awake already perhaps with lanterns they had started to search for him the awful moment of discovery would come even uncle samuel would abandon him nobody would ever be kind to him again at this point it was all he could do to keep back the tears his teeth were chattering he had a crick in his back he was very cold the heel of one shoe rubbed his foot and he was frightened bet your life but he was frightened he hadn't known that it would be like this so silent and yet so full of sound so dark and yet so light and alive with strange quivering lights so cold and yet so warm with an odd pressing heat there were no lamps lit in the town below him all lights out at ten o'clock in the polchester of thirty years ago and the cathedral loomed up before him a heavy black mass threatening to fall upon him like the mountain in the bible now the trees were coming to an end here was a house and there another a light in one window but for the rest the houses quite dead like coffins 
he came into bodger street past the funny old-fashioned turnstile that led into cannon's yard over the cobblestones of that ancient square through the turnstile at the other end and into the precincts he was there shivering and frightened but there he had kept his word as he crossed the grass a figure moved forward from the shadow of the cathedral and came to meet him it was tommy winchester it immensely cheered jeremy to see him it also cheered him to see that if he was frightened tommy was a great deal more so tommy's teeth were chattering so that he could scarcely speak but he managed to say that it was beastly cold and that he had upset a jug of water getting out of his bedroom and that a dog had barked at him all the way along the precincts and that he was sure his father would beat him they were joined a moment later by another shivering mortal bartlett a more unhappy trio never met together in the world's history they were too miserable for conversation but simply stood huddled together under the great buttress by the west door and waited for the clock to strike the only thing that bartlett said was i bet samson doesn't come at that jeremy's heart gave a triumphant leap how splendid it would be if the dean's earnest funked it of course he would funk it and would have some long story about his door being closed or having a headache some lie or other nevertheless they strained their eyes across the dark wavering lake of the precincts watching for him i'm so cold tommy said through his chattering teeth then suddenly as though struck by a gun i'm going to sneeze and he did sneeze an awful shattering devastating sound with which the cathedral and indeed the whole town seemed to shake that was an awful moment the boys stood holding their breath waiting for all the black houses to open their doors and all the townsmen to turn out in their night shirts with lanterns just as they do in the meistersinger although that of course the boys did not know crying who's that who sneezed where did the sneeze come from what was that sneeze nothing happened save that the silence was more awful than before then there was a kind of whirring noise above their heads a moment's pause and the great cathedral clock began to strike midnight now said bartlett we've got to walk or run around the cathedral twice he was off and tommy and jeremy after him jeremy was a good runner but this was like no race that he had ever engaged in before as he ran the notes boomed out above his head and the high shadow of the great building seemed to catch his feet and hold him he could not see and as before when he ran the rest of the world seemed to run with him so that he was always pausing to hear whether any one were moving with him or no then quite suddenly he was alone and frightened as he had never in his life been before no not when the horrible sea captain had woken him in the middle of the night not when he thought that god had killed hamlet not when he had first been tossed in a blanket at thompson's not when he had first played second half in a real game and had to lie down and let ten boys kick the ball from under him his body was turned to water he could not move the shadows were so vast around him the ground wavered beneath his feet the trees on the slopes below the cathedral all nodded as though they knew that terrible things would soon happen to him and there was no sound anywhere what he wanted was to creep close to the cathedral clutch the stone walls and stay there that was what he nearly did and if he had done it he would have been there i believe until this very day then he remembered the dean's earnest who had been too frightened to come he remembered that he had been dared to run around the cathedral twice and that he had only as yet run half round it once his stockings were down over his ankles both his boots now hurt him he had lost his cap he summoned all the pluck that there was in his soul and body combined and ran on when he had finished his first round and was back by the west door again there was no sign of the other two boys he paused desperately for breath 
then as though pursued by all the evil spirits of the night started again this time it did not seem so long he shut his ears to all possible sound refused to think and the physical pain of the stitch in his side and his two rubbed heels kept him from grosser fear then just as he completed the second round the most awful thing happened a figure an enormous figure it seemed to poor jeremy rose out of the ground a figure with flapping wings a great light was flashed in the air a strange high voice screamed aloud the figure moved towards him that was enough for his courage as though death itself were behind him he took to his heels tore across the grass plunged through the stile into parson's yard the little shadow had been like a curve of wind on the grass high in the air rose the cry a windy night and all clear a windy night and all clear and the night watchman his thoughts upon the toasted cheese that would in another half hour be his reward pressed round the corner of the cathedral four and jeremy ran on how he ran he stumbled nearly fell recovered himself felt no pain in his legs or side only fear 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 as he ran he was saying i must get back oh i must get back i must be home i must get back and did not know that he was saying anything at all then suddenly in the middle of grass lane he recovered himself and stood how still and quiet everything was a few stars were breaking through the clouds the rustling of the trees now was friendly and reassuring and there was a soft undertone in the air as though a thousand streams were running beneath his feet he stood panting loving to feel the stroke of the little wind against his hot cheek what was that that had frightened him whom could it have been but gradually the centre of interest was shifting the past was the past he had done what he had said he would do now for the future he shivered as it came to him in its full force then squared his shoulders and marched on he would meet whatever it might be and anyway he was going to school the day after tomorrow. time moved quickly then he was soon passing the high school the world completely dead now on every side of him then there was his old friend the monument then the row of houses in which his own home stood he closed the garden gate very carefully behind him stole up the path found the ledge stone below the pantry window then felt for the ledge his heart ceased to beat the catch was fastened someone then had discovered his absence the house seemed to be dark and silent enough but they were lying in wait for him inside well he was going on with it now all that he wanted was the quiet and comfort of his room and to be warm and cosy again in bed he was suddenly quite horribly tired he pushed with his fingers between the ledges and found then that the catch was not securely fastened after all the upper part of the window suddenly jerked upwards moving awkwardly and with a creaking noise that he had not known before he pulled himself on to the window ledge then very carefully let himself down on the other side the first thing that he knew was that his feet touched a chair and there had been no chair there before then that his fingers were rubbing against the corner of a table he was not in their own pantry he was not in their own house he had climbed in through the wrong window and even as he realized this and moved in an agony of alarm back to climb out of the window again his arm brushed the table again he pushed something and with the noise of the niagara falls a thousand times emphasized echoing in his ears the china of all the pantries of heaven fell clattering to the ground five after that things happened quickly a light instantly cleaved the darkness and he saw an open door a candle held aloft and the strangest figure holding it at the same time a deep voice said stand just where you are move another step and i fire don't fire please said jeremy it's only me 
the figure confronting him was a woman's it was in fact quite easily to be recognized as that of miss lisbeth mackenzie who had lived next door to the coles for years and years and years ever since in fact jeremy could remember and waged like betsy trotwood incessant warfare on boys butchers and others who walked across her lawn whose only merit had been that she hated aunt amy and told her so she was an eccentric old woman eccentric in manners in habits and appearance but surely never in her life had she looked so eccentric as she did now with her white hair piled untidily on her head her old face of a crow pallid behind her hooked and piercing nose over her nightdress she had hurriedly gathered her bed quilt a coat like joseph's of many and varied colours and on her feet were white woollen stockings in the hand that did not hold the candle she flourished a pistol that even to jeremy's unaccustomed and childish eyes was undoubtedly a very old and dusty one they must have been a queer couple to behold had there been any third person there to behold them the small boy dishevelled hatless his collar burst his stockings down over his ankles and the old woman in her patchwork quilt miss mackenzie having expected to behold a hirsute and ferocious burglar was considerably surprised she held the candle closer and then exclaimed why you're a little coal from next door yes said jeremy i thought this was our pantry and it was yours wait a minute i'm going to sneeze this he did and then hurried on breathlessly please let me go now and i'll come in to-morrow and explain everything and pay for the cups and saucers but i don't want them to know that i've been out here pick the bits up at once she said or somebody will be cutting themselves it's just like that maid having it out on the table that settles it she shall leave to-morrow she put down the candle and pistol on the table and then watched him while he picked up the pieces they were not very many and now please may i go said jeremy again i didn't mean to come into your house i didn't really i'll explain everything to-morrow no you won't said miss mackenzie grimly you'll explain here and now that's a pretty thing to come breaking into somebody's house after midnight and then thinking you can go out just as easily as you came in you can sit down she said as a kind of afterthought pointing to a chair it isn't anything really said jeremy very quickly i mean that it isn't anything you need mind they dared me to run around the cathedral twice when the clock struck twelve and i did it and ran home and climbed into your house by mistake who's they asked miss mackenzie gathering her quilt more closely about her uh bill bartlett and ernest sampson he said as though that must tell her everything the dean's son you know and i don't like him so when he dares me to anything i must do it you see i don't see at all said miss mackenzie it was a very wicked and silly thing to do there are plenty of people i don't like but i don't run around the cathedral just to please them oh i didn't run around just to please him jeremy said indignantly i don't want to please him of course but he said that i wouldn't do it and he would whereas as a matter of fact i did and he didn't as a matter of fact picked up from the drawing-room was just then a very favourite phrase of his well you'll get it hot from your father said miss mackenzie when he knows about it oh but perhaps he won't know said jeremy eagerly the house looks all dark and perhaps hamlet didn't wake up hamlet repeated miss mackenzie uh, yes that's my dog oh that hateful dog that sometimes looks through the railings into my garden as though he would like to come in and tear up all my flowers he'd better try that's all he isn't hateful said jeremy he's a splendid dog he had a fight a little while ago and was nearly killed but he didn't care he just grinned he won't grin if i get a hold of him said miss mackenzie now what are you going to do about it when your father knows you've been out like this oh he mustn't know said jeremy you're not going to tell him are you of course i am said miss mackenzie i can't have little boys climbing into my house after midnight and then do nothing about it 
oh please please said jeremy don't do anything this time i promise never to do it again it would be dreadful if father knew it's so important that the holiday should end well they began so badly you won't tell him will you of course i will said miss mackenzie first thing in the morning i shall ask him to whip you and allow me to be present during the ceremony there's nothing that i love like seeing little boys whipped especially naughty little boys for a moment jeremy thought that she meant it then he caught sight of her twinkling eye no you won't he said confidently you're just trying to frighten me but i'm not frightened i go back to school day after tomorrow so they can't do much anyway if i let you off she said you've got to promise me something you've got to promise me that you'll come and read to me twice every day during next holidays <gasps> oh lord jeremy couldn't be quite sure whether she meant it or not how awful if she did mean it still a bargain was a bargain he looked at her carefully she seemed very old she might die before next holidays all right he said i promise i don't read very well you know all the better practice for you she answered her eye mysteriously twinkled above the bed quilt she let him go then even assisting him from behind out of the pantry window he had a look and a smile at her before he dropped on the other side she looked so queer with her crabbed face and untidy hair under the jumping candle she nodded to him grimly soon he was at his own window and through it not a sound in the house he crept up the stairs the same wild snore met him rumbling like the sleeping soul of the house everything the same to him all those terrors and alarms and they had slept as though it had been one moment of time he opened his own door hamlet's even whining breath met him not much of a watchdog never mind how tired he was how tired he flung off his clothes stood for a moment to feel the cold air on his naked body then his nightshirt was over his head the bed was lovely 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 only as he sank down a silver slope into a sea of red and purple leaves a thought went sliding with him the dean's earnest had funked it the dean's earnest had funked it let us never forget let us plunk End of chapter 6Chapter 7 of Jeremy and Hamlet by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Young Baltimore. 1. Jeremy was miserable. He was sitting on the high ground above the cricket field. The warm summer air wrapped him as though in a cloak. At his feet, the grass was bright, shrill green. Then, as it fell away, it grew darker, tumbling into purple shadow, as it curved to the flattened plateau. Behind him, the wood was like a wall of painted steel. Far away, the figures of the cricketers were white dolls moving against the bright red brick of the school buildings. One little white cloud, shaped like an elephant, like a rent torn in the blue canvas of the sky, hung motionless above his head and he watched this, waiting for it to lengthen, to fade into another shape, formless, until, at last, shredded into scraps of paper, it vanished. He watched the cloud and thought, I'd like to roll him down the hill and never see him again. He was thinking of young Baltimore, who was sitting close to him. He was doing nothing but stare and let his mouth hang slackly open, because he did nothing so often was one of the reasons why jeremy hated him so deeply baltimore was not an attractive-looking boy he was perhaps ten years of age white-faced sandy-haired furtive-eyed with two pimples on his forehead and one on his nose he looked as though quite recently he had been rolled in the mud and that was true he had been from near at hand from the outskirts of the wood shrill cries could be heard singing stocky had a little lamb its fleece was white as snow and everywhere that stocky went that lamb was sure to go 
jeremy hearing these voices made a movement as though he would rise and pursue them then apparently realized his impotence and stayed where he was beasts said baltimore and suddenly broke into a miserable crying a wretched snivelling gasping wheeze jeremy looked at him with disgust you do cry the most awful lot he said if you didn't cry so much they wouldn't laugh at you he gloomily reflected over his fate the summer term only a week old that should have been the happiest of the year was already the worst that he had known at thompson's on his arrival full of health vigor and plans old thompson had taken him aside and said now cole i've something for you to do this term i want you to be kind to a new boy who has never been away from home before and knows nothing about school life i want you to be kind to him look after him see that no one treats him harshly make him feel that he is still at home you are getting one of the bigger boys here now and you must look after the small ones jeremy was not displeased when he heard this it gave him a sense of importance that he liked moreover he had but recently read tom brown and tom whom he greatly admired had been approached in just this way about arthur and arthur although he had seemed tiresome at first had developed very well had had a romantic illness and become a first-class cricketer his first vision of baltimore had been disappointing he had found him sitting on his play-box in the passage snivelling in just that unpleasant way that he had afterwards made so peculiarly his own he told jeremy that what he wanted to do was to go home to his mother at once that his name was percy and that he had been kicked on the leg twice you mustn't tell the others that your name's percy said jeremy or you'll never hear the last of it it appeared however from certain cries heard in the distance that baltimore had already done this jeremy wondered then why he had been selected for this especial duty he was not by any means one of the older boys in the school nor one of the more important he foresaw trouble baltimore had been informed that jeremy was to look after him mr thompson says you're to look after me he said and not let the boys kick me or take things out of my play box and if they do i'm to tell mr thompson jeremy's cheeks paled with horror as he heard this declaration oh i say you must not do that he declared that would be sneaking you mustn't tell thompson things why mustn't i asked baltimore producing a large cake of chocolate from his play-box and proceeding to eat it uh, because because sneaking's worse than anything my mother said i was too said baltimore and you mustn't talk about your mother either said jeremy nor any of your people at home why mustn't i asked baltimore because they'll rag you if you do baltimore nodded his head in a determined manner i will if they kick me he said that evening was an unhappy one jeremy kept by the matron over some silly business connected with his underclothes came late into the dormitory to discover a naked baltimore being beaten with hairbrushes that was a difficult moment for him but he dealt with it in the traditional manner of school heroes he rushed into the midst of the gang rescued percy and challenged the room he was popular and known for a determined fighter so there was some laughter and jeering but baltimore was allowed to creep into his bed next morning the school understood that young stocky cole had a new protege and that it was that terrible new boy pimply percy jeremy's best friend riley minor spoke to him seriously about it i say stocky it isn't true that you've taken up with that awful new kid thompson says i've got to look after him jeremy explained but he's the worst of the lot riley complained disgustedly well i've got to anyway said jeremy shortly the sad part of it was that baltimore was by no means grateful for jeremy's championship you might have come in earlier he said i don't call that looking after me 
he now followed jeremy like a shadow a complaining snivelling whining shadow jeremy expostulated look here he said we needn't be together all the time if you're in trouble or anything you just give me a shout i'm sure to be round somewhere but baltimore shook his head that isn't what mr thompson said he remarked he said that you'd look after me but how can you look after me if you're not there he didn't mean us to be together the whole time said jeremy the thing was impossible he could keep his own small fry in order although the jeers and insults of those who had until this term been his admiring friends were very hard to bear but what was he to do for instance about cracky brown cracky was captain of the cricket thirteen years of age and going to eton next term he was one of three heroes allowed a study and he was fagged for by several of the new boys including baltimore he had already given young baltimore several for breaking a cup and saucer how could jeremy aged ten and a half and in the lower fourth go up to cracky and say look here brown you've got to leave baltimore alone and yet this was exactly what baltimore expected jeremy to do baltimore was a boy with one idea mr thompson said you were to see they didn't hit me he complained don't call him mr thompson urged jeremy nobody does here on the hillside jeremy moodily kicked the turf and watched the shredding cloud another week of this and he would be more laughed at than any other boy in the school had it been the winter term his prowess at football might have saved the situation but he had never been very good at cricket and never would be he hated it and was still in third game among all the kids and wasters it would all have been so much easier he reflected had he only found baltimore possible as a companion but he thought that he had never loathed any one so much as this snivelling pimply boy and something unregenerate in him rose triumphant in his breast when he saw baltimore kicked and this made it much more difficult for him to stop the kicking what was he to do about it appeal to thompson of course he could not he had promised to do his best and to do his best he must then the brilliant idea occurred to him that he would write to uncle samuel and ask his advice he did not like writing letters indeed he loathed it and his letters were blotched and illegible productions when they were finished but at least he could make the situation clear to uncle samuel and uncle samuel always knew the right thing to do at the thought of his uncle a great wave of homesickness swept over him he saw the town and the high street with all the familiar shops and the cathedral and his home with the dark hall and the hat rack and hamlet running down the stairs barking and mary with her spectacles and uncle samuel's studio he was even for a moment sentimental over aunt amy he shook himself and the vision faded he would not be beaten by this thing he turned to baltimore i'm not going to have you following me everywhere he said i'm only looking after you because i promised thompson you can have your choice i'll leave you alone and let everyone kick you as much as they like and then you can go and sneak to thompson that won't help you a bit they'll only kick you all the more but if you behave decently and stop crying and come to me when you want anything i'll see that none of the smaller boys touch you if cracky wants to hit you i can't help it but he hits everybody so there's nothing in that now what is it to be his voice was so stern that baltimore stopped snivelling and stared at him in surprise all right he said i won't follow you everywhere jeremy got up you stay here till i've got to the bottom of the hill i'll sit next you at tea and see they don't take your grub he nodded and started away baltimore sat there staring with baleful eyes two then a strange thing occurred let the psychologist explain it as they may jeremy suddenly began to feel sorry for baltimore there is no doubt at all that the protective maternal sense is very strong in the male as well as the female breast jeremy had known it before even with his tiresome sister mary now baltimore did what he was told and only appeared at certain intervals 
jeremy found himself then often wondering what the kid was about whether any one was chastising him and if so how the kid was taking it after the first week baltimore was left a great deal alone partly because of jeremy's championship and partly because he was himself so boring and pitiful that there was nothing to be done with him he developed very quickly into that well-known genus of small boy who is to be seen wandering about the playground all alone kicking small stones with his feet slouching his cap on the back of his head his hands deep in his trousers pocket a look of utter despair on his young face he was also the dirtiest boy that Thompson's had ever seen, and that is saying a great deal. His fingers were dyed in ink, his boots, the laces hanging from them, were caked in mud, his collar was soiled and torn, his hair matted and unbrushed. Jeremy himself, often dirty, nevertheless with an innate sense of cleanliness, tried to clean him up. But it was hopeless. Baltimore no longer sniveled. He was now numb with misery. He stared at Jeremy as a wild animal, caught by the leg in a trap, might stare. Jeremy began to be very unhappy. He no longer considered what the other boys might say, neither their jeers nor their laughter. One evening, coming up to Baltimore in the playground, he caught his arm. "'You can come and do prep with me tonight if you like,' he said. Baltimore continued to kick pebbles. "'Has anyone been going for you lately?' he asked. Baltimore shook his head. "'I wish I was dead,' he replied. This seemed melodramatic. "'Oh, you'll be all right soon,' said Jeremy. But he could get nothing out of him. Some of the boy's loneliness seemed to penetrate his own spirit. "'I say, you can be as much with me as you like, you know,' he remarked awkwardly. Baltimore nodded his head and moved away. Bitterly was Jeremy to regret that word of his. It was as though Baltimore had laid a trap for him, pretending loneliness in order to secure that invitation. He was suddenly once again with Jeremy everywhere. And now he was no longer either silent or humble. Words poured from his mouth, words inevitably, unavoidably connected with himself and his doings, his fine, brave doings how he was this at home and that at home, how his aunt had thought the one and his mother the other, how his father had given him a pony and his cousin a dog. Now round every corner his besmudged face would be appearing, his inky fingers protruding, his voice triumphantly proclaiming, I'm coming with you now, Cole, there's an hour before prep. And strangely now, in spite of himself, Jeremy liked it. He was suddenly touched by young Baltimore, and his dirt, and his helplessness. Later years were to prove that Jeremy Cole could be always caught, held, and won by something misshapen, abused, cast out by society. So now he was caught by young Baltimore. He did his sums for him. When he could, he was no great hand at sums. Protected him from Tubby Smith, the bully of the lower fourth, shepherded him in and out of meals, took him for walks on Sunday afternoons. He was losing Riley. That hurt him desperately. Nevertheless, he continued in his serious, entirely unsentimental way to look after Baltimore. And was young Baltimore grateful? We shall see. 3. One day, when the summer term was about a month old, a very dreary game of cricket was pursuing its slow course in third game. The infants concerned in it were sleepily watching the efforts of one after another of their number to bowl Corkery Minimus. Corkery was not, as cricket is considered at Lord's, a great cricketer, but he was a stolid, phlegmatic youth, too big for the third game, and too lazy to wake up and so push forward into second. He stood stolidly at his wicket, making a run or two occasionally, in order to poach the bowling. Jeremy was sitting in the pavilion, his cap tilted forward over his eyes, nearly asleep, and praying that Corkery might stay in all the afternoon, and so save him from batting. One of the younger masters, Newsome, a youth fresh from Cambridge, was presiding over the afternoon and longing for six o'clock. 
Suddenly he heard a thin and weedy voice at his ear. Please, sir, do you think I might bowl? I think I could get him out. Newsome pulled himself in from his dreams and gazed wearily down upon the grimy face of Baltimore. You? he exclaimed. Baltimore was not beloved by the masters. Yes, sir, Baltimore said, his cold green eyes fixed earnestly upon Newsome's face. Oh, I suppose so, Newsome said wearily. Anything for a change. Had anyone been watching Baltimore at that moment, they would have seen a curious thing. A new spirit inhabited the boy's body. Something seemed suddenly to stiffen him. His legs were no longer shambly, his eyes no longer dead. He was in a moment moving as though he knew his ground, and as though he had first and royal right to be there. Of course, no one noticed this. There was a general titter when it was seen that Baltimore had the ball in his hand. Corkery turned round and sniggered to the wicket-keeper, and the wicket-keeper sniggered back. Baltimore paid no attention to anybody. He ran to the wicket and delivered an underhand lob. A second later, Corkery's bales were on the ground. Again, had anyone noticed, he would have perceived that the delivery of that ball was no ordinary one, that the twist of the arm as it was delivered was definite and assured and by no means accidental. No one noticed anything except that Corkery was at length out. Although he had been batting for an hour and ten minutes, he had made only nine runs. Baltimore's next three balls took three wickets, Jeremy's amongst them. No one was very enthusiastic about this. The balls were considered sneaks, and just the kind that Pimply Percy would bowl. Corkery, in fact, was extremely indignant and swore he would take it out of Pimples in the dormitory that evening. Very odd was Baltimore over this. No sign of any feeling whatever. Jeremy expected that he would be full that evening of his prowess. Not a word. Jeremy himself was proud of his young friend. It was as though he had possessed an ugly and stupid puppy who, it was suddenly discovered, could balance spoons on the end of his nose. He told Riley about it. Riley was disgusted. You and your Percy, he said. You can jolly well choose, Stocky. It's him or me. He's all right now. The other fellows leave him alone. Why can't you drop him? Jeremy could not explain why, but he did not want to drop him. He liked having something to look after. Next week, something more occurred. Baltimore was pushed up into second game. It was, indeed, very necessary that he should be. Had he stayed in third game, that galaxy of all the cricketing talents would have been entirely demoralized. No one could withstand him. Wickets fell faster than ninepins. He gained no popularity for this. He was, indeed, beaten in the box-room with hairbrushes for bowling sneaks. He took his beating without a word. He seemed suddenly to have found his footing. He held up his head, occasionally washed his face, and stared superciliously about him. Jeremy now was far keener about young Baltimore's career than he had ever been about his own. Securing an afternoon off, he went and watched his friend's first appearance in second game. Knowing nothing about cricket, he was nevertheless clever enough to detect that there was something natural and even inevitable in Baltimore's cricket, not only in his bowling, but also in his fielding. He recognized it, perhaps, because it was the same with himself in football. Awkward and ill at ease as he was on the cricket field, he moved with perfect confidence in rugby, knowing at once where to go and what to do. So it was now with Baltimore. In that game he took eight wickets for eighteen runs. The school began now to talk about the new prodigy. There were, of course, two sides in the matter, many people declaring that they were sneaky, low-down balls that anybody could bowl if they were dishonest enough to do so. Others said that there was nothing low-down about it, and that young Baltimore would be in first game before he knew where he was. On his second day in second game, Baltimore took Smith Major's wicket first ball, and Smith Major had batted twice for the first eleven. 
after this the great cracky himself came and watched him he said nothing but next day baltimore was down for first game jeremy now was bursting with pride he tried to show baltimore how immensely pleased he was in a corner after tea he talked to him there's never been a new kid his first term in first game before i don't think said jeremy regardless of grammar they'll play you for the second eleven i suspect oh, they're sure to said baltimore calmly and then they'll play me for the first strange that jeremy who hated above all things side in his fellow human beings was not repelled by this here in baltimore was the feu sacre jeremy recognized its presence and bowed to it small boys are always fond of anything of which they are proud and so jeremy now in spite of the green eyes the arrogant aloof attitude the unpleasant personal habits had an affection for baltimore the affection of the hen whose ugly duckling turns out a swan you don't seem very pleased about it he said looking at baltimore curiously what's there to be pleased about said baltimore coldly of course i knew i could play cricket no one in this rotten place can play i can bat too only they always put me in last will you walk out to poker's after dinner tomorrow jeremy asked all right said baltimore indifferently four in the following week baltimore played for the second eleven took eight wickets for twenty runs and himself made thirty a fortnight later he was down on the boards in the first eleven for the lower templeton match now indeed the whole school was talking about him masters and boys alike his batting was another matter from his bowling there was no doubt at all that he was a natural cricketer mr rochester the game's master said he was the most promising cricketer that he had yet seen at thompson's remarkable style for so young a boy an extraordinarily fine eye the lower templeton match was the match of the season lower templeton was a private school some ten miles away and thompson's strongest rivals they had more boys than thompson's and two times out of three they won the cricket match they were entirely above themselves and jeered at thompson's implying that they showed the most wonderful condescension in coming over to play at all consequently there burned in the heart of every boy in thompson's yes and in the heart of every master and every servant a longing desire that the swollen-headed idiots should be beaten boys are exceedingly susceptible to atmosphere and in no time at all the first weeks of baltimore's stay at thompson's were entirely forgotten he was a new creature a marvel a miracle young corkery was heard at tea to offer him his last sardine although only a fortnight before he had belaboured his posterior with hairbrushes cracky brown took in him now a fatherly interest and inflicted on him only the lightest fagging and inquired anxiously many times a day about his health jeremy surrendered absolutely to this grammar but it was to more than mere glamour that he was surrendering he did not realize it but he had never in all his life before had any friend who had been a success his father and mother his sister mary his uncle samuel none of these could be said to be in the eyes of the world successes and at school it had been the same his best friend riley was quite undistinguished in every way and the master whom he liked best old podgy johnson was more than undistinguished he was derided it was not that he liked vulgar applause for his friend and himself enjoyed to bathe in its binding light it was quite simply that he loved his friend to be successful that it was fun for him amusing exciting and warmed him all over no longer need he feel any pity for baltimore baltimore was happy now he must be it must be confessed that baltimore showed no especial signs of being happy when the great day arrived at breakfast he accepted quite calmly the portions of potted meat marmalade sardines and pickles offered him by adoring admirers and ate them all on the same plate quite impassively 
After dinner, Jeremy and Riley took their places on the grass in front of the pavilion and waited for the game to begin. Riley was now very submissive, compelled to admit that, after all, Jeremy had once again showed his remarkable judgment. Who but Jeremy would have seen in Baltimore, on his arrival at Thompson's, the seeds of greatness? He was forced to confess that he himself had been blind to them. With their straw hats tilted over their eyes, lying full length on the grass, a bag of sweets between them, they were as happy as thieves. In strict truth, Jeremy's emotions were not those precisely of happiness. He was too deeply excited, too passionately anxious for Baltimore's success to be really happy. He could not hear the sweets crunching between his teeth for the beating of his heart. What followed was what any reader of school stories would expect to follow. Had Baltimore been precisely the handsome blue-eyed hero of one of Dean Farrar's epics of boyhood, he could not have behaved more appropriately. Thompson's went in first, and disaster instantly assailed them. Six wickets were down for ten, owing to a diabolical fast bowler whom Lower Templeton had brought with them. Cracky Brown was the only Thompsonian who made any kind of a stand, and he had no one to stay with him until Baltimore came in, and Cracky, content merely to keep up his wicket, made thirty-five. Thompsons were all out for fifty-six. Lower Templeton then went in, and because Cracky did not at once put in Baltimore to bowl, made thirty-four for two wickets. Baltimore then took the remaining eight wickets for seventeen. Lower Templeton were all out for fifty-one. The excitement during the second innings had to be seen to be believed. Even old Thompson, who was known for his imperturbable temper, was seen to wipe his brow continually with a yellow handkerchief. Thompson's went in, and four wickets fell for eleven. Baltimore went in at fifth wicket and made thirty-nine. Thompson's were all out for sixty-one, and were sixty-six ahead of Lower Templeton. This was a good lead, and the hearts of Thompson's beat high. Baltimore started well and took six of the Lower Templeton wickets for twenty. Then he obviously tired. Cracky took him off, and Lower Templeton had three-quarters of an hour's pure joy. As the school clock struck half-past six, Lower Templeton had made sixty runs for eight wickets. Cracky then put Baltimore on again, and he took the remaining wickets for no runs. Thompson's were victorious by six runs, and Baltimore was carried shoulder-high amongst the plaudits of the surrounding multitudes up to the school buildings. 5. Impossible to give any adequate idea of Jeremy's pride and pleasure over this event. He did not share in the procession up to the school, but waited his time. Then, just before chapel, crossing the playground in the purple dusk, he passed Baltimore and another boy. Hello, I say. He stopped. Baltimore looked back over his shoulder. Jeremy could not precisely see the expression, but fancied it contemptuous. Most curiously, then, for the rest of the evening, he was worried and unhappy. Why should he worry? Baltimore was his friend, must be, after all that Jeremy had done for him. Jeremy was too young and too unanalytical to know what it was that he wanted, but in reality he longed now for that protective sense to continue. He must still have something to look after. There were lots of things he could do for Baltimore. Next morning, after breakfast, he caught him alone, ten minutes before chapel. He was embarrassed and shy, but he plunged in. I say, it was ripping yesterday. Weren't you glad? Baltimore, looking at Jeremy curiously, shrugged his shoulders. You're coming out next Sunday, aren't you? He went on. Baltimore smiled. I'm not going to have you following me everywhere, he said in a rather feeble imitation of Jeremy's voice. If you behave all right and don't cry and tell me when anyone kicks you, I'll let you speak to me sometimes. Otherwise, you keep off. He put his tongue out at Jeremy and swaggered off. Jeremy stood there. He was hurt as he had never been before in his young life. 
he had indeed never known this kind of hurt someone came in hello stocky coming up to chapel all right he answered moving to get his books out of his locker but he'd lost something something awfully jolly he fumbled in his locker for it he wanted to cry like any kid he was crying but he wasn't going to let stokey see it he found an old fragment of licorice stick it mingles in his mouth with the salt taste of tears so dragging his head from his locker he kicked stokey in amicable friendship and they departed chapel words tumbling over one another puppy-wise as they went but no more miserable boy sat in chapel that morning six two days later turning the corner of the playground he heard shrill crying looking farther he perceived baltimore twisting the arms of a miniature boy the smallest boy in the school brown minimus he was also kicking him in tender places now will you give it me he was saying a second later baltimore was in his turn having his arm twisted and his posterior kicked as jeremy kicked and twisted he felt a strange a mysterious pleasure baltimore tried to bite then he said i'll tell thompson i don't care if you do said jeremy yes he felt a strange wild pleasure but when that afternoon old thompson genially said well cole i think baltimore's found his feet now all right hasn't he jeremy said uh, yes sir he has he felt miserable he sat down and kicked the turf furiously with his toes he had lost something he knew not what something very precious someone called him and he went off to join in a rag anyway tom brown was a rotten book End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of Jeremy and Hamlet by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight: The Ruffians. One. Jeremy sat on a high cliff overlooking the sea. He had never, since he was a tiny baby, had any fear of heights, and now his short, thick legs dangled over a fearful abyss in a way that would have caused his mother's heart to go faint with terror had she seen it the sight before him was superb not to be exceeded perhaps in the whole world for strength and even ferocity of outline combined with luxuriance and southern softness of colour here the two worlds met the worlds of the north and the south even in the early morning breeze there seemed to mingle the harsh irony of the high glebeshire uplands and the gentle caressing warmth of the sheltered coves and shell-scattered shores the sea was a vast curtain of silk pale blue beyond the cove a deep and shining green in the depths immediately below jeremy's feet that pale curtain was woven both of sea and sky and seemed to quiver under the fingers of the morning breeze it was suspended between two walls of sharp black rock jagged ferocious ruthless sharp to jeremy's right inside the black curve of stone was a little beach of the palest yellow and nestling on to it standing almost within it was a little old church with a crooked grey tower and a wandering graveyard behind the church stretched a lovely champagne of the gentlest most english countryside hills green as brightly coloured glass rising smoothly into the blue little valleys thickly patched with trees cottages from whose stumpy chimneys smoke was already rising cows and sheep and in the distance the joyful barking of a dog the only sound in all that early scene save the curling whisper of the tide jeremy had arrived with his family at carleon rectory the night before in a state of rebellious discontent he had been disgusted when he heard that this summer they were to break the habit of years and to abandon his beloved cow farm in favour of a new camping ground and a rectory too when they always lived so close to churches and had so eternally to do with them no farm any more no mrs monk mr monk and the little monks 
no animals no cows and pigs no sheep and no horses above all no tim no tim with the red face and the strong legs tim perhaps the best friend he had in the world after of course riley and hamlet he had felt it bitterly and during that journey from polchester to the sea always hitherto so wonderful a journey he had sulked and sulked refusing to notice any of the new scenery the novel excitements and fresh incidents like the driving all the way for instance from st mary moor in a big wagonette with farmers and their wives lest he should be betrayed into any sort of disloyalty to his old friends the arrival at the rectory with its old walled garden flowers all glimmering in the dusk the vast oak in the middle of the lawn was in spite of himself an interesting experience but he allowed no expression of amusement to escape from him and went to bed the moment after supper he awoke of course at a desperately early hour and was compelled then to jump out of bed and look out of the window he discovered to his excited amazement that the sea was right under his nose this was marvellous to him at cow farm you could watch only a little cup of it between a dip in the trees and that miles away here the garden seemed actually to border it and you could watch it stretch with the black cliffs to the left of it miles 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 into the sky the world was lovely at that hour blackbirds and thrushes were on the dew-drenched lawn somewhere in the house a cuckoo clock announced that it was just six o'clock before he knew what he was about he had slipped on his clothes was down the dark stairs and out into the garden as he sat dangling his feet above space and looked out to sea he argued with himself about cow farm of course cow farm would always be first but that did not mean that other places could not be nice as well he would never find any one at carleon as delightful as tim and if only tim were here everything would be perfect but tim could not of course be in two places at once and he had to do his duty by the monks as he sat there swinging his legs and looking down into that perfect green water so clear that you could see gold and purple lights shifting beneath it and black lines of rock-like licorice sticks twisting as the shadows moved he was forced to admit to himself that he was terribly happy he had never lived close cheek by jowl with the sea as he was doing now the thought of five whole weeks spent thus on the very edge of the water made him wriggle his legs so that there was a very real danger of his falling over the juxtaposition of hamlet who had of course followed him saved him from further danger he knew that he himself was safe and would never fall but hamlet was another matter and must be protected the dog was perilously near the edge balancing on his forefeet and sniffing down so the boy got up and dragged the dog back and then lay down among the sea pinks and the heather and looked up into the cloudless sky hamlet rested his head on the fatty part of his master's thigh and breathed deep content he had come into some place where there wandered a new company of smells appetizing tempting soon he would investigate them for the present it was enough to lie warm with his master and dream suddenly he was conscious of something he raised his head and jeremy feeling his withdrawal half sat up and looked about him facing them both were a group of giant boulders scattered there in the heather and looking like some druid circle of ancient stones hamlet was now on all fours his tail up his hair bristling it's all right said jeremy lazily there's nobody there but even as he looked an extraordinary phenomenon occurred there rose from behind the boulder a tangled head of hair and beneath the hair a round hostile face and two fierce interrogative eyes then as though this were not enough there arose in line with the first head a second and with the second a third and then with the third a fourth four round bullet heads four fierce hostile pairs of eyes staring at hamlet and jeremy jeremy stared back 
feeling that here was some trick played upon him as when the conjurer at thompson's had produced a pigeon out of a handkerchief the trick effect was heightened by the fact that the four heads and the sturdy bodies connected with them were graduated in height to a nicety as you might see four clowns at a circus as were the four bears a symmetry almost divine and quite unnatural the eldest the fiercest and most hostile had a face and shoulders that might belong to a boy of sixteen the youngest and smallest might have been jeremy's age jeremy did not notice any of this very plain to him the fact that the four faces to whomsoever they might belong did not care either for him or his dog one to four he was in a situation of some danger he was suddenly aware that he had never seen boys quite so ferocious in appearance the street boys of Polchester were milk and water to them. Hamlet also felt this. He was sitting up, his head raised, his body stiff, intent, and you could feel within him the bark strangled by the melodrama of the situation. Jeremy said, uh, rather feebly, uh, hello. The reply was a terrific, ear-shattering bellow from four lusty throats. Then, more distinctly, get out of this fear was in his heart he was compelled afterwards to admit it he could only reply very feebly why the eldest of the party glaring replied if you don't we'll make you then this is ours here hamlet was now quivering all over and jeremy was afraid lest he should make a dash for the boulders he therefore climbed on to his feet, holding Hamlet's collar with his hand, and, smiling, answered, "'I'm sorry, I didn't know. I've only just come.' "'Well, get out, then,' was the only reply. What fascinated him like a dream was the way that the faces did not move, nor more body reveal itself. Painted against the blue sky, they might have been, ferocious stares and all. There was nothing more to be done. He beat an inglorious retreat, not indeed running, but walking with what dignity he could summon, Hamlet at his side, uttering noises like a kettle on the boil. 2. He had not to wait long for some explanation of the vision. At breakfast, and it was a wonderful breakfast with more eggs and bacon, cream and strawberry jam than he had ever known, his father said, now children there's only one thing here that you must remember jeremy are you listening yes father don't speak with your mouth full there's a farm near the church on the sand you can't mistake it is the farm on the sand father asked mary her eyes wide open no of course not how could a farm be on the sand the farmhouse stands back at the end of the path that runs by the church it's a grey farm with a high stone wall. You cannot mistake it. Well, none of you children are to go near that farm. On no account whatever, on no account whatever, to go near it. Why not, father? asked Jeremy. Is there scarlet fever there? Because I say so is quite enough, said Mr. Cole. There's a family staying there you must have nothing at all to do with. Perhaps you will see them in the distance. You must avoid them and never speak to them. Are they very wicked? asked Mary, her voice vibrating low with the drama of the situation. Never mind what they are. They are not fit companions for you children. It is most unfortunate that they are here so close to us. Had I known it, I would not, I think, have come here. Jeremy said nothing. These were, of course, his friends of the morning. He could see now, straight across the breakfast table, those eight burning, staring eyes. Later, from the slope of the green hill above the rectory, he looked across the gleaming beach at the church, the road, and then, in the distance, the forbidden farm. Strange how the forbidding of anything made one, from the very bottom of one's soul, long for it yesterday staring across the green slopes and hollows the farm would have been but a grey patch sown into the purple hill that hung behind it now it was mysterious
crammed with hidden life of its own the most dramatic point in the whole landscape what had they done that family that was so terrible what was there about those four boys that he had never seen in any boys before he longed to know them with a burning desperate longing nevertheless a whole week passed without any contact once jeremy saw against the skyline on the hill behind the church a trail of four single file silhouetted black they passed steadily secretly bent on their own mysterious purposes the sky when their figures had left it was painted with drama once mary reported that wandering along the beach a wild figure almost naked had started from behind a rock and shouted at her she ran of course and behind her there echoed a dreadful laugh but the best story of all was from helen who passing the graveyard had seen go down the road a most beautiful lady most beautifully dressed according to helen she was the most lovely lady ever seen with jewels hanging from her ears pearls round her neck and her clothes a bright orange she had walked up the road and gone through the gate into the farm the mystery would have excited them all even more than in fact it did had carleon itself been less entrancing but what carleon turned out to be no words can describe those were the days of course before golf links in glebeshire and although no one who has ever played on the carleon links will ever wish them away they the handsomest kindest most fantastic sea links in all of england yet i will not pretend that those same green slopes sliding so softly down to the seashore bending back so gently to the wild mysteries of the pundery moor had not then a virgin charm that now they have lost who can decide but for children thirty years ago what a kingdom glittering with colour they had the softness of a loving mother the sudden tumbled romance of an adventurous elder brother they caught all the colours of the floating sky in their laps and the shadows flew like birds from shoulder to shoulder and then suddenly the hills would shake their sides and all those shadows would slide down to the yellow beach and lie there like purple carpets you could race and race and never grow tired lie on your back and stare into the fathomless sky roll over forever and come to no harm wander and never be lost the first gate of the kingdom and the last the little golden square underneath the tower where the green witch has her stall of treasures that she never sells three then the great adventure occurred one afternoon the sun shone so gloriously that jeremy was blinded by it blinded and dream-smitten so that he sat perched on the garden wall of the rectory staring before him at the glitter and the sparkle seeing nothing but perhaps a little boat of dark wood with a ruby sail floating out to the horizon having on its boards sacks of gold and pearls and diamonds gold in fat slabs pearls in white shaking heaps diamonds that put out the eyes so bright they were going going whither he does not know but shades his eyes against the sun and the boat has gone and there is nothing there but an unbroken blue of sea with the black rocks fringing it mary called up to him from the garden and suggested that they should go out and pick flowers and still in a dream he climbed down from the wall and stood there nodding his head like a mandarin he suffered himself to be led by mary into the high road only stopping for a moment to whistle for hamlet who came running across the lawn as though he had just been shot out of a cannon it can have been only because he was sunk so deep in his dream that he wandered without knowing it down over the beach jumping the hill stream that intersected it up the sand past the church out along the road that led straight to the forbidden farm nor was mary thinking of their direction she was having one of her happy days her straw hat on the back of her head her glasses full of sunlight her stockings wrinkled about her legs 
walking her head in the air singing one of her strange tuneless chants that came to her when she was happy there was a field on their right and a break in the hedge through the break she saw buttercups thousands of them and loose strife and snapdragon she climbed the gate and vanished into the field jeremy walked on scarcely realizing her absence suddenly he heard a scream he stopped and hamlet stopped pricking up his ears another scream then a succession piercing and terrible then over the field gate mary appeared tumbling over regardless of all audiences and proprieties then running crying jeremy 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 buttercups scattering from her hands as she ran her face was one question mark of terror her hat was gone her hair ribbon dangling her stockings about her ankles all she could do was to cling to jeremy crying oh, 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 oh. what is it he asked roughly his fear for her making him impatient was it a bull oh, no, no 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 oh jeremy oh dear oh dear the, the boys they hit me pulled my hair what boys but already he knew recovering a little she told him she had not been in the field a moment and was bending down picking her first buttercups when she felt herself violently seized from behind her arms held and looking up there were three boys standing there all around her terrible fierce boys looking ever so wicked they tore her hat off her head pulled her hair and told her to leave the field at once never to come into it again that it was their field and she'd better not forget it and to tell all her beastly family that they'd better not forget it either and that they'd be shot if they came in there then they took me to the gate and pushed me over they were very rough i've got bruises she began to cry as the full horror of the event broke upon her jeremy's anger was terrible to witness he took her by the arm come with me he said he led her to the end of the road beyond the church now you go home he said don't breathe a word to anyone till i get back very well she sobbed but i've lost my hat i'll get your hat he answered and take hamlet with you he watched her set off no harm could come to her there in the open she had only to cross the beach and climb the hill he watched her until she had jumped the stream hamlet running in front of her then he turned back he climbed the gate into the field there was no one only the golden sea of buttercups and near the gate a straw hat he picked it up and back in the road again stood hesitating there was only one thing he could do and he knew it but he hesitated he had been forbidden to enter the place and besides there were four of them and such a four then he shrugged his shoulders a very characteristic action of his and marched ahead the gate of the farm swung easily open and then at once he was upon them all four of them sitting in a row upon a stone wall at the far corner of the yard and staring at him it was a dirty messy place and a fitting background for that company the farm itself looked fierce with its blind gray wall and its sullen windows and the yard was in fearful confusion oozing between the stones with shiny yellow streams and dank coagulating pools piled high with heaps of stinking manure pigs wandering in the middle distance hens and chickens and a ruffian dog chained to his kennel the four looked at jeremy without moving jeremy came close to them and said you're a lot of dirty cads they made neither answer nor movement dirty cads to touch my sister a girl who couldn't touch you still no answer only one the smallest jumped off the wall and ran to the gate behind jeremy i'm not afraid of you said jeremy he was terribly afraid i wouldn't be afraid of a lot of dirty sneaks like you are to hit a girl still no answer so he ended and we'll go wherever we like it isn't your field and we've got as much right to it as you have 
He turned to go and faced the boy at the gate. The other three had now climbed off the wall, and he was surrounded. He had never, since the night with the sea captain, been in so perilous a situation. He thought that they would murder him and then hide his body under the manure. They looked quite capable of it. And in some strange way, this farm was so completely shut off from the outside world, the house watched so silently, the wall was so high. And he was very small indeed, compared with the biggest of the four. No, he did not feel very happy. Nothing could be more terrifying than their silence. But if they were silent, he could be silent too. So he just stood there and said nothing. "'What are you going to do about it?' suddenly asked the biggest of the four. "'Do about what?' he replied, his voice trembling in spite of himself, simply, as it seemed to him, from the noisy beating of his heart. "'Our cheeking your sister!' "'I can't do much,' Jeremy said, "'when there are four of you, but I'll fight the one my own size.' That hero, grinning, moved forward to Jeremy, but the one who had already spoken broke out. "'Let him out!' we don't want him and don't you come back again he suddenly shouted i will jeremy shouted in return if i want to and then i regret to say took to his heels and ran pell-mell down the road four now this was an open declaration of war and not lightly to be disregarded jeremy said not a word of it to any one not even to the wide-eyed mary who had been waiting in a panic of terror under the oak tree like the lady at carpaccio's picture of st george and the dragon longing for her true knight to return all bloody and tumbled to quote miss jane porter's thaddeus he was not bloody nor was he tumbled but he was serious-minded and preoccupied this was all very nice but it was pretty well going to spoil the holidays these fellows hanging round and turning up just whenever they pleased frightening everybody and perhaps this sudden thought made for a moment his heart stand still doing something really horrible to hamlet he felt as though he had the whole burden of it on his shoulders as though he were on guard for all the family there was no one to whom he could speak no one at all for several days he moved about as though in enemy country looking closely at hedges scanning hill horizons keeping hamlet as close to his side as possible no sign of the ruffians no word of them at home they had faded into smoke and gone down with the wind suddenly one morning when he was in a hollow of the downs throwing pebbles at a tree he heard a voice hands up or i fire he turned round and saw the eldest of the quartet quite close to him. Although he had spoken so fiercely, he was not looking fierce, but rather was smiling in a curious, crooked kind of way. Jeremy could see him more clearly than before, and a strange enough object he was. He was wearing a dirty old pair of flannel cricketing trousers and a grubby shirt open at the neck one of his eyes was bruised and he had a cut across his nose but the thing in the main that struck jeremy now was his appearance of immense physical strength his muscles seemed simply to bulge under his shirt he had the neck of a prize-fighter he was a great deal older than jeremy perhaps sixteen or seventeen years of age his eyes which were gray and clear were his best feature but he was no beauty and in his dirty clothes and with his bruises he looked a most dangerous character jeremy called hamlet to him and held him by the collar all right the ruffian said i'm not going to touch your dog i didn't think you were said jeremy lying oh yes you did i suppose you think we eat dog flesh and murder babies lots of people do the sudden sense that other folk in the world also thought the quartet outlaws was new to jeremy he had envisaged the affair as a struggle in which the cole family only were engaged eat babies jeremy cried no do you of course not said the boy that's the sort of damned rot people talk they think we do anything 
he suddenly sat down on the turf and jeremy sat down too dramatically picturing to himself the kind of things that would happen did his father turn the corner and find him there amicably in league with his enemy there followed a queer in and out little conversation bewildering in some strange way so that they seemed to sink deeper and deeper into the thick velvet pile of the green downs lost to all the world that was humming like a top beyond the barrier i liked your coming into the yard about your sister that was damned plucky of you for some reason hidden deep in the green down jeremy had never before known praise that pleased him so deeply he flushed kicking the turf with the heels of his boots you were cads to hit my sister he said he let hamlet's collar go and the dog went over and smelt the dirty trousers and sniffed at the rough reddened hand how old are you ten and a half i know you're called coal you're the son of the parson at the rectory jeremy nodded his head the boy was now sprawling his length his head resting on his arms his thick legs stretched out you're awfully strong jeremy suddenly said the boy nodded his head i am that i can throw a cricket ball from here to the church i can wrestle any one box too he didn't say this boastfully but quite calmly stating well-known facts jeremy opened his eyes wide what are you called he asked humphrey charles rutben where do you go to school i don't go i was kicked out of harrow but it didn't matter anyway because my governor couldn't pay the school bills expelled this was exciting indeed jeremy inquired but his friend would give no reasons only looked at him curiously and smiled then he suddenly went on in another tone you know everyone hates us don't you yes i know that said jeremy why is it because we're bad humphrey said solemnly our hand is against everyone and everyone's hand is against us but why asked jeremy again well for one thing they don't like father he's got if you were speaking very politely what you'd call a damned bad temper by jove you should see him lose it he's broken three chairs in the farm already i don't suppose we shall be here very long we're always moving about then another reason is that we never have any money father makes a bit racing sometimes and then we're flush for a week or two but it never lasts long why he went on drawing himself up with an air of pride we owe money all over the country that's why we came down to this rotten dull hole because we hadn't been down here before and another reason they don't like us is because that woman who lives with us isn't father's wife and she isn't our mother either i should rather think not she's a beast i hate her he added reflectively there was a great deal of all this that jeremy did not understand but he got from it an immense impression of romance and adventure and then as he looked across at the boy opposite to him a new feeling came to him a feeling that he'd never known before it was an exciting strange emotion something that was suddenly almost adoration he was aware all in a second that he would do anything in the world for this strange boy he would like to be ordered by him to run down the shoulder of the down and race across the sands and plunge into the sea and he would do it or to be commanded by him all the way to st mary's ever so many miles to fetch something for him it was so new an experience that he felt exceedingly shy about it and could only sit there kicking at the turf and saying nothing humphrey's brow was suddenly as black as thunder he got up i see what it is he said you're like the rest now i've told you what we are you don't want to have anything more to do with us well you needn't nobody asked you you can just go back to your old parson and say to him oh father i met such a wicked boy to-day he was naughty and i'm never going to talk to him again all right then go along the attack was so sudden that jeremy was taken entirely by surprise 
he had been completely absorbed by this new feeling he had not known that he had been silent oh no i don't care what you are or your father or whether you haven't any money i've got some money i'll give it to you if you like and you shall have threepence more on saturday fourpence if i know my collect i say he stammered over this request i, I wish you'd throw a stone from here and see how far you can humphrey was immensely gratified he bent down and picked up a pebble then straining backwards ever so slightly slung it it vanished into the blue sea jeremy sighed with admiration you can throw he said would you mind if i felt the muscle on your arm he felt it he had never imagined such a muscle do you think i could have more if i worked at it he asked stretching out his own arm humphrey graciously felt it that's not bad for a kid of your size he said you ought to lift weights in the morning that's the way to bring it up then he added you're a sporting kid i like you i'll be here again same time tomorrow and without another word was running off with a strange jumping motion across the down jeremy went home and could think of nothing at all but his adventure how sad it was that always without his in the least desiring it he was running up against authority he had been forbidden to go near the farm or to have anything to do with the wild outlawed tenants of it and now here he was making close friends with one of the worst of them he could not help it he did not want to help it when he looked round the family supper table how weak colourless and uninteresting they all seemed no muscles no outlawry no running from place to place to escape the police he saw humphrey standing against the sky and slinging that stone he could throw there was no doubt of it he could throw perhaps better than anyone else in the world they met then every day and for a glorious wonderful week nobody knew i am sorry to say that jeremy was involved at once in a perfect mist of lies and false excuses what a business it was being always with the family he had felt it now for a long time the apparent impossibility of going anywhere or doing anything without everybody all around you asking multitudes of questions where are you going to jeremy where have you been what have you been doing i haven't seen you for the last two hours jeremy mother's been looking for you everywhere so he lied and lied and lied otherwise he got no harm from this wonderful week one must do humphrey that justice that he completely respected jeremy's innocence he even for perhaps the first time in his young life tried to restrain his swearing they found the wild moor at the back of the downs a splendid hunting ground here in the miles of gorse and shrub and pond and heather they were safe from the world their companions birds and rabbits humphrey knew more about animals than any one in england he said so himself so it must be true the weather was glorious hot and gorse scented they bathed in the pools and ran about naked humphrey doing exercises standing on his head turning somersaults lifting jeremy with his hands as though he weighed nothing at all humphrey's body was brown all over like an animal's humphrey talked and jeremy listened he told jeremy the most marvellous stories and jeremy believed every word of them they sat on a little hummock with a dark wood behind them and watched the moon rise you're a decent kid said humphrey i like you better than my brothers i suppose you'll forget me as soon as i'm gone i'll never forget you said jeremy can't you leave your family and be somebody else then you can come and stay with us stay with a parson not much you'll see me again one day i'll send you a line from time to time and let you know where i am finally they swore friendship they exchanged gifts humphrey gave jeremy a broken pocket knife and jeremy gave humphrey his silver watch chain they shook hands and swore to be friends forever and then the final and terrible tragedy occurred five it came just as suddenly as for a romantic climax it should have come on the afternoon that followed the friendship swearing humphrey did not appear at the accustomed place 
jeremy waited for several hours and then went melancholy home at breakfast next morning there were those grown-up mysterious allusions that mean that some catastrophe too terrible for tender ears is occurring i never heard anything so awful said aunt amy it's so sad to me said jeremy's mother sighing that people should want to do these things it's abominable said mr cole that they were ever allowed to come here at all we should have been told before we came but do you really think said aunt amy i know because mrs but just fancy if it's quite possible especially when what a dreadful thing that jeremy sat there feeling as though every one were looking at him what had happened to humphrey he must go at once and find out he slipped off after breakfast and before he reached the bottom of the downs heard shouts and cries he ran across the beach and was soon involved in a crowd of farmers women boys and animals all shouting crying out and barking together being small he was able to worry his way through without any attention being paid to him indeed every one was too deeply excited by what was happening in the yard of the farm to notice small boys when at last he got to the gate and looked through he beheld an extraordinary scene among the cobbles and the manure heaps and the filth many things were scattered articles of clothing some chairs and a table some pictures many torn papers the yard was almost filled with men and women all of them apparently shouting and screaming together a big red-faced man next to jeremy was crying over and over again that'll teach him to meddle with our women that'll teach him to meddle with our women on the steps of the farmhouse an extraordinary woman was standing quite alone no one near to her standing there contempt in her eyes and a curious smile almost of pleasure on her lips even to jeremy's young innocence she was overcolored her face was crimson she wore a large hat of bright green and a bright green dress with a flowing train she did not move she might have been painted into the stone but jeremy's gaze seen dimly and as it were upwards through a pair of high widely extended farmer's legs was soon withdrawn from this highly colored lady to the central figure of the scene this was a man who seemed to jeremy the biggest and blackest human he had ever seen he had jet-black hair a black beard and struggling now in the middle of the yard between three rough-looking countrymen his clothes were almost torn from the upper part of his body his face was bleeding and even as jeremy caught sight of him he snatched one arm free and caught one of his captors a blow that sent him reeling for one instant he seemed to rise above the crowd gathering himself together for a mighty effort he seemed in that second to look towards jeremy his eyes staring out of his head his great chest heaving his legs straining but at once four men were upon him and began to drive him towards the gate the crowd bending back and driving jeremy into a confusion of thighs and legs behind which he could see nothing then suddenly once more the scene cleared and the boy saw a figure run from the house crying something his hand raised someone caught the figure and stayed it for a second of time jeremy saw humphrey's face flaming with anger then the crowd closed round at the same instant the black man seemed to be whirled towards them there was a crushing a screaming a boot seemed to rise from the ground of its own volition and kick him violently in the face and he fell down 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 into a bottomless sea of black pitch six for three days he was in bed his head aching one cheek swollen to twice its natural size one eye closed to his amazement no one scolded him no one asked him how he had been caught in that crowd every one was very kind to him once he asked his mother what had happened she told him that they were very wicked people and had gone away when he was up and about again he went to the farm and looked through the gate within there was absolute stillness a pig was snuffling amongst the manure he went out to the moor it was a perfect afternoon only a little breeze blowing 
the pools slightly ruffled were like blue lace a rabbit sitting in front of his hole did not move he threw himself face downwards on the ground burying his nose in it feeling in some strange way that humphrey was there End of chapter 8chapter nine of jeremy and hamlet by hugh walpole this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the picture book one september one was mary's birthday and it had always something of a melancholy air about it because it meant that the holidays were drawing to a close soon there would be the last bathe the last picnic the last plunge across the moor the last waking to the sharp poignant cry of the flying swerving gulls then in strange sudden fashion like the unclicking of a door that opens into another room the summer had suddenly slipped aside giving place to autumn not full autumn yet only a few leaves turning a few fires burning in the fields the sea only a little colder in colour the sky at evening a chillier green but the change was there and with it polchester and close behind polchester old thompson stepped towards them yes mary's birthday marked the beginning of the end and in addition to that there was the desperate urgent question of present giving mary took her present giving or rather present getting with the utmost seriousness no one in the whole world minded quite so desperately as she what she got who gave it her and how it was given not that she was greedy indeed no she was not like helen who guessed the price of everything that she received and had what uncle samuel called a regular shop mind it was all sentiment with mary what she wanted was that some one any one should love her and therefore give her something she knew that uncle samuel did not love her and she suffered not therefore the slightest unhappiness did he forget her natal day but she would have cried for a week had jeremy forgotten it she did not mind did jeremy only spend sixpence on his gift but he was a generous boy and always spent everything that at the moment he had so that she might be sure that he had taken a little trouble in the buying of it jeremy knew all this well enough and in earlier years the question of buying had been simple because cow farm was miles from anywhere the nearest village being the fishing cove of raphael and raphael had only one shop general and the things in this shop general were all visible in the window from year's end to year's end mary therefore received on her birthday something with which by sight at least she was thoroughly familiar now this year there were new conditions the nearest village with shops was st mary's moor some six miles away it was there that the purchase must be made and in any case it would be on this occasion a real novelty jeremy tried to discover by those circumlocutory but self-revealing methods peculiar to intending present givers what mary would like supposing just supposing that some one one day were to die and most unexpectedly leave a lot of money to mary what would she buy this was the kind of game that mary adored and she entered into it thoroughly she would buy an enormous library thousands and thousands of books she would buy a town and fill it with sweet shops and then put hundreds of poor children into it to eat as much as they liked she would buy polchester cathedral and make father bishop this was flying rather too high and so jeremy somewhat precipitately asked her what she would do were she given fifteen shillings and sixpence she considered and being that morning in a very christian frame of mind decided that she would give it to miss jones to buy a new hat with mentally cursing girls and their tiresome ways jeremy outwardly polite altered his demands to no but suppose you were given five shillings and threepence halfpenny the exact sum saved at that moment by him and had to spend it for yourself mary what would you get with it she would get a book yes but what book she clasped her hands and looked to heaven 
oh there were so many that she wanted she wanted the young stepmother and dinabersteras the scottish chiefs and quichi and sylvie and bruno and queen's marie and and hundreds and hundreds well she couldn't buy hundreds with five and threepence halfpenny that was certain and if she thought that he was going to she was very much mistaken but at least he had got his answer it was a book that she wanted the next thing was to go to st mary's moor he found the opportunity ready to his hand because miss jones had to go to buy some things that were needed for the family the very next afternoon he would go with her mary thought that she would go too and when jeremy told her with an air of great mystery that that was impossible she looked so self-conscious that he could have smacked her the journey in the old ramshackle omnibus was a delightful adventure it happened on this particular afternoon that all the carlion farmers and their wives were going too and there was a fine old crush hamlet fixed tightly on his lead sat between his master's legs his tongue out his hair on end and his bright eyes wicked darting from place to place he saw so many things that he would like to do parcels that he would like to worry legs that he would like to smell laps that he would like to investigate he gave sudden jerks at the lead suited himself to the rolling and jolting of the bus so that he should be flung as near as possible to the leg parcel or lap that he most wished to investigate jeremy then was very busy miss jones who was a good woman and by now thoroughly appreciated by all the members of the cole family including jeremy himself who always took her under his especial protection when they went out anywhere had in all her years never learnt that first of all social laws never try to talk in a noisy vehicle and had a long story about one edmund spencer from whose mother she had that morning received a letter she treated jeremy as a friend and contemporary one of the reasons for his liking of her and he was always deeply interested in her histories but to-day owing to the terrific rumblings rattlings and screaming of the bus and to the shrieking and shouting of the farmers and their ladies he could only catch occasional words and was not sure at the end of it all whether edmund spencer were animal vegetable or mineral his confusion was complete when just as they were rattling into st mary's one and only street miss jones screamed into his ear and so they had to give her boiled milk four times a day and nothing else except an occasional potato the omnibus drew up in front of the dog and rabbit and every one departed on their various affairs st mary's was like a little wayside station on the edge of a vast brindled crinkled moorland brown and grey and green rucking away to the smooth pale eggshell blue of the afternoon sky the sea wind came ruffling up to them where they stood what storms of wind and rain there must be in the winter all the houses of the long straggling street seemed to be blown a bit askew jeremy and miss jones looked around them and at once the inevitable general sprang to view miss jones had to go into the hotel about some business for the rectory and telling jeremy to stay just where he was and that she wouldn't be more than just five minutes vanished having been told to stay where he was it was natural of him to wander down the street inspect a greasy pond with some ducks three children playing marbles and two mongrel dogs and then flatten his nose against the window of the general inspection proved very disappointing there seemed to be nothing here that he could possibly offer to mary bootlaces cards of buttons mysterious articles of underwear foggy bottles containing bull's eyes sticks of licorice cakes of soap copies of home chant and the woman's journal some pairs of very dilapidated looking slippers some walking sticks portraits of queen victoria and the prince of wales highly colored none of these unless possibly the royal family but no even to jeremy's untrained eye the color was a little bright and old victoria no mary wanted a book he stared up and down the street in great agitation he must buy something before miss jones came out of the inn 
he did not want her to see what it was that he bought the moments were slipping by there was nothing here the two half-crowns and the three-penny piece in his tightly clenched palm were hot and sticky he looked again there really was nothing then staring down the street towards the open moor and the eventual sea he saw a little bulging bottle-glass window that seemed to have coloured things in it he turned and almost ran it was the last shop in the street and a funny dumpty whitewashed cottage with a pretty garden on its farther seaward side the bottle-glass window protected the strangest things in another place and at another time it might not be uninteresting to tell the story of mr redpath of how he opened a curiosity shop in st mary's of all places and of the adventures happy and otherwise that he encountered there in the shop window there were glasses of blue with tapering stems and squat old men smoking pipes painted in the gayest colours and pottery jugs to drink out of and there were old chains of beaten and figured silver and golden boxes and the model of a ship with full sails and a gorgeous figurehead of red and gold and there were old pictures in dim frames and a piece of a coloured rug and lots and lots of other things as well jeremy pushed the door back heard a little bell tinkle above his head and at once was in a shop so crowded that it was impossible to see t'other from which a young man with a pale face and carroty hair was behind the very high counter so high that jeremy's nose just tipped the level of it have you got such a thing as a book he asked very politely the young man smiled what sort of a book well she said she wanted kichi or sylvie and bruno or well, i've forgotten the names of the others you haven't got those two i suppose no i haven't said the young man quite grave now have you got any books said jeremy breathlessly because time was slipping by and he had to stand on his toes well i've got this old bible said the young man producing a thick heavy volume with brass clasps you see it's got rather fine pictures i think you'd better sit on this he added producing a high stool you'll be able to see better oh that's very nice said jeremy fascinated by moses twisting a serpent around his very muscular arm as though it were a piece of string how much is this eight pounds and ten said the young man as though he'd said a halfpenny i think i'd better tell you at once said jeremy leaning his elbows confidentially on the counter that i've only got five shillings and threepence halfpenny the young man scratched his head i doubt if we've got any book he began then suddenly oh, perhaps this will be the very thing if you like pictures he burrowed deep down in the back somewhere and then produced two or three long flat-looking books dusty and a faded yellow he wiped them with a cloth and presented them to jeremy at the first sight of them he knew that they were what he wanted he read the titles one was robinson crusoe another the swiss family robinson the third masterman ready he looked at crusoe and gave a delighted squeal of ecstasy as he turned over the pages the print was funny and blacker than he had ever seen print before the pictures were coloured and richly coloured the reds and greens and purples sinking deep into the page oh it was a lovely book a perfect book the very very thing for mary how much is it he asked trembling before the answer exactly five shillings and threepence halfpenny said the young man gravely that is strange said jeremy almost crowing with delight and keeping his hand on the book unless it should suddenly melt away that's just what i've got isn't that lucky very fortunate indeed said the young man shall i wrap it up for you oh yes please do and very carefully please so nobody can guess what it is the young man was very clever about this and when he emerged from the back of the shop he had with him a parcel that might easily have been a ship or a railway train jeremy paid his money climbed down from his stool then held out his hand 
Goodbye, he said, and thank you. I'll come again one day and look at the other things in your shop. Please do, said the young man, bowing. He went out, the little bell tinkling gaily behind him, and there, coming at that very moment out of the hotel, was Miss Jones. 2. We all know the truth of the familiar proverb that distance lends enchantment to the view, and it was never more true of anything in the world than of parcels. All the way back in the bus, the book grew and grew in magnificence simply because Jeremy could not see it. He clutched the parcel tightly on his knees and resisted all Miss Jones' attempts to discover its contents. Back in the rectory, he rushed up to his bedroom, locked the door, and then, with trembling fingers, undid the paper. The first glimpse of Robinson Crusoe and the footmark on the sand thrilled him so that the whitewashed walls of his room faded away and the thin, pale evening glow passed into a sky of burning blue and a scarlet cockatoo flew screaming above his head and the sand lay hot and sugar-brown at his feet. Mystery was there, the footprints in the sand, and Crusoe with his shaggy beard and peaked hat staring. Feverishly, his fingers turned the pages, and picture after picture opened for his delight. He had never before seen a book with so many pictures, pictures so bright and yet so true, pictures so real that you could almost touch the trees and the figures and Crusoe's hatchet. He knelt then on the floor, the book spread out upon the bed, so deeply absorbed that it was with a terrific jolt that he heard the banging on the door and Mary's voice. "'Aren't you coming, Jeremy? We're halfway through supper. The bell went hours ago.' Mary! He had forgotten all about her. Of course, this book was for her. Just the book for her. She would love the pictures. He had forgotten all about... He went down to supper and was bewildered and absent-minded throughout the meal. That night his dreams were all of Crusoe, of burning sands and flaming skies, of the crimson cockatoo and man Friday. When he woke, he jumped at once out of bed and ran on naked feet to the book. As a rule, the next morning is the testing time, and too often we find that the treasure that we bought the day before has already lost some of its glitter and shine now it was not so the pictures had grown better and better richer and ever more rich the loveliest pictures just the book for mary it was then standing half stripped before his basin pausing as he always did ere he made the icy attack with the sponge that he realized his temptation he did not want to give the book to mary he wanted to keep it for himself while he dressed the temptation did not approach him very closely it was so horrible a temptation that he did not look it in the eye he was a generous little boy had never done a mean thing in all his life he was always eager to give anything away although he had a strong and persistent sense of possessions so that he loved to have his things near him and they seemed to him his books and his toys and his football as alive as the people around him he had never felt anything so alive as this book was when he came down to breakfast he was surprised to find that the sight of mary made him feel rather cross she always had, in excess of others, the capacity for irritating him, as she herself well knew. This morning she irritated him very much. Her birthday would be four days from now. He would be glad when it arrived. He could give her the book, and the temptation would be over. Indeed, he would like to give her the book now and have done with it. By the middle of the day he was considering whether he could not give her something else just as good, and keep the book for himself. He wrapped the book in all its paper, but ran up continually to look at it. She would like something else just as much. She would like something else more. After all, Robinson Crusoe was a book for boys. But the trouble was that he had now no money. He would receive threepence on Saturday, the last Saturday before Mary's birthday, but what could you get with threepence? five shillings of the sum with which he had bought mary's present had been given him by uncle samuel and uncle samuel's next present would be the tip before he went to school 
That afternoon he quarreled with Mary, for no reason at all. He was sitting under the oak tree on the lawn, reading Red Gauntlet. Mary came and asked him whether she could take Hamlet for a run. Hamlet, as though he were a toy dog made of springs, was leaping up and down. He did not like Mary, but he adored a run. "'No, you can't,' said Jeremy. "'Oh, Jeremy, why can't I? I'll take the greatest care of him, and those horrid little boys are gone away now, and you can't because I say you can't. Oh, Jeremy, do that—' He started up from his chair, all rage and indignation. "'Look here, Mary, if you go on talking—' She walked away down the garden, her head hanging in that tiresome way it had when she was unhappy. Hamlet tried to follow her, so he called him back. He came, but was quite definitely in the sulks, sitting, his head raised, very proud, wrath in his eyes, snapping angrily at an occasional fly. Red Gauntlet was spoilt for Jeremy. He put the book down and tried to placate Hamlet, who knew his power, and refused to be placated. Why didn't he let Mary take Hamlet? What a pig he was! He would be nice to Mary when she came back. But when she did return, that face of hers, with its beseeching look, irritated him so deeply that he snapped at her more than before. After all, Robinson Crusoe was a book for boys. Two days later he had decided, quite definitely, that he could not part with it. He must find something else for her, something very fine indeed, the best thing that he had. He thought of every possible way of making money, but time was so short, and ways of making money quickly were so few. He thought of asking his father for the pocket money of many weeks in advance, but it would have to be so very many weeks in advance to be worth anything at all, and his father would want to know what he needed the money for. And after the episode of last Christmas, he did not wish to say anything about presents. He thought of selling something, but there was no place to sell things in, and he had not anything that anyone else wanted. He thought of asking his mother, but she would send him to his father, who always managed the family finances. He went over all his private possessions. The trouble with them was that Mary knew them all so well. Impossible to pretend that there was anything there that she would want. He collected the most hopeful of them and laid them out on the bed. A pocket knife, three books, a photograph frame, rubbed at the edges, a watch chain that had seemed at first to be silver, but now most certainly was not, a leather pocket book, a red blotting pad, not a very brilliant collection. He did not now dare to look at the book at all. He put it away in the bottom of the chest of drawers. He thought that perhaps if he did not see it, nor take it out of its brown paper until the actual day, that it would be easier to give. But he had imagination, as in the later years he was to find to his cost, and the book grew and grew in his mind, the pictures flaming like suns, the spirit of the book smiling at him, saying to him with confidential friendship, We belong to one another, you and I. No one shall part us then helen said to him what are you going to give mary on her birthday why he asked suspiciously well, i only wanted to know i've got mine everyone knows you went into st mary's and bought something mary herself knows that was the worst of being part of a family everyone knew everything perhaps it wasn't for mary he said helen sniffed of course if you don't want to tell me she said i don't care to know then he discovered the little glass bottle with the silver stopper. It had been given him two years ago on his birthday by a distant cousin, who happened to be staying with him at the time. What anybody wanted to give a boy a glass bottle with a stopper for, Jeremy could not conceive. Mary had always liked it, had picked it up and looked at it with longing. Of course, she knew that it had been his for two years. He looked at it, and even as Adam years ago with the apple, he fell. 3. Mary's birthday came, and with it a day of burning, glowing color. The first early autumn mists were hanging like veils of thinly sheeted bronze before the grass wet with heavy dew, the sky of azure, the sea crystal pale. In the mist, the rectory was a giant box of pearl. 
the air smelt of distant fires on such a day who would not be happy and mary was perhaps the happiest little girl in the kingdom happy as she was she lost much of her plainness her eyes sparkling behind her glasses her mouth smiling something tender and poignant in her some distant prophecy of her maturity one day beautifully to be fulfilled coming forth in her because she felt that she was beloved even though it was only for an hour she was lucky in her presence her mother gave her a silver watch a little darling quite small with the hours marked in blue on the face and her father gave her a silver watch chain so thin that you thought it would break if you looked at it and in reality so strong that not the strongest man in the world could break it aunt amy gave her a muff soft and furry and helen gave her a red leather blotter and uncle samuel sent her a book the very denovan terrace that she wanted how did he know and miss jones gave her a work basket with the prettiest silk lining inside you ever saw and a pair of gloves from barbara and a glass bottle with silver stopper from jeremy it seemed that she liked this last present best of all she rushed up to jeremy and kissed him in the wettest possible way oh jeremy i am so glad that's just what i wanted i've never seen such a darling i've never had any silver things to stand on my table and gladys sampson has such a lot and this is prettier than any that gladys has oh mother do look see what jeremy's given me father see what jeremy's given me isn't it pretty miss jones you are a dear jeremy and i'll have it all my life jeremy stood there his heart like lead it may be said with truth of him that never in his whole existence had he felt such shame as he did now mean 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 suddenly now that it was too late he hated that book upstairs lying safely in his bottom drawer he didn't want ever to look at it again and mary she must know that this was his old glass bottle that he had had so long she had seen it a hundred times it is true that he had rubbed it up and got the woman in the kitchen to polish the silver but still she must know he looked at her with new interest was it all acting this enthusiasm no it was not she was genuinely moved and delighted was she pretending to herself that she had never seen it before forcing herself to believe that it was new he would keep the book and give it to her at christmas but that would not be the same thing the deed was done now the shabby miserable deed he did everything that he could to make her birthday a happy one he was with her all the day he allowed her to read to him a long piece of the story that she was then writing a very tiresome business because she could not read her own script and because there were so many characters that he could never keep track of any of them he went blackberrying with her in the afternoon and gave her all the best blackberries but nothing could raise his spirits the beautiful day said nothing to him he felt sick in the evening from eating too many blackberries and went to bed directly after supper four the days that followed could hardly help but be jolly because the weather was so lovely still breathless days when the world seemed to be painted in purple and blue on a wall of ivory when the sea came over the sand with a ripple of utter content when the moon appeared early in the evening a silver bow and mounted gently into a sky thick with stars when every sound the rattle of carts the barks of dogs the cries of men struck the air sharply like blows upon iron yet though the world was so lovely and every one even aunt amy was in the best and most contented tempers something hung over him like a black heavy cloth his pride in himself was gone he had done something shabbier than even the dean's earnest would do he continued to see mary with new eyes she was a decent kid he looked back over the past months and saw how much more decent she had been to him than he had been to her she had been irritating of course but then that was because she was a girl all girls were irritating just look at helen for instance meanwhile he never glanced at the book again 
it lay there neglected in its paper one day mary received in a letter a postal order for ten shillings this was a present from a distant aunt in america who had suddenly remembered mary's birthday filled with glee and self-importance she went in to st mary's with miss jones to spend it that evening when jeremy was washing his hands there was a knock on his door and mary's voice may i come in yes he said she came in her face colored with mysterious purpose in her hands she held a paper parcel. "'Oh, are you washing your hands, Jeremy?' she said, her favorite opening in conversation being always a question of the obvious. The red evening sunlight flooded the room. "'What is it?' Jeremy asked her rather crossly. She looked at him pleadingly, as though begging him to save her from the difficulties of emotion and explanation that crowded in upon her oh jeremy st mary's was lovely and there was a man with an organ and a monkey and i gave the monkey a penny and it took it in its hand and took off its cap miss jones has got a cold she added and sneezed all the way home she always has a cold he said or something and it goes straight to her face when she has a cold and makes all her teeth ache not only one of them but all she isn't coming down to dinner she's gone to bed still he waited striving for politeness i've got something for you mary suddenly said dropping her voice in the sentimental manner that he hated then as though she were ashamed of what she had done she took the parcel to the bed and undid the paper with clumsy fingers there she said i got it for you because i thought you'd like it he looked at it it was a book it was swiss family robinson it was a companion to his Robinson Crusoe. He stared at it. He could say nothing. "'You do like it, don't you?' she asked, gazing at him anxiously. "'It's got lots and lots of pictures. There was a funny shop at the end of the street, and I went in with Miss Jones, and the man was very nice, and I thought it was just what you'd like. You do like it, don't you?' she asked again. But he could only stare at it, not coming forward to touch it he was buried deep deep in shame there came a rattle then on the door and helen's voice mary if you're in there with jeremy mother says you're to come at once and have your hair brushed because it's five minutes to supper oh dear i'd forgotten and with one last glance of anxiety towards jeremy she went still he did not move could anything possibly have happened to prove to him what a pig he was what a skunk and a cur mary had bought it with her own money five and threepence halfpenny out of ten shillings he did not touch the book but with chin set and eyes resolved he went down to supper when the meal was finished he said to mary come upstairs a minute i want to speak to you she followed him tremulously he seemed to be clothed in his domineering manner how often, especially of late, she had determined that she would not be afraid of him, but would dig up from within her the common sense, the easy companionship, the laughter that were all there for him, she knew, could she only be at her ease. She even sympathized with him in thinking her so often a fool. She was a fool when she was with him, simply because she cared for him so much and thought him so wonderful and so clever." he didn't like the book he was going to thank her for it in the way that he had when he was trying to be polite and didn't find it easy she followed him into the bedroom he carefully closed the door she saw at once that the book lay exactly where she had placed it on the bed that he had not even opened it he regarded her sternly sit down in that chair he said she sat down look here you oughtn't to have given me that book you know that aunt lucy sent that money for you to spend on yourself i thought you'd like it she said pushing at her spectacles as she always did when she was distressed i do like it he said it's splendid but i've done something awful and i've got to tell you now you've given me that oh jeremy something awful what is it he set his jaw and without looking at her made his confession that day i went in with miss jones to st mary's i was going to buy you a present and i did buy you one i went into that same shop you went to and i bought robinson crusoe just like the one you bought me 
when i bought it i meant it for you of course but when i got home i liked it so much i kept it for myself and i gave you that old bottle instead and then i didn't like the rotten book after all and i've never looked at it since your birthday mary's pleasure at being made his confidant in this way was much greater than her horror at his crime her bosom heaved with gratified importance i've done things like that jeremy she said i got six handkerchiefs for miss jones one christmas and i kept three of them because i got a terrible bad cold just at the time that's not so bad he said shaking his head because i gave you an old thing that i've had for years no she interrupted i've wanted that bottle ever so long i used to go up to your room and look at it sometimes when you were at school he went to the drawer and produced robinson crusoe and gave it to her she accepted it gratefully but said and now i shall have to give you back the bottle oh no you won't but i can't have two presents yes you can i don't want the old bottle anyway i never use it for anything and now we'll each have a book so it won't be like a present exactly she smiled with pleasure oh i'm so glad you're not angry angry he repeated after her yes she said getting up from the bed where she had been sitting i thought you were when you asked me to come up here he looked at her puzzled she seemed to him a new mary whom he had never seen before am i often angry he asked not angry exactly but i get frightened that you are going to be cross and then i say the silliest things not because i want to but because i want to be clever and then of course i never am he stood staring at her am i as beastly as that he asked oh you're not beastly she reassured him never you're not forgetting her grammar and her eagerness but i'm afraid of you and i'm fonder of you than anybody lots fonder and i always say to myself now i'm not going to be silly this time and then i am i don't know why she sighed but i'm not nearly as silly as i seem she ended no she wasn't he suddenly saw that and he also suddenly saw that he had all this time been making a great mistake here was a possible companion not only possible but living breathing existing she was on her own tonight, neither fearful nor silly meeting him on his own level superior to him perhaps knowing more than he did about many things understanding his feelings i say mary we'll do things together i'm awfully lonely sometimes i want someone to tell things to often we'll have a great time next holidays it was the happiest moment of mary's life too much for her altogether she just nodded and clutching robinson crusoe to her ran End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Jeremy and Hamlet by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten. Uncle Percy. One. The town was ringed with fire, and out of that magic circle, like Siegfried, Uncle Percy came. The sunset flamed up the hill and wrapped the top of the monument in crocus shadows. The garden of the coals was rose and amber mary and jeremy were hanging over the banisters watching for the arrival the windows behind them burnt with the sun and their bodies also burnt and their hair was in flames in the hall there was green dusk until at the rumble of the cab emily suddenly lit the gas and the umbrellas and landseer's dignity and impudence were magnificently revealed the door opened and out of the evening sun into the hissing gas stepped uncle percy the children heard him say mrs cole at home and his voice was roaring laughing vibrating resounding tumultuous he seemed in his rough gray overcoat too huge to be human and when this was taken from him by the smiling emily she always smiled as jeremy had long since observed at gentlemen more than at ladies in his bright brown tweeds he was still huge and with his brown hair and red face like a solid chunk of sunset thrown into the dark house to cheer it up he went bursting up the staircase and the children fled only just in time 
from the schoolroom they heard him erupt into the drawing-room and then the bumping of his box up the stairs and the swearing of the cabman this was their uncle percy from california south america new zealand hong kong and anywhere else you like the brother of their father the only prosperous one of that family prosperous according to aunt amy because for twenty years he had kept away from england according to father because he had always had wonderful health even as a very small boy and to uncle samuel because he had never married although that was a strange reason for uncle samuel to give because he also had never married and he could not with the best wish in the world be said to be prosperous it had been sprung upon them all with the utmost suddenness that he was coming to pay them a visit they had just returned from carlion and the sea in another ten days jeremy would be off to school again when the telegram arrived that threw them all into such perturbation arrive eleventh hope you can put me up for a day or two percy percy fortunately there was for them in the whole world only one percy or they might have been in sad confusion because their percy was they imagined safe in the suburbs of auckland new zealand a letter followed confirming the telegram mr cole had not seen his brother for twenty years they had received one photograph of a large fat staring man on a large fat staring horse such thighs such a back both of man and of horse feed their animals well in new zealand was uncle samuel's only comment and he back only that minute from painting the moors departed at a moment's notice for london don't you want to see uncle percy asked jeremy i shall see him better if i study him from a distance said uncle samuel he's too large to see properly close to and he went voted selfish by all because he would not help in the entertaining of course i'm selfish said uncle samuel no one else cares tuppence about me so where would i be if i didn't look after myself in any case their uncle percy actually was shut into the drawing-room and five minutes later the children were sent for it had not been intended that hamlet should enter with them but he had a way of suddenly appearing from nowhere and joining unobtrusively any company that he thought pleasant and amusing to-day however he was anything but unobtrusive at the sudden shock of that red flaming figure with legs spread wide across the centre of the carpet he drew himself together and barked like a mad thing nothing would quiet him and when jeremy dragged him into the passage and left him there he still barked and barked and barked quivering all over in a perfect frenzy of indignation and horror he had then to be taken to jeremy's bedroom on the top floor and shut in and there too he barked stopping only once and again for a howl all this disturbed uncle percy's greeting of the children but he did not seem to mind it was obvious at once that nothing could upset him jeremy simply could not take his eyes off him off his brown almost carroty hair that stood on end almost like an aureole off his purple cheeks and flat red nose and thick red neck off his flaming purple tie his waistcoat of red and brown squares his bulging thighs his tartan socks this his father's brother the brother of his father who sat now the dim shadow of a shade pale and apprehensive upon the sofa the brother of his father impossible how could it be possible well kid what are you staring at came suddenly to him know your old uncle again eh think you'll recognize him if you meet him in the strand eh know him anywhere won't you huh a likely kid that of yours herbert come and talk to your uncle boy come and talk to your uncle jeremy moved across the carpet slowly he was deeply embarrassed conscious of the solemn gaze of aunt amy of helen and mary a great red hand fell upon his shoulder he felt himself suddenly caught up by the slack of his pants held in mid-air then dropped cascades of laughter billowing meanwhile around him that's a fine boy eh? Huh? that's what we do to boys in new zealand to make em grow want to grow eh? Huh? be a bigger man than your father eh? well that won't be difficult anyway never were much of a size were you herbert well boy go to school yes said jeremy like it yes said jeremy 
bully the boy smaller than yourself no said jeremy bet you do i always did when i was at school any good at games no said jeremy suddenly to his own surprise determining that he would tell his uncle nothing that's like your father never any good at games were you herbert remember when we tossed in a blanket and your head bumped on the ceiling mr cole gave a sickly smile that was a lark i can see it as though it were yesterday with your legs sticking out of your nightdress luckily at this point tea arrived and every one was very busy uncle percy sat down and then was suddenly aware of helen she was looking her prettiest in her blue silk she knew better than to push herself forward she had waited patiently through all the examination of jeremy certain that her time would come and it did well there's a pretty one he jerked his great body upwards why i hardly saw you just now and you're helen yes uncle she smiled that smile so beautifully designed for worthwhile relations he stared at her with all his eyes why you're a beauty pon my soul you are come and sit here beside your old uncle and tell him how all the boys run after you i'm sure they do if boys are still the same as when i was young come along now and tell me all about it helen demurely came forward sat beside her uncle and answered his questions with exactly the right mixture of deference and humour she brought him his tea and his cake and was the perfect hostess a much better hostess as jeremy noticed than her mother and noticing it hated her for it two before twenty-four hours had passed uncle percy had made his mark not only upon his own family but upon polchester one walk up the high street and every one was asking who was that big red-faced man but it was not only that he was big and red-faced he moved with such complete assurance he was more like our archdeacon brandon though of course not nearly so handsome than any one who had been to our town for years he had just the archdeacon's confidence it would have been interesting to watch the two men together he took charge of the cole family in simply no time at all for one thing he smoked all over the house uncle samuel had been hitherto the only smoker in the family household and it was understood that he smoked only in his studio but uncle percy smoked everywhere and cigars and big black terribly smelling cigars too he appeared on the very first morning just as the bell rang for breakfast clad only in a dressing-gown with a great deal of red chest exposed and thus confronted aunt amy on the way to dining-room prayer he arrived for breakfast an hour late and ordered fresh tea he sat in his brother's study most of the morning talking and smoking he forced his way into uncle samuel's studio and laughed at his pictures of course uncle samuel was in london call them pictures he cried all through luncheon those daubs of paint why i could do better myself if i shut my eyes and splashed colour ink on the canvas and i know something about painting mind you wasn't a bad hand myself at it once gave it up cause i hadn't time to waste call them pictures for this aunt amy almost forgave him his naked chest it's what i've always said she remarked only no one would listen to me samuel's pictures are folly folly during the first day both hamlet and jeremy were fascinated hamlet recovered from his first fit of horror smelt something in the stockings and knickerbockers in which uncle percy now appeared that fascinated him he followed those stockings all around the house his nose just a little ahead of his body and he had to move quickly because uncle percy was never still for a moment uncle percy of course laughed at hamlet call that a dog he cried i call it a dog fight and laughed immoderately but hamlet bore him no grudge with his beard projecting and his eyes intent on the pursuit he followed the stockings such a smell and such calves both smell and calves were new in his experience to lick the one and bite the other what a glorious ambition jeremy on his part was at the beginning dazzled he had never before seen such superb despotism for those twenty-four hours he admired it all immensely the unceasing flow of words the knowledge of every imaginable quarter of the globe the confident unfaltering answer to every possible question the definite assumption of universal superiority the absence of every doubt 
hesitation or shyness jeremy was as yet no analyzer of human nature but young as he was he knew his own shyness awkwardness and reticences and for twenty-four hours he did wish he were like his uncle percy he even envied his calves and looked at his own in his bedroom looking-glass to see how they were getting along it cannot however be denied that every member of the cole family went that night to bed feeling desperately weary it was as though they had spent a day with a thunderstorm or sat for twelve hours in the very middle of niagara falls or lodged for an hour or two in the west tower of the cathedral amongst the bells they were tired their bedrooms seemed to them strangely almost ominously silent it was as though they had passed quite suddenly into a deaf and mute world on the second day it might have been noticed had there been any one here or there especially observant that uncle percy was beginning to be bored he looked around him for some fitting entertainment and discovered his brother herbert although it was twenty years since he had seen his brother it was remarkable with what swiftness he had slipped back into his childhood attitude towards him he had laughed at him then and he laughed at him now with twice his original heartiness because herbert was a clergyman and clergymen seemed to uncle percy very laughable things our colonies promote a director form of contact between individuals than is our custom at home it is a true word that there are no frills in the colonies you let a man know what you think of him for good or ill without any disguise uncle percy let his brother know what he thought of him at once and he let everyone else know too and this was for his brother a very painful experience the rev herbert cole had been brought up in seclusion people had taken from the first trouble that his feelings should not be hurt and when it was understood that he was destined for the ministry a mysterious veil had been drawn in order that for the rest of his days he never should see things as they were no one for twenty long years had been rude to him if he wanted to be angry he was angry if things were wrong he said so if he felt ill he said so if he had a headache he said so and if he felt well he didn't say so quite as often as he might have done he believed himself to be a good honest god-fearing man and on the whole he was so but he did not know what he would be were anyone rude to him he did not know until percy came to stay with him he had of course disliked percy when they were small boys together but that was so long ago that he had forgotten all about it and during the first twenty-four hours he put everything down to percy's high animal spirits and delight at being home again and pleasure at being with his relations it was not until luncheon on the second day that he began to realize what was happening over the chops he said something in his well-known definite authoritative manner about the church not standing it and the sooner those infidels in africa realized it the better bosh said uncle percy bosh my dear percy began mr cole don't dear percy me came from the other end of the table i say it's bosh what do you know of africa or of the church for the matter of that you've never been outside this piffling little town for twenty years and wouldn't have noticed anything if you had that's the worst of you miserable parsons never seeing anything of life or the world and then laying down the law as though you were god almighty it fair makes me sick but you were always like that herbert even as a boy you'd hide behind some woman's skirts and then lay claim to someone else's actions don't you talk about africa herbert you know nothing about it whatever here helen my girl pass up the potatoes had a large iron thunderbolt crashed through the ceiling and broken the room to pieces consternation could not have been more general mr cole at first simply did not believe the evidence of his ears then as it slowly dawned upon him that his brother had really said these things and before a mixed company emily was at that moment handing around the cabbage a dull pink flush stole slowly over his cheeks and ended in fiery crimson at the tips of his ears mrs cole and amy were of course devastated but dreadful was the effect upon the children three pairs of eyes turned instantly towards mr cole and then hurriedly withdrew mary attacked once again the bone of her chop already sufficiently cleaned 
Helen gazed at her uncle, her eyes full of a lovely investigating interest. Jeremy stared at the tablecloth. He could not at once realize what had occurred. He had been accustomed for so long now to hear his father speak with authority upon every conceivable topic and remain uncontradicted. Even when visitors came, and they were so often curates, his opinions were generally confirmed with a, a quite so, or is that so indeed, or yes, yes, quite. His first interest now was to see how his father would reply to this attack. They all waited. Mr. Coles feebly smiled. No, T.T., violent as ever, Percy. I dare say you're correct. Of course I never was in Africa. Capitulation. Complete capitulation. Jeremy's cheeks burnt hot with family shame. Was nobody going to stand up to the attack? Were they to allow it to pass like that? They were, apparently. The subject was changed. Bread and butter pudding arrived. The world went on. Uncle Percy himself had no conception that anything unusual had occurred. He had been shouting people down and bullying them for years. Something subconsciously told him that his brother was going to be easy game. Perhaps deep down in that mighty chest of his, something chuckled, and that was all. But for Jeremy, that was not all. He went up to his room and considered the matter. Readers of this chronicle, and the one that preceded it, will be aware that his relations with his father had not been altogether happy ones. He had not quite understood his father, and his father had not quite understood him, but he had always felt awe of his father, and had cherished the belief that he must be infinitely wise. Uncle Samuel was wise too, but in quite another way. Uncle Samuel was closer, far closer, and he could talk intimately to him about every sort of thing, but people laughed at Uncle Samuel quite openly, and said he was no good, and Uncle Samuel himself confessed this. His father had been remote, august, Olympian. It was true that last Christmas he had hit his father and tried to bite him, but that had been in a fit of rage that was madness, neither more nor less. When you were mad, you might do anything. His father had been august. But now? Jeremy dared not look back over the luncheon scene, dared not face once again the nervous flush, the silly laugh, the feeble retort. His father was a coward, and the honor of the family was at stake. After that luncheon outburst, however, the situation moved so swiftly that it went far beyond poor Jeremy. I don't suppose that Uncle Percy was aware of anything very much save his own happiness and comfort, but to any outsider it would have seemed that he now gave up the whole of his time and energy to baiting his brother. He was not a bad man, nor deliberately unkind, but he loved to have someone to tease, as the few women for whom in his life he had cared had discovered in time to save themselves from marrying him. I say that he was unconscious of what he was doing, and so in a fashion was the Cole family unconscious. That is, Mrs. Cole and Aunt Amy and the children realized that Uncle Percy was being rude, but they did not realize that the work of years was, in a few days, being completely undone. So used to custom and tradition are we that in our daily life we will accept almost any figure in the condition in which we receive it, and then proceed to add our own little story to the structure already presented to us. Mrs. Cole did not wish, Aunt Amy even did not wish, to see their Herbert a fool. Very much better for their daily life and happiness that he should not be one, and yet in a short two days that was what he was, so that Aunt Amy, without realizing it, spoke sharply to him, and Mrs. Cole disagreed with him about the weather prospects. Of course, the women did their best to stand up for him and defend him in his weak attempts at resistance, but after all, Percy was a visitor and wouldn't be here for long, and hadn't been home for such a time that naturally his way of looking at things couldn't be quite ours. And then, at Sunday supper, they were forced to laugh against their will, but one was glad of anything by Sunday evening to make things a little bright, 
at percy's account of herbert when he was a boy tumbling out of the wagonette on a picnic and nobody missing him until they got home that night it was funny as percy told it poor herbert running after the wagonette and shouting and nobody noticing and then losing himself and not getting home until midnight aunt amy was forced to laugh until she cried and even mrs cole regarding her husband with tender affection said so like you herbert dear not to ask somebody the way the only member of the family who did not see something funny in all of this was jeremy he was conscious only of his father he was aware exactly of how he was feeling he so thoroughly himself detested being laughed at especially when it was two to one and now it was about five to one as he watched his father's white face with the slow flushes rising and falling the pale nervous eyes wandering in their gaze from place to place the expression of bewilderment as uncle percy's loud tones surged up to him submerged him and then slowly withdrew jeremy was reminded of his own first evening at thompson's when in the dormitory he had been suddenly delivered up to a wild troop of savages who knew neither law nor courtesy as it had been with him then so was it with his father now uncle percy had all the monotony of the unimaginative one idea was enough for him and his idea just now was to take it out of old herbert i can only repeat that he did not mean it unkindly he thought that he was being vastly amusing for the benefit of those poor dull women who never had any fun from one year's end to the other his verdict after he had left him and gone on somewhere else would be well i gave those poor mugs a merry week hard work but one must do one's best meanwhile jeremy watched his father three soon he saw his father hurrying off book under his arm umbrella in hand where are you going father to the gray bank schools i'll walk up with you well hurry then i haven't much time he did not reveal his surprise it was the first time in all their lives together that jeremy had suggested going with him anywhere they set off together it was a fine day of early autumn red mist and faint blue sky leaves thick upon the ground the air peppermint in the mouth jeremy had to walk fast to keep pace with his father's long strides mr cole suddenly said i've got a headache a, a bad headache it's better out of the house than in in every way it was better as jeremy knew during luncheon just concluded uncle percy had roared with laughter over his memories of what herbert was like when as a small boy in the middle of the night he thought he heard a burglar when does uncle percy go father well i thought he was going the day after tomorrow but now he thinks he'll stay another week i don't like uncle percy father jeremy panted a little with his efforts to keep up oh you mustn't say that my boy it doesn't matter if i say it to you was he like he is now when he was young yes very much but you must remember that it was a long time ago i don't quite clearly recollect my childhood nor i think does he his mr cole coughed we never had very much in common as boys he said suddenly he doesn't know much about england does he father he says the most awfully silly things you mustn't say that about your uncle my boy no but he does why he hasn't been anywhere in england not even to drymouth no my boy he hasn't you see when people have lived in the colonies all their lives they get a little um, um out of touch yes father delightful to think of uncle percy being out of touch quite a savage a barbarian father and son laughed a little together i bet the boys at thompson's would laugh at him said jeremy like anything one has to be polite said mr cole after all he is our guest don't forget that my boy no father i bet he was frightened at the burglar father more than you were well as a matter of fact jeremy he was i remember the incident perfectly percy hid in a cupboard he's forgotten that i've no doubt father and son laughed it would have to be a very large cupboard father said jeremy and then they laughed again 
here they were at the schools where mr cole was going to teach the little girls their catechism they parted and jeremy ran all the way down the hill home four uncle percy loved the world and desired that in natural return the world should love him it seemed to him that the world did so once and again the net of his jollity and fun seemed to miss some straggling fish who gaped and then swam away but he was of that happy temperament thus described by one of the most lovable of our modern poets who bears in mind misfortunes gone must live in fear of more the happy man whose heart is light gives no such shadows power he bears in mind no haunting past to start his week on monday no graves are written on his mind to visit on a sunday he lives his life by days not years each day's a life complete which every morning finds renewed with temper calm and sweet how could the world help but love him jolly amiable sensible man that he was but once and again once and again and so now it was and the fish that was eluding him was young jeremy cole on the seventh or eighth day he was aware of it at breakfast he looked across the table and saw the small square-shaped boy gravely winking at mary why was he winking at his sister it could not be surely it could not be because of anything that he himself had said and yet looking behind him so to speak he could not remember that any one else had been talking this was enough to make him think and thinking it occurred to him that that small boy had from the very first been aloof and reserved not natural for small boys to be reserved with jolly uncles and it was not as though the boy were in general a reserved child no he had heard him laughing and jumping about the house enough to bring the roof down playing around with that dog of his quite a normal sporting boy come to think of it the best of the family by far the best of the family you'd never think to look at him that he was herbert's son therefore after breakfast in the hall he cried in his jolly hearty tones i say jeremy what do you say to taking your old uncle round the town this morning eh? showing him the shops and things what might be something we'd like to buy jeremy was halfway up the stairs he came slowly down again on the bottom step looking very gravely at his uncle he said i'm very sorry uncle percy but i'm going to school to-morrow morning and i promised mother but mrs cole was at this moment coming out of the dining-room looking up and smiling she said oh never mind jeremy go with uncle percy this morning dear i can manage about the shirts jeremy appeared not to have heard his mother i'm sorry i can't go out this morning uncle percy there's my holiday task too i've got to swat at it and then turned and slowly disappeared round the corner of the staircase uncle percy was chagrined really he was he stood with his large body balanced on his large legs hesitating in the hall it is his last morning percy said mrs cole looking a little distressed he's a funny child he's always making his own plans obstinate that's what i call it said uncle percy damned obstinate he went out that morning alone he thought that he would buy something for the kid something really rich and impressive it could not be that the boy disliked him and yet all that morning he was haunted by the boy's presence going to school to-morrow was he not much time left for making an impression he could not find anything that morning that would precisely do rotten shops the polchester ones he would tip the boy handsomely to-morrow morning no boy could resist that really handsomely as he had never been tipped before nothing further occurred to him and that evening he was especially funny about his brother that story of herbert when he was round fifteen and quite a grown boy being afraid of a dog chained up in a yard and how he percy made herbert go and stroke it how herbert trembled and how his knees shook oh it was funny it was indeed you'd have roared had you seen it percy roared roared until the table shook beneath him but to-night for some reason or another herbert did not seem to mind 
he laughed gently and admitted that he was still afraid of dogs bulldogs especially uncle percy had jeremy in his mind all that evening he caught him once again by the slack of his breeches and swung him in the air just to show what a jolly pleasant uncle he was when mrs cole explained that always on jeremy's last evening she read to him in the schoolroom after supper he said that he would come too and sat there in an easy chair watching benevolently the children grouped in the firelight round their mother while the chaplet of pearls unfolded its dramatic course a charming picture and the boy really looked delightful gazing into the fire his head against his mother's knee uncle percy almost wished that he himself had married nice to have children a home somewhere to come to and so fell asleep and soon was snoring so loudly that mrs cole had to raise her voice next morning there was all the bustle of jeremy's departure this was not so dramatic as other departures had been because jeremy was now so thoroughly accustomed to school-going and indeed could not altogether conceal from the world at large that this was football time the time of his delight and pride and happiness he went as usual into his father's study to say good-bye but on this occasion for some strange reason there was no stiffness nor awkwardness both were at their ease as they had never been together before mr cole put his hand on the boy's shoulder mind you get into the football team he said if i don't you won't mind father will you said jeremy looking very fine indeed in a new light gray overcoat i know you'll do your best my boy said mr cole and kissed him outside in the hall with the others was uncle percy he motioned to him mysteriously I, I say kid come here jeremy followed him into the dining room where they were alone uncle percy shut the door here's something for you my boy to take back to school uh, buy something you want with it and remember your uncle isn't such a bad sort after all jeremy crimsoned up to the tips of his ears on the red palm of his uncle's big hand there were lying three golden sovereigns no thank you uncle what no thank you uncle i've got father gave me i don't want you won't take it you, you won't no thank you uncle but what the devil jeremy turned away his uncle caught him by the shoulder now what's this all about a boy of your age refuse a tip now what does this mean jeremy wriggled himself free suddenly he said hotly father's as good as you every bit as good even though you have been everywhere and he hasn't people like father awfully in polchester and they say his sermons are better than anybody's father's just as good as you are i and then suddenly burst from the room uncle percy stood there this may be said to have been the greatest shock of his life the boy's father what was he talking about the boy's father as good as he was the boy hated him so much that he wouldn't even take the money three pounds and he wouldn't take it wouldn't take money from him because he hated him so but hang it lord how that dog was howling what a horrible noise what was he howling for wouldn't take the money but had anybody ever heard the like but hang it three pounds end of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of Jeremy and Hamlet by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: The Runaways. One. Jeremy, on his return to Thompson's that term, found that he had been changed to what was known as the baby dorm. Hitherto, he had been in a perfect barrack of a dormitory that contained at least twenty beds. The baby dorm was a little room with three beds, and it was a distinction to be there a true sign that you were rising in the world this was fully appreciated by jeremy and when he also discovered that his two companions were pug rakes and stokelsley mage the cup of his joy was full rakes and stokelsley were just the companions he would have chosen short of course of riley but riley was away in the other wing of the house protecting to his infinite boredom some new kids 
there was no hope of his company rakes and stokesley were both older than jeremy they had been at thompson's a year longer than he pug rakes was a fat round boy rather like tommy winchester at home it was said that he could eat more at one go than any three boys at thompson's put together but with all his fat he was no mean sportsman he was the best fives player in the school and quite a good bat he had an invaluable character for games nothing disturbed him he was imperturbable through every crisis he had been bitten once in the hand by a ferret and had not uttered a sound stokesley was opposite from rakes in every way except that he was a good cricketer and perhaps it was this very attraction of their opposites that brought them together they had been quite inseparable ever since their first suffering from tossing in the same blanket on the first night of their arrival at thompson's two and a half years ago stokesley was a very good-looking boy thin and tall straight and strong with black eyes black hair and thick eyebrows he was known as eyebrows among his friends he was as excitable as rakes was apparently phlegmatic he was always up to some new plot or fantasy always in hot water always extricating himself from the same with the airs of a spanish grandee it was rumoured that thompson was afraid of his father who was a baronet thirty years ago baronets counted jeremy would never have been admitted into their friendship had it not been for his football they considered him a plucky little devil and prophesied that he would go far they were a little condescending of course and the first night stokesley addressed him thus look here young stocky it's jolly lucky for you being in with us none of your cheek and if you snore you know what you'll get you don't walk in your sleep do you no i don't said jeremy well if you do you'll have the surprise of your life won't he pug rather said rakes and remember you're playing footer this term for the honour of this dorm if you play badly you'll get it like anything in here afterwards however in a night or two there was very little to choose between them boys are extraordinarily susceptible to atmosphere during the cricket term young cole had been of no account at all quite a decent kid but no use at cricket but before the autumn term was a week old he was spoken of as the probable scrum half that year kid though he was stokesley was in the first fifteen as a forward but his place was a little uncertain and pug rakes was nowhere near the first fifteen at all and cared nothing for football it happened therefore that jeremy was soon taken into the confidences of the two older boys and very exciting confidences they were stokesley was never happy unless he had some new scheme on foot some of them were merely silly and commonplace like dressing up as ghosts and frightening the boys in the lower dorm or putting white mice in the french master's desk but he had at times impulses of real genius like the pirate society of which there is no space here to tell or the cribber's kitchen a rollicking affair that gave thompson the fits for a whole week jeremy managed to keep himself out of most of these adventures he had the gift of concentrating utterly on the matter at hand and the matter in hand this term was getting into the first fifteen he went in most conscientiously for training running round big field before first hour refusing various foods that he longed to enjoy and refusing to smoke blotting paper on sunday afternoon in parker's wood people jeered at him for all this seriousness and had he made a public business of his sporting conscience he might have earned a good deal of unpopularity but he said very little about it and behaved in every way like an ordinary mortal luckily for him his schoolwork that term was easy he had been for two terms in the lower fourth and now was near the top of it and inevitably at the end of this term would be moved out of it malcolm his former master liked him being himself a footballer of no mean size it was not therefore until the end of the first fortnight that jeremy discovered that something very serious was going forward between his two dormitory companions something in which he was not asked to share they whispered together continually and the whispering took the form of stokesley persuading pug over and over again oh come on pug don't spoil sport you're afraid yes you are you're a funk 
I can't do it without you. Of course I can't. We'll never have a chance again. At last, Jeremy, who had more than his natural share of curiosity, could endure it no longer. He sat on the edge of his bed, kicking his naked toes, and cried, I say, you two, what's all this about? You might let me in. It's nothing to do with you, Stocky. You go to sleep. You'd much better tell me. You know I never sneak. This is too important to let a kid like you know about it. I'm not such a kid. If it comes to that, perhaps I can help. No, you can't. You shut your mouth and go to sleep. Two nights later than this, however, Jeremy was told. I'm going to tell Stocky, said Rakes, and see what he says. Oh, all right, said Stokesley in the sulks. I don't care what you do. Jeremy sat up in his bed and listened. The whispering voices stole on and on, one voice supplementing the other. Soon Stokesley overbore the other and was dominant. Jeremy distrusted his ears. Beyond the window, the night was lovely, a clean sweep of dark velvety sky with two treetops and a single star, so quiet, not a sound anywhere. And this adventure was the most audacious conceived of by man, neither more nor less than to run away to sea, to anywhere, but before finally vanishing, to have a week, a fortnight, a month in London at the very finest hotels, with heaps to eat and drink and theatres every night. You see, explained Stokesley eagerly, warmed up now by the narration of his idea, we're sick of this place. It's so dull. You must feel that yourself, Stocky, even with your beastly football. Nothing ever happens, and it's ages before we go to rugby. You'd much better come, too. Of course, you're a bit young, but they'll probably want a cabin boy on the ship, and then we'll be in the South Seas, where you bathe all the time, and can shy at coconuts, and there are heaps and heaps of monkeys, and you shoot tigers, and he paused for breath a cabin boy had it not been one of his earliest dreams his mind flew back to that day now so long ago when he had begged the sea captain to take him the sea captain his heart beat thickly then came the practical side of him but won't you want an awful lot of money he asked oh we've thought of that of course said stokesley my father gave me five pounds to come back with and pug's uncle gave him two and his aunt gave him another and his cousin gave him ten and six and i've got my gold watch and chain which will mean a tenner at least and pug's got his gold pin that his dead uncle gave him altogether it will be about fifteen pounds anyway and it'll cost us about a pound a day in london and then we'll go to southampton and go to a boat and say we want to work our way and of course they'll let us pug and i are awfully strong and you you carry the plates and things london it was the first time in all his life that that place had been brought within his reach of course he had heard the grown-ups mention it but always as something mysterious far away magical london he had never conceived that he himself would one day set foot in it how his world was extending first simply the house then polchester then raphael and carleon then thompson's then craxton and now london nevertheless he was still practical how will you get to the station he asked oh we've thought all about it it will be a sunday probably next sunday we're allowed off all the afternoon and there's a train at sarabi junction that goes to london at four o'clock we'll be in london by seven if they catch you said jeremy slowly there'll be the most awful row of course said stokesley contemptuously but they won't how can they we'll be in london by call over and we'll move to different hotels and as soon as we think they're on to us we'll be off to southampton there are boats go every day it was plain that rakes was caught more and more deeply as stokesley developed the plan jeremy himself felt to the full the wonderful adventure of it the trouble was that now at once as soon as you had heard of it the school looked dull and stupid it had been all right as he came up to bed he had been contented and happy, but now a longing for freedom surged through him, and for a moment he would like to climb through that window and run and run and run. But the football saved him. If he went on this adventure, he would never be half-back for the school. He would never be half-back for any school. He would, in all probability, never play football again. They did not play football in the South Seas. It was too hot. 
what was bathing compared with football i don't think i'll come he said slowly i'd only be in your way of course if you funk it said stokesley hotly i don't funk it but there was a knock on the door and one of the junior masters walked in that's enough talking you kids he said if there's another word you'll hear of it they lay then like images two we all know how adventures aspirations longings that seem quite reasonable and attainable in the evening light are absurdly impossible in the morning cold jeremy next morning as he ran round the football ground felt that he could not have heard stokely right it was the kind of story that the dormitory tale-teller retailed before people dropped off to sleep stokesley was just inventing he could not have meant a word of it nevertheless later in the day rakes took him into a corner of the playground and whispered dramatically we're going to do it it's all settled oh gasped jeremy it'll be next sunday you're right about not coming you're too young rakes sounded very old indeed as he said this you swear you won't tell a living soul of course i won't you'll swear by god almighty i swear by god almighty never to breathe a word to any boy master or animal never to breathe a word to any boy master or animal you're a good sort stocky somehow one can trust you and one cannot most of them they'll be on to you after we've gone you know i don't care they'll try to get it out of you i don't care they shan't in any way they can perhaps they'll stop your football jeremy drew a deep breath i don't care he repeated slowly we'll have a great time rake said as though addressing his reluctant half we'll come back ever so rich in a year or two and then won't you wish you'd come with us what jeremy did wish was that they had told him nothing about it oh how he wished it why had they dragged him in suppose they did stop his football oh but they couldn't it wasn't his fault that he'd heard about it look here rakes he said don't you tell me any more i don't want to know anything about it then they can't come on me afterwards well that sound said rakes all right we won't the day then that intervened before sunday could have only one motive it seemed incredible to jeremy that the two conspirators should appear now so ordinary they should have had in some way a flaring mark a scarlet letter to set them aside from the rest of mankind not at all they followed their accustomed duties ate their meals did their impositions played their games just as they had always done even at night when they were left alone in the dormitory they spoke very little about it jeremy was outside it now and although they trusted him one never knew and they were not going to give anything away the great sunday came a day of blazing autumnal gold enough breeze to stir the leaves and send them like ragged scraps of brown paper lazily through the air the sunday bells came like challenges to guilty consciences upon the misty sky jeremy did not see the two of them after breakfast indeed in the strange way that these terrific events have of suddenly slipping for half an hour from one's consciousness during the morning chapel he forgot about the whole affair and stared half asleep through the long chapel window out into the purple field wondering about a thousand little things some lines he had to write a pot of jam that he was going to open that night at tea for the first time and how hamlet was in polchester and what just then he would be doing he went his accustomed sunday walk with riley and it was only when they were hurrying back over the leaf-thickened paths towards a sun like a red orange that he suddenly remembered why at this very moment they would be making for the station he stopped in the path by gum he said what is it asked riley been stung by a bee no just thought of something you do look queer it's nothing he moved on it seemed impossible that the woods should stay just as they were unmoved by this great event hanging like an old colored tapestry about their thin dead leaves between the black poles of trees unmoved no one knew no one but himself the great moment came when in chapel looking across to the other side he saw that their places were empty 
nothing much in that for the ordinary world fellows are often late for chapel but for him it meant everything the deed was positively accomplished they must be actually at this moment in the train and he was the only creature in the whole school who knew where they were callover followed chapel he heard the names stokesley and then more impatiently after a little pause stokesley again then rakes and after a moment rakes again nothing after that happened for an hour then call over once more at supper rakes and stokesley again called and again absent five minutes after supper the school sergeant came for him mr thompson to see you in his study at once jeremy went thompson was walking about and very worried he looked he had been talking to the matron and wheeled round when jeremy came in ah cole uh, leave us for a moment matron please they were alone jeremy felt terribly small shrivelled to nothing at all he shuffled his feet and looked anywhere but at thompson's anxious eyes he liked thompson and was aware with a sudden flash that this was more than a mere game that it might be desperately serious for someone come here cole i want you to keep this to yourself not to say a word to anyone do you understand yes sir good it seems that stokesley and rakes have run away they were neither at chapel nor at supper some of their things are missing now you're the only other boy in their dormitory do you know anything at all about this <gasps> no sir nothing no sir they said nothing at all to you about this going no sir gave you no idea that they were thinking of it no, no sir thompson paused looked out of the window walked up and down the room a little and then said i make it a rule always to believe what any boy tells me i've never found you untruthful cole i don't say that you're not telling the truth now but i know what your boy's code is you mustn't sneak about another boy whatever happens that's a code that has something to be said for it it happens to have nothing to be said for it just now you're young and i don't expect you to realize what this means it involves many people beside themselves their fathers and mothers and everyone in this school you may be doing a very serious thing that will affect many people's lives if you don't tell me what you know do you realize that yes sir well then did they say anything at all about going away no sir nothing at all to you no sir very well you may go jeremy went outside he found the school in a ferment everybody knew stokesley and rakes had run away he was surrounded by a mob they pressed in upon him from every side big boys little boys old boys young boys everyone stocky where have they gone to what did thompson say to you did he whack you is he going to is it true that they've stolen a lot of the matron's money what did they tell you oh rod of course you know where have they gone to stocky we'll give you the most awful hiding if you don't come on stocky out with it when did they go just before chapel is thompson awfully sick but jeremy stood his ground he knew nothing at all nothing at all they had said nothing to him three during the four days that followed the characters bodies and souls of the fugitives swelled into epic proportions four days in such circumstances can at a small school resemble centuries of time no one thought or discussed anything but this and there was not a boy in the place from the eldest to the youngest but envied those two passionately and would have given a year of holiday to be with them on monday mr thompson went up to london the rumours that sprang to life were marvellous stokesley had been seen at a theatre in london and had been chased all the way down the strand by an enormous crowd rakes had struck a policeman and been put in a cell they had been to buckingham palace and interviewed her majesty they had started on a slaver for the south seas they had taken up jobs as waiters in a london restaurant to jeremy these days were torture in the first place he was dazzled by their splendour why had he been such a fool as to refuse to go with them one might die to-morrow here was his great adventure offered to him and he had rejected it as the tale circulated round him the atmosphere became more and more romantic he forgot the real stokesley and saw no longer the genuine rakes it no longer occurred to him that stokesley had warts 
He refused to see that so familiar picture of Rakes washing himself in the morning, trickling the cold water over his head, his two large ears projecting crimson. Clothed in gold and silver, they swung dazzling through the air, rosy clouds supporting them to the haven where they would be, the haven of the South Seas, with gleaming, glittering sands, blue waters, monkeys in thousands, and pearls and diamonds for the asking. Under these alluring visions, even the football faded into gray monotony. In a practice game on Monday, he played so badly that he expected to lose all chance of playing in the match at the end of the week. But fortunately for him, everyone else played badly too. The mind of the school was in London, following the flight, the chase, the final escape. No time now for football or anything else. The heroes that Stokesley and Rakes now were... Anyone who had an anecdote, however trivial, was listened to by admiring crowds. It was recalled how Stokesley, when a new boy, had endured the first tossing in the blanket with marvelous phlegm and indifference. How Rakes, when receiving a hamper from an affectionate aunt, had instantly distributed it round all his table, so that almost at once there was none of it remaining how Stokesley had once conducted a money-lending establishment with extraordinary force and daring for more than a fortnight, how Rakes had fought Bates Major, a boy almost twice his size, and had lasted into the sixth round, and so on and so on. Jeremy, of course, was affected by all this reminiscence, and himself recalled how, in the dormitory, Stokesley had said this clever thing, and Rakes had been on that occasion strangely daring but behind this romance there was something more he was strangely and as the hours advanced quite desperately bothered by the question of his lie in the first immediate instance of it he had not been bothered by it at all when he had stood in thompson's study it had not seemed to him a lie at all so thickly clothed was he by his school convention that it had seemed the natural the absolutely inevitable thing to do his duty was not to give stokely and rakes away that was all but afterwards thompson's troubled face came back to him and that serious warning that perhaps if he kept his knowledge back the lives of hundreds of people might be affected it was true that by the following morning everything that he knew was known by everyone else the station master from the junction came up after breakfast and gave information about the boys he had thought it strange that they should be going up to london by themselves but they had seemed so completely self-possessed that he had not liked simply on his own authority to stop them but had jeremy told all that he knew on that first sunday evening many precious hours might have been gained and the fugitives caught at once alone in that little dormitory at night the two empty beds staring at him he had fallen into dreams distressing accusing nightmares by tuesday morning he was not at all sure that he was not a desperate criminal worthy of prison and perhaps even of hanging he longed how desperately he longed to discuss the matter with riley riley was so full of wisdom and common sense and knew so much more than did jeremy about life in general but having gone so far he would not turn back but he moved about on that tuesday like christian with his pack then on tuesday evening came the great news they had been caught they had given themselves up they had spent all their money thompson was bringing them back with him on wednesday morning the school waited breathlessly for the arrival no one saw anything only by midday it was whispered by everyone that they were there by the afternoon it was known that they were shut away in the infirmary no one was to see them or speak to them during that morning how swiftly the atmosphere had changed only yesterday those two had been sailing for the south seas now ostracized waiting in horrible confinement for some terrible doom they were only glorious like one of byron's heroes in their damned prospects and fatal overthrow all that day jeremy thought of them feeling in some unanalyzed way as though he himself were responsible for their failure 
had he not done this had he thought of that and what would thompson do at the end of breakfast next morning it was known he made them a speech speaking with a new gravity that even the smallest boy in the school young phipps jr only about two feet high could feel he said that as was by this time known to all of them two of their number had run away had spent several days in london had been found and brought back to the school they would all understand how serious a crime this was the unhappiness that it must have brought on the boy's parents the harm that it might have done to the school itself the boys were young they had apparently no especial grievance with their school life and they had done what they had from a silly false sense of adventure rather than from any impulse of wickedness or desire for evil nevertheless they had wilfully made many people unhappy and broken laws upon whose preservation the very life of their school that they all loved depended he was not sure that they had not done even more than that he could not tell of course whether there were any boys in that room who had known of this before it occurred he hoped from the bottom of his heart that no boy had told him an untruth he knew that they had a code of their own that whatever happened they were never to tell about another boy that code had its uses but it could be carried too far all the misery of these four days might have been spared had some boy given information at once he would say no more about that the boys had been given a choice between expulsion and a public flogging they had both without hesitation chosen the flogging the whole school was to be present that evening in big hall before first preparation four every seat in big hall was filled the boys sat in classes motionless silent not even an occasional whisper the hissing of a furious gas jet near the door was the only sound jeremy would never forget that horrible half hour he was the criminal he sat there scarcely breathing his eyes hot and dry staring although he did not know that he was staring at the platform empty save for a table and a chair pressing his hands upon his knees wishing that this awful thing might pass thinking not especially of stokesley or of rakes but of something that was himself and yet not himself something that was pressed down into a dark hole and every tick of the school clock pressed him further he saw the rows and rows of heads as though they had been the pattern of a carpet and he was ashamed desperately ashamed as though he were standing up in front of them all naked the door behind the platform opened and thompson came in he was white and black and flat like a drawing upon a sheet of paper the gas gave a hysterical giggle at sight of him behind him came rakes and stokesley looking as they had always looked and yet quite different actors playing a part behind them was the school sergeant crockett a burly ex-sailorman a friend of every one when in a good temper he looked sheepish now shuffling on his feet he looked terrible too because his coat was off and his sleeves rolled up showing the ship and anchor tattoo that he showed as a favor to boys who had done their drill well thompson came forward he said i don't want to prolong this but you are all here because i wish you to remember this all your lives i wish you to remember it not because it is the punishment of two of your friends indeed it is my special wish that as soon as it is over you shall receive stokesley and rakes among you again as though nothing had occurred but i want you all from the youngest to the eldest to remember that there must be government there must be rules if men are to live in any sort of society together we owe something to ourselves we owe something to those who love us we owe something to our country and we owe something to our school we cannot lead completely selfish lives god does not mean us to do so our school is our friend we belong to it and we must be proud of it he stepped back the school sergeant came forward and whispered something to stokesley stokesley himself undid his braces his trousers fell down over his ankles he bent forward over the table hiding his face with his hands 
Jeremy could not look. He felt sick. He wanted to cry. He heard the sound of the descending birch. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Would it never end? Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. He heard the whole school draw a breath. Still he did not look. Stokesley had not made a sound. There was a pause. Still he did not look. Now Rakes was there. The birch again. One, two, three, four. Then, as though someone were tearing the wall in two, a shrill cry, Oh, oh! Horrible, beastly. He was trembling from head to foot. He was low down in that hole now, and someone was pushing the earth in over his head. And now with the switch of the birch there was a low, monotonous sobbing, and then the sharp cry again, that at this second time seemed to come from within Jeremy himself. Everything was dark. A longer pause and the shuffling of feet. It was all over, and the boys were filing out. He raised his eyes to a world of crimson and flashing lights. 5. That night they were restored to their fellow citizens. They were sitting on their beds in the baby dorm examining their wounds. Rakes could think of nothing but that he had cried. Stokesley consoled him. As a last word, he said to Jeremy, Very decent of you, Stocky, not to give us away. We won't forget it, will we, Pug? No, we won't, said Pug, a naked, writhing figure, because he was trying to see his stripes. All the same, said Stokesley, it was smart of you not to come. It was rotten, all of it. They were beastly to us at the hotel, and just took our money. We went to a rotten theater, and it rained all the time, didn't it, Pug? Beastly, said Rakes. The room was silent, so that was the end of the adventure. Jeremy, slipping off to sleep, suddenly loved the school, didn't want to leave it, no, never, saw the rooms one by one, the classroom, the dining room, big hall, Thompson, the matron, Crockett, all warm and safe and cozy. And London, swimming in rain, chasing you, hating you, catching you up at the last with a birch. Good old school. The end of that adventure. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of Jeremy and Hamlet by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. A Fine Day. 1. It was a fine day. Jeremy, waking and turning over in his bed, could see beyond and above Stokesley's slumbering form a thin strip of pale blue sky gleaming like a sudden revelation of water behind folds of amber mist. It would be a real thumping autumn day, and he was to play half for the first fifteen against the rest that afternoon. He also had three hundred lines to do for the French master that he had not even begun, and it must be handed up completed at exactly eleven-thirty that same morning. He had also every chance of swapping a silver frame containing a photograph of his Aunt Amy with Phipps Minor for a silver pencil, and he was to have half Fraisley sausage for breakfast that morning in return for mathematical favors done for him on the preceding day. As he thought of all these various things, he rolled round like a kitten in his bed, curling up as it was his pleasantest habit into a ball, so that his toes nearly met his forehead, and he was one exquisite lump of warmth. Rending through this came the harsh sound of the first bell, murmurs from other rooms, patterings down the passage, and then suddenly both Stokesley and Rakes sitting up in bed simultaneously, yawning and looking like bewildered owls. In precisely five minutes the three boys were washed, dressed, and down, herding like the rest in the long, cold classroom, waiting for callover. When they had answered their names, they slipped across the misty playground into chapel, and sat there like all their companions in a confused state of half-sleep, half-wakefulness, responding, as it were in a dream, screaming out the hymn, and then all shuffling off to breakfast again, like shadows in a Japanese pageant. It was not, in fact, until the first five minutes at breakfast when Raisley strongly resisted the appeal for half his sausage, that Jeremy woke to the full labors of the day. 
Raisley was sitting almost opposite to him, and he had a very nice sausage, large and fat and properly cracked in the middle. Jeremy's sausage was a very small one, so that whereas on other days he might have passed over the whole episode, being of a very generous nature, today he was compelled to insist on his rights. I didn't protested raisley i said you could have half a sausage if you did the sums and you only did two and a half i did them all said jeremy stoutly it wasn't my fault that that beastly fraction one was wrong i only said i'd do em i never said i'd do em right well you can jolly well come and fetch it said raisley pursuing in the circumstances the wisest plan which was to eat his sausage as fast as he could all right said jeremy indifferently you know what you'll get afterwards if you don't do what you said and this was bold of jeremy because he was smaller than raisley but he was learning already whom he might threaten and whom he might not and he knew that raisley was as terrified of physical pain as aunt amy was of a cow in a field with very bad grace raisley pushed the smaller half of the sausage across and jeremy felt that his day was well begun he did not know why but he was sure that this would be a splendid day there were days when you feel that you are under a special care of the gods and that they are arranging everything for you background incident crisis and sleep at the end in a most delightful generous fashion nothing would go wrong today on the whole human beings are divided into the two classes of those who realize when they may step out and challenge life and those to whom one occasion is very much the same as another jeremy even when he was eight years old and had sat in his sister helen's chair on his birthday morning had always realized when to step out he was going to step out now the insufferable baltimore who was a wonderful cricketer and therefore rose to great glories in the summer term but was no footballer at all and equally therefore was less than the dust in the autumn came with his watery eyes and froggy complexion to ask jeremy to lend him tuppence jeremy had at that moment threepence but there were a number of things that he intended to do with it because he detested baltimore he lent him his tuppence with the air of queen elizabeth accepting sir walter raleigh's cloak and got exquisite pleasure from doing so all these little things therefore combined to put him in the best of spirits when at half-past eleven monsieur clemenceau not then a name known the wide world over requested m cole to be kind enough to allow him to peruse the three hundred lines which should have been done several days before so admirably provided by him jeremy wore the cloak of innocence sitting in the back row of the french class with several of his dearest friends and all the class ready to support him in any direction that he might follow i beg your pardon sir jeremy said did you say three hundred lines that is the exact amount said m clemenceau that i require from you immediately i beg your pardon said jeremy politely i need not repeat said m clemenceau three hundred lines by you at once for impertinence three days previous why sir surely said jeremy you told me that i need not do them this term because no because interrupted m clemenceau at the top of a rather squeaky voice there is no because but sir began jeremy and from all sides of the class there broke out why certainly sir don't you remember and cole is quite right sir you said and i think you've forgotten sir that and it really wouldn't be fair sir if a babble arose as the boys very well knew m clemenceau had a horror of too much noise because thompson was holding a class in the next room and on two occasions that very term had sent a boy in to request that if it were possible m clemenceau might conduct his work a little more softly and this had been agony for m clemenceau's proud french spirit i will have silence he shrieked this is no one's business but mine and the young cole let no one speak until i tell them to do so now cole where are the three hundred lines there was a complete and absolute silence will you speak or will you not speak m clemenceau cried do you mean me sir asked jeremy very innocently of course i mean you 
You said, sir, no one was to speak until you told them to. Well, I tell you now. Jeremy looked very injured. I didn't understand, he said, if I could explain to you quietly. Well, you shall explain afterwards, said Monsieur Clemenceau, and Jeremy knew that he was saved because he could deal adieu with Monsieur Clemenceau by appealing to his French heart, his sense of honor, and a number of other things, and might even, with good fortune, extract an invitation to tea when Monsieur Clemenceau, in his very cosy room, had a large supply of muffins and played on the flute yes he thought to himself as they pursued up and down the classroom sometimes ten at a time and sometimes only three or four the intricacies of that french grammar that has to do with the pen of my aunt and the cat of my sister-in-law and this is going to be a splendid day two coming out of school at half-past twelve he found to his exquisite delight that there was a letter for him he was, of course, far from that grown-up attitude of terror and misgiving at the sight of the Daily Post. Not for him yet were bills and unwelcome reminiscence, broken promises and half-veiled threats. He received from his mother one letter a week, from his father perhaps three a term, and from his sister Mary an occasional confused scribbling that, like her stories, introduced so many characters one after another, that the most you obtained from them was a sense of life and of people passing, and of Mary's warm and emotional heart. Once and again he had a letter from Uncle Samuel, and these were the real glories. It was natural that on this day of days there should be such a letter. The very sight of his uncle's handwriting, a thin spidery one that was in some mysterious way charged with beauty and color, cockled his heart and made him warm all over. He sat in a corner of the playground where he was least likely to be disturbed and read it. It was as follows it began abruptly as did all uncle samuel's letters your mother has just taken your aunt amy to drymouth on a shopping expedition the house is so quiet you wouldn't know it i am painting a very nice picture of two cows in a blue field the cows are red if you were here i would put you into the picture as a dog asleep under a tree because you aren't here i have to take that wretched animal of yours and use him instead he is not nearly as like a dog as you are. I had two sausages for breakfast because your Aunt Amy is going to be away for two whole days. I generally have only one sausage, and now, just about five o'clock this evening, I shall have indigestion, which will be one more thing I shall owe your Aunt Amy. The woman came in yesterday and washed the floor of the studio. It looks beastly, but I shall soon make it dirty again, and if only you were here, it would get dirty quicker. There's a rumor that your Uncle Percy is coming back to stay with us again. I am training your dog to bite the sort of trousers that your Uncle Percy wears. I have a pair very like his, and I draw them across the floor very slowly, and make noises to your dog like a cat. The plan is very successful, but tomorrow there won't be any trousers, and I shall have to think of something else. Mrs. Sampson asked your mother whether she thought that I would like to paint a portrait of her little girl. I asked your mother how much money Mrs. Sampson would give me for doing so, and your mother asked Mrs. Sampson. Mrs. Sampson said that if she liked it, when it was done, she'd hang it up in her drawing room where everybody could see, and that that would be such a good advertisement for me that there wouldn't need to be any payment. So I told your mother to tell Mrs. Sampson that I was so busy sweeping a crossing just now that I was afraid I wouldn't have time to paint her daughter. When I have done these cows, if they turn out really well, perhaps I'll send the best of them to Mrs. Sampson and tell her that that's the best portrait of her daughter I was capable of doing. Some people in Paris like my pictures very much, and two of them have been hanging in an exhibition, and people have to pay to go in and see them. I sold one of them for fifty pounds, and therefore I enclose a little bit of paper, which, if you take it to the right person, will help you buy enough sweets to make yourself sick for a whole week. Don't tell your mother I've done this. Your sister Mary is breaking out into spots. She has five on her forehead. I think it's because she sucks her pencil so hard. 
your sister barbara tumbled all the way down the stairs yesterday but didn't seem to mind she is the best of the family and shortly i intend to invite her into the studio and let her lick my paint box outside my window at this moment there is an apple tree and the hills are red the same color as the apples someone is burning leaves and the smoke turns red as it gets high enough and then comes white again when it gets near the moon which is a new one and exactly like one of your aunt amy's eyelashes i am getting so fat that i think of living in a barrel as a very famous man about whom i'll tell you one day used to do i think i'll have a barrel with a lid on the top of it so that when people come into the studio whom i don't want to see i shall just shut the lid and they won't know i'm there i think i'll have the barrel painted bright blue your dog thinks there's a rat just behind my bookcase he lies there for hours at a time purring like a kettle there may be a rat but knowing life as well as i do there never is a rat where you most expect one that's one of the things your father hasn't learnt yet he is writing his sermon in his study if he knew there weren't any rats he wouldn't write so many sermons i've been reading a very funny book by a man called france and the funny thing is that he's also a frenchman isn't that a funny thing you shall read it one day when you're older and then you'll understand your uncle samuel better than you do now well good-bye i hope you're enjoying yourself and haven't entirely forgotten your uncle p s i promise you that the lid shall never be on the barrel when you're there and if you don't get too fat there's room for two inside he read the letter through three times before finishing with it then sitting forward on the old wooden bench scarred with a thousand pen-knives he went over the delicious details of it how exactly uncle samuel realized the things he would want to know no one else in the family wrote about anything that was exciting or intriguing uncle samuel managed in some way to make you see things the studio the sky with the little moon the red apples hamlet flat on the floor his head rigid his eyes fixed aunt amy shopping in drymouth barbara tumbling downstairs that whole world came towards him and filled the playground and blotted out the school so that for a moment school life was unreal shadowy and did not matter he sighed with happy contentment young though he was he realized that great truth that one person in the world is quite enough one human being who understands your strange mixture equalizes five million who think you are simply black white or purple all you want is to be reassured about your own suspicions of yourself a devoted dog is almost enough and one friend ample jeremy went into dinner with his head in the air trailing after him like peter pan one shadow of the world immediately around him the world in which the school sergeant was carving the mutton at the end of the table so ferociously that it might have been the corpse of his dearest enemy and the masters at the high table were getting fried potatoes and the boys only boiled and jeremy was not having even those because he got to play football in an hour's time and the other world where there was aunt amy's eyelash high in the air and the cathedral bells ringing and uncle samuel's painting cows jeremy would have liked to consider the strange way in which these two worlds refused to mingle to have developed the idea of uncle samuel carving the mutton instead of the sergeant and the sergeant watching the evening sky instead of uncle samuel and why it was that these two things were so impossible his attention was occupied by the fact that plummy smith who was a fat boy was sitting in his wrong place and making a squash on jeremy's side of the table which led quite naturally to the game of trying to squeeze plummy from both ends of the table into a purple mass and to do it without thompson noticing little pathetic squeals came from plummy who loved his food and saw his mutton mysteriously whisk away on to some other plate and knew that he would be hungry all the afternoon in consequence he was one of those boys who had on the first day of his arrival a year earlier unfortunately confided to those whom he thought his friends that he lived with two aunts maria and alice his fate was sealed from the moment of that unfortunate confidence he did not know it and he had been in puzzled bewilderment ever since as to why the way of life was made so hard for him 
he meant no one any harm and could not understand why the lower half of his person should be a constant receptacle for pins of the sharpest kind the point in this matter about jeremy was that as with miss jones years before he could not resist pleasant fun at the expense of the foolish he had enough of the wild animal in him to enjoy sticking pins into plummy to enjoy squeezing the breath out of his fat body to enjoy seeing him without any mutton and yet had it been really brought home to him that plummy was a miserable boy sick for his aunts dazed and puzzled spending his days in an orgy of ink impositions and physical pain he would have been horrified that himself could be such a cad he was not a cad it was a fine day he was in splendid health and spirits he had a letter from uncle samuel and so he stuck pins into plummy when the meal was over he walked down to the football ground with riley and told him about uncle samuel he told riley everything and riley told him everything he never considered riley as an individual human being but rather as part of himself so that if he were kicked in the leg it must hurt riley too and there was something in riley's funny freckled forehead his large mouth and his funny clumsy ways of walking as though he were a baby elephant that was as necessary to jeremy and his daily life as putting on his clothes and going to sleep he showed riley the piece of paper that uncle samuel had sent to him by gosh said riley that's a pound it's an awful pity said jeremy that you are not in little dorm perhaps you could come in to-night i'm sure stokesley and pug wouldn't mind we're going to have sardines and marmalade and doughnuts if i get a chance i will said riley but i don't want to be caught out just now because i've been in two rows already this week perhaps you could keep two sardines for me and i'll have them at breakfast to-morrow all right i'll try said jeremy he looked about and sniffed the air it was an ideal day for football it was cold and not too cold the hills above the football field were veiled in mist the ground was soft but not too soft it ought to be a good game do you feel all right asked riley they proceeded in the accustomed manner to test this jeremy hurled himself at riley caught him round the middle tried to twine his legs around riley's and they both fell to the ground they rolled there like two puppies jeremy exerted all his strength to bring off what he had never yet succeeded in doing namely to turn riley over and pin his elbows to the ground riley wriggled like a fish jeremy was very strong to-day and managed to get one elbow down and was in a very good way towards the other when they heard an awful voice above them and what may this be they scrambled to their feet flushed and breathless and there was old thompson staring at them very gravely in that way that he had so that you could not tell whether he were displeased or no we were only wrestling sir said jeremy panting excellent thing for your clothes said thompson what do you suppose the gym is for well, it was only a minute sir said riley cole wanted to see whether he was all right and he is asked thompson jeremy perceived that olympus was smiling i'm a little out of breath he said but of course it's just after dinner the ground isn't muddy yet you'd better wait until you're in football things thompson said then you can roll about as much as you like he walked away rolling a little as he went the two boys looked after him and suddenly adored him their feelings about him were always undergoing lightning changes at one moment they adored at another they detested at another they admired from a distance and at another they wondered wasn't that decent of him said riley that's because he's just had his dinner said jeremy it's his glass of beer my uncle's just the same oh you and your uncle said riley i'll race you to the end of the playground they ran like hares and jeremy led by a second three he was in the changing room when suddenly the atmosphere of the coming game was close upon him he had that strange mixture of fear and excitement terror and pleasure he suddenly felt cold in his jersey and shorts and shivered a little 
at the other end of the room was turnbull one of the three quarters playing for the rest a large bony boy with projecting knees the mere thought that he would have in all probability to collar turnbull and bring him to the ground made jeremy feel sick his confidence suddenly deserted him he knew that he was going to play badly worse than ever in his life before he wished that he could suddenly develop scarlet fever and be carried off to the infirmary he even searched his bare legs for spots he had rather a headache and his throat felt queer and he was not at all sure that he could see straight one of those silly fools who always comes and talks to you at the wrong moment sniggered and said he felt awfully fit it was all right for him he was one of the forwards playing for the rest it would be perfectly easy for him to hide himself in the scrum and pretend to be pushing when he was not no one ever noticed but the isolation of a half was an awful thing to consider and that desperate moment when you had to go down to the ball with at least five hundred enormous boots all coming at your head at the same moment was horrible to contemplate millet the scrum half playing for the rest and jeremy's bitterest rival for the place in the fifteen was looking supremely self-confident and assured certainly he was not as good as jeremy on jeremy's day but was this jeremy's day no most certainly it was not they went out to the field and everything was not improved by the fact that a large crowd was gathered behind the ropes to watch them this was an important game the big school match was a fortnight from today and millet might get his colors on today's game quite easily and then suddenly the feel of the turf under his feet the long sweeping distance of the good gray sky above his head the tang of autumn in the air brought him confidence again he was not aware that a lady visitor who had come out with mr thompson to watch the game was saying at that moment why what a tiny boy you don't mean to say mr thompson that he's going to play with all those big fellows and thompson said he's the most promising footballer we have in the school the half-back has to be small you know oh i do hope he won't get hurt said the lady visitor won't do him any harm if he is said mr thompson the whistle went and the game began almost at once jeremy was in trouble within the first minute the school fifteen were lining out in their own half of the field and a moment later some of the rest forwards had broken through dribbled tried to pass thrown forward and there was a scrum within jeremy's twenty-five this is the kind of thing to make you show your mettle to be attacked before you have found your atmosphere realized the conditions of the day got your feel of yourself as part of the picture gained your first win to have to fight for your team's life with your own goal looming like the gallows just behind you and to know that the loss of three or five points in the first few minutes of the game is very often a decisive factor in the issue of the battle all these tests anybody's greatness jeremy in that first five minutes was anything but great he had a consciousness of his own miserable inadequacy a state not common to him at all he seemed to be one large cranium spread out balloon-wise for the onrush of his enemies as he darted about at the back of the scrum waiting for the ball to be thrown in he felt as though he could not go down to it and then of course the worst possible thing happened the rest forwards broke through the scrum he tried to fling himself on the ball and missed it and there they were sliding away past him making straight for the goal line fortunately the man with the ball was flung to touch just in time and there was a breathing space jeremy nevertheless was tingling with his mistake as acutely as though a try had been scored he knew what they were saying on the other side of the rope he knew that baltimore for instance was winkling his bleary eyes with pleasure that all the friends of his rival half were saying in chorus well young cole's no good i always said so and that riley was glaring fiercely about him and challenging any one to say a word he knew all this and unfortunately for more than a minute had time to think of it because one of the cool three quarters got away with the ball and then kicked it to touch and there was a line out and a good deal of scrambling before the inevitable scrum this time it was for him to throw in the ball crying in his funny voice now hoarse now squeaky 
coming on the right school shove they did shove and carried it on with them and then the rest half got it threw it to one of his three quarters who started racing down the field with only jeremy in his way before he got to the back it was that very creature with the bony knees whom jeremy had watched in the changing room the legs wobbled towards him as though with a life of their own he ran across threw himself at the knees and missed them he went sprawling onto the ground was conscious that he had banged his nose that someone near him was calling out butters and that his career as a football half was finally and forever concluded after that he could do nothing right the ball seemed devilishly to slip away from him whenever he approached it he was filled with a demon of anger but that did not serve him he again went now here now there and always he seemed to be doing the wrong thing for once that strange sure knowledge innate in him part of his blood and his bones of the right inevitable thing to do had left him and he could only act on impulse and hope that it would turn out well which it never did the captain who was a forward pausing beside him for a moment said go on cole you can play better than that he knew that his worst forebodings were fulfilled then just before the whistle went for half time just when he was at his busiest he had a curious distinct picture of uncle samuel the red apple tree and hamlet lying on the floor of the studio waiting for his rat people talk about concentration and its importance and nobody who has ever played a game well but will agree that to let your mind wander at a very critical moment is fatal but this was not so much the actual wandering of a mind as of a curious insistence from without of this other picture that went with the scene in which he was figuring it was like the pouring of cold clear water upon his hot and muddled brain it was as though uncle samuel in his thick good-natured voice had said to him now look here i know nothing about this silly game that you're trying to play but i'm here to see you through it and the two of us together it's impossible to beat the whistle went before he had time to realize the effects of this little intrusion he stood about during the interval talking to no one wishing he were dead but armored in a cold resolve after all he would not write to uncle samuel and tell him that he had been left out of the school fifteen because he had not played well enough no one as yet had scored the teams seemed to be very evenly matched which was a bad thing for the school everyone in the school team was depressed and the men in the rest were equally elated if the whole truth were known the play in the first half had been very ragged indeed but as mr thompson explained to the lady visitor you mustn't expect anything else early in the term she made the fatuous remark that after all they were such little boys which made mr thompson reply with more heat than true politeness required that his boys even though they were all under fourteen could on their day show as good a game as any public school to which the lady visitor replied that she was sure that they could she thought they played wonderfully for such little boys the whistle sounded and the game tumbled about up and down in and out jeremy knew now that all was well his game sense had suddenly come back to him and the ball seemed to know its master to tumble to him just when he wanted it to stick in his hands when he touched it and even to smile at him when it was quite a long way away as though it were saying to him i'm yours now and you can do what you like with me he brought off a neat piece of collaring then a little later passed the ball back to his three quarters who got for the first time that day a clear run leading to a try in the far corner of the field then there came a moment when all the rest forwards were dribbling the ball the school forwards at their heels but not fast enough to stop their opponents and he was down on the ball had it packed tight under his arm lying flat upon it and the whole world of boots legs knees and bodies seemed to charge over him a queer sensation that was everything falling upon him as though the ceiling of the world had suddenly collapsed 
then the sensation of being buried deep in the ground bodies wriggling and heaving on top of him his nose chin eyes deep in earth some huge leg with a gigantic boot at the end of it hovering like a wild animal just above his head and then the whistle and the sudden clearing of the ground away from him his impulse to move and his discovery that his right leg hurt like a piercing sword he tried to rise and could not he was quite alone now the sky and the wind the field and the distant hills encircling him with nobody else in the world the game stopped people came back to him they felt his leg and it hurt desperately but not he knew at once so desperately that he never would be able to use it again they rubbed his calf and jerked his knee he heard someone say only a kick no bones broken and he set his teeth and stumbled to his feet and stood for a moment feeling exquisite pain then like an old man of ninety tottering along at this there was universal applause from behind the ropes there were cries of well stopped stocky good old stocky and he would not have exchanged that moment for all the prizes in the bookshop or all the tuck shops in europe are you all right his captain shouted across to him he nodded his head because he certainly would have burst into tears if he had spoken and he was biting his lower lip until his teeth seemed to go through to his gums but in that marvellous fashion that all footballers know his leg became with every movement easier and although there was a dull grinding pain there he found he could move about quite easily and soon was in the thick of it once more he was only a limper to the end of that game but he did one or two things quite nicely and had the happiness of seeing the school score another two tries which put the issue of the game beyond doubt at the end after cheers had been given and returned the pain in his leg reasserted itself once more and he could only limp very feebly off the field but he had the delirious happiness of the captain who was going to rugby next year and was therefore very nearly a man putting his hand on his shoulder and saying that was a plucky game of yours cole hope your leg isn't bad oh it isn't bad at all thank you he said very politely i almost don't feel it which was a terrific lie he had done well he knew that from the comments on every side of him the crowd had forgotten his earlier failure which if he had only known it should have taught him that word of wisdom invaluable to artists and sportsmen alike don't be discouraged by a bad beginning it's the last five minutes that count finally there was riley you didn't play badly he said you were better than millet four later he was sitting with riley squashed into a corner of mags eating doughnuts the crowd in there was terrific and the atmosphere like a slab of chocolate riley and he were pressed close together with boys on every side of them the noise was deafening it was the last ten minutes before mags's closed it was saturday evening and everyone had pocket money the two boys did not speak to one another jeremy's leg was hurting him horribly but he was as happy as five kings and a policeman which was one of uncle samuel's ridiculous meaningless phrases his arm was round riley's neck more for support than for sentiment but he did like riley and he did like mags he was perhaps at that moment as completely alive as he was ever to be he was so small that he was almost entirely hidden but somebody caught sight of his hair which would never lie down flat and cried across the room three cheers for stocky the football hero the cheers were hearty if a little absent-minded the main business of the moment being food and not football jeremy of course was pleased and in his pleasure overbalanced from the edge of the table where he was sitting slipped forward and disappeared from men his leg hurt him too much and he was too comfortable on the floor and too generally sleepy to bother to get up again so he stayed there his arm round riley's leg swallowing his last doughnut as slowly as possible feeling that he would like to give doughnuts in general to all the world yes it had been a fine day a splendid day and there would be days and days and days mags's was closing he limped to his feet and with their arms round one another's necks riley and he vanished into the dark end of chapter twelve 
End of Jeremy and Hamlet, a chronicle of certain incidents in the lives of a boy, a dog, and a country town by Hugh Walpole.